perfect. Perfect.
<laughs> you gotta be kidding me of course i started out muted thank you guys thank you guys yeah, seriously webcam off muted to start off what's going on everybody how are you doing welcome to all 20 tuesday as we're gonna go through a whole bunch of bears free agents over the next couple of hours i appreciate all you guys tuning in look i like a whole bunch of other people i think there's somebody else who mentioned this uh give me just a minute Work is not stopping, which is, hey, that's a good thing. But I, I like a whole lot of other people, work a basically a 24-hour job. It's, a, it, it's honestly hilarious that I'm able to pull this stream off basically every week, which I love. I love the fact that we can do that and everything that comes with it, which is awesome. So we are so excited to get to take you through all kinds of Bears free agent news. It's been a funny start to uh, free agency, hasn't it? Because I can't help but feel like we all got really tuned up for nothing super major to happen. But hey, uh, that's okay, because not only do we have some solid free agents to go through, but we have a whole lot of like top-down stuff to talk about as the, pic the picture is starting to clarify a little bit as to what the Bears probably want to do at the top of the draft. And look, I, like you, might be brokenhearted to hear this, but it sure feels as if, to me, the Bears are beginning to... beginning to feel out the process of what it's going to be like to draft an edge rusher. Look, it's not like I know anything. I really don't. I mean, and I don't even want to pretend to connect dots off of 1920 football drive. But like all the beats have said, that happened on D line day. And I just, with the fact, or with the bears not landing some huge edge somewhere in the process. It won't surprise me if the Bears want to try to take advantage of the depth of the wide receiver class, which means we're going to go through even more wide receivers uh, than we already have, and we've already covered a lot of them on this channel. But then also that the Bears would try to take Latu Latu, uh, Dallas Turner, or Jared Verse. So we could talk about whatever that, or we could talk about what that looks like when we get there. And hey, honestly, here's the other thing. That's not a bad thing. Like, look, I get it. I get it. I am an excited Bears fan. You guys are excited Bears fans. And people in my position tend to spew a whole bunch of copium. And I'm just being incredibly aggressive about that because it's real, right? Um, let me hang on. I appreciate you guys. A lot of times it's somebody like my role to basically look you guys in the eyes and tell you, hey, what the Bears recently did, it's actually good. And then if they did something bad, I go, okay, so it's not great, but it's not that bad, right? Like normally that's the role and I get that. But in this case, I unfortunately am football pilled just enough to look you guys in the virtual eyes and say, if the Bears do want to go with the whole defense and running game thing, then that's a different team than I wanted to build. I won't pretend that that's not the case, but it can be a fully functional team, especially if the Bears do pick up a wide receiver too, like Curtis Samuel, or even if they do draft a, no, I, I would hate to draft a rookie to be the wide receiver too. I'm going to be real there. But like Josh Reynolds would be, would be a bad wide receiver too also hopefully it is somebody a little more like curtis samuel or maybe they make a trade for like a Cortland sutton type etc cetera, etc cetera. but it is funny to talk about uh mj where you mentioned you just want the bears to get a oh i thought you just said I, I just want the bears to get better and that is something that i tend to think that the bears are doing not just in free agency hey that's good but that they're also going to do it, obviously, through the draft. They may just build up. I mean, it's funny Chris mentioned we're about to see 21st century lovey ball. We basically may see the Bears try to rekindle 2018 in their own direction, right? Where you're going to see a sweet defense, especially if the Bears do draft an edge rusher and he's good. Like, you could end up with a sweet, sweet defensive line. God forbid you draft that edge rusher and you sign an Arik Armistead or somebody like that because the Bears still have a cap hole that I mentioned this on Twitter. It's just weird to me. Like, everybody who's listening as we kick this stream off, think about it for a brief moment. The Bears signed Jalen Johnson to a deal that I think is just legit good, right? They It's it's like a $19 million AAV. It's two and a half years guaranteed. It is 
a surprisingly low cap hit up front. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And there's an injury guarantee on it that if Jalen does get hurt, the the injury guarantee or the guarantee spike to fifty four million dollars or something like that. I see this as a win win all around. Everybody gets what they want. Jalen Johnson didn't even manage to reset the corner market yet. The Bears are able to lock him down for exactly the amount of time that I would think that the Bears want him to be locked down for two years minimum. Then two more team options, which totally works for Chicago, right? Bears had a good player, but the Bears also cleared six and a half million dollars from, or the yeah, they cleared about six and a half million dollars in cap space. Then along comes the DeAndre Swift deal, and the Bears have a surprisingly low cap hit on the front of an eight million dollar deal. The front, I believe, signing bonus and all, was closer to five point three million dollars. Look, I'm not trying to get you to wear your t- uh, Bears tinfoil hat too tight. I'm just saying the Bears seem as if they are clearing room for something, and I don't know what it is. Maybe it'll be a trade. Maybe it'll be a free agency deal. Maybe nothing will come together, and they just end up with a big old hole in their cap. I mean, it's totally possible that they could go to the draft with all kinds of cap space, but I feels as if Chicago is tiptoeing around some kind of big money move that they want to make, and I don't know what it is. And it's funny because, Eric, hey, look, I'd be the first to tell you if I really want to be somebody who you guys can trust as a straight-down-the-line Bears analyst that will at least tell you like he thinks he is, think he, like he thinks it is, but then beyond that, we'll try to tell you like it actually is, right? And if it was a Fields extension, that would start in 2026, you would think, because the Bears would pick up the fifth-year option. If you're already thinking about extending him, like you're already planning around extending Justin Fields, you should pick up his fifth-year option after the draft without really much question, right? And then, on top of that, after the fifth-year option, that's when the extension would start to kick in so maybe you would deal with some signing bonus on the front but you wouldn't see that later hey look eric i am only saying this i am only going through the thick of that explanation because we've had a whole bunch of airs content creators lately try to justify how every signing is polls tipping his hand that he's keeping justin fields or that he's not keeping justin fields and i'm just trying to say that both options hey from a cap perspective are still open right and so there's some kind of move that i'm not telling you is happening because i don't know right but it sure feels as if polls thinks that some kind of move is happening and maybe worst case scenario, they roll the cap over and they don't worry about it. So maybe it doesn't really make a difference at the end of the day. But in that meantime, we've seen Jalen Johnson get extended. Yay. We've seen, or we have seen Kevin Byard get added from Tennessee and also Philadelphia. We've seen Deandre Swift get added from Philadelphia. We've seen, uh, what is it? Gerald Everett get added from the Los Angeles Chargers. And we also saw Jonathan Owens, and he's one of the only people that I actually didn't manage to pull the tape for, so we'll do that as we go, or something like that. I expect today to be a pretty chill stream. We're going to try to stay as on topic as we can. I really don't want to talk about the the quarterback situation any more than I have to, because to be honest with you, either it will resolve or it won't resolve, but we could be in this for the long haul, because if the Bears are trying to trade fields, I don't know if they can do it quickly. I mean, I really don't know. Right. I'll believe just about anything at this stage, because if Fields does have a market, people are being awfully quiet about it. If Fields doesn't have a market, that's really obvious. And now would probably be the low point to trade him. And you'd just be trading him to trade him at this point. On the other hand, if you're taking him all the way to the draft to trade, well, then who's to say you aren't sticking with him? I'm just saying like the the idea that the Bears are going to get all the way to blank time and then Fields is going to get traded. It totally might happen. Sam Darnold got traded on draft night and day two of draft night if memory serves <clears throat> but we aren't there yet and i would prefer to not obsess over it because there will be time right gonna be plenty of time to talk through whatever happens at the quarterback position we could talk about the rest of the roster thank you so much to bears gsh love the username as we go through this i th- i think you guys can agree with me that this this is a whole thing. Like, Eric, you mentioned that he will be traded. McFact, you mentioned that he won't be, er, get traded. Part of me thinks we've all said our piece on it. Let's just sit back and let things unfold. Because, I mean, the rest of the roster not only deserve... We should focus on the rest of the roster while we can. Because the moment the Bears do make their, uh, their move at quarterback, we're going to have plenty of time to walk through it. I'm right there with you, Jeremy. I do hope that the Bears manage to get Arik Armstead. I'm not really all too worried about Wamam or whatever his name is. I mean, he's 
He just doesn't strike me as some major signing. Chris, you mentioned any concerns about Bayard's age. Let's talk about it. How about that? Right? Because we can talk through, uh, let's see, let's talk about, or let's talk through exactly who Kevin Bayard is. Now, Kevin Bayard, I think, is a funny one, right? Uh, now, disgusting. Let's go. I am also devastated that Hunter is gone. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Like, that one was one of those, like, oh, no, brutal. Uh, but so, Kevin Byard is, or Kevin Byard is nice. And, or, well, moreover, let's just, let's just watch the tape. I think it's interesting when we talk through, um, I, I think it's interesting when we talk through these free agents, because in particular, Byard comes from two different places, right? He comes from Tennessee. He also comes from Philadelphia. I'll tell you that I don't think that his role in Philadelphia was as positive for him as his role in Tennessee. We will talk through why in just a moment. Let me respond to one more work message and hopefully we'll be able to focus. So you're watching 31 here, right? Uh, you're watching red gloves and red shoes is the easiest way to pluck him out, right? And on one of the first plays of the game, you're already going to notice one of the main reasons that I can absolutely see the Chicago Bears excited about Kevin Byard. And yeah, it's on a play like this, right? By the way, as we talk through this, we're also technically watching Gerald Everett in this game. Uh, Gerald... Everett, I can't remember his number, so I have to look it up in this case. Is he seriously number seven? No, of course not, right? Uh, he is, yeah, he, okay, so he's seven. Keep an eye out for number seven in this case. I, I've watched his specific piece. But so, talking about Bayard, first thing we see, first thing we see is Bayard going from a too high sign, or a too high, like, okay, so, Bayard here is threatening a buzz position or a sky position off of a cover one setup, and then he's going to drop to too high in a disguise, right? This is the Flus cover two, through and through. So we already see at least that he's comfortable in disguise-based defenses, playing half-field safety, and showing off. In this case, we're not seeing any range. We're really not seeing any specific piece of his game but you can already see a role that would get the bears going okay so we know he can do that that means something is everett still seven i i need to look this up because i'm i just want to make sure we have this right because i don't see a seven immediately on the field he's wearing 81 or seven keep an eye for both <laughs> but so byard we'll focus on him okay there he is here he is, seven, bouncing around, doing tons for his offense, right? He does look very receivery. I mean, you can definitely tell that he's a little lighter than plenty of the tight ends playing. It's totally fine. I don't mind an extra you. That's the thing, Travis. You mentioned he'd better be able to do that. I'm not freaking out. Sometimes I feel like it sounds as if I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, and that's partially because I see it. I feel like we need to talk through it, and then it ends up being a little melodramatic. But basic stuff, like first thing to see about Kevin Byard is just being able to play that free safety position, right? The Bears are losing Eddie Jackson. I don't think that Jaquan Brisker is going to suddenly turn into a great coverage safety overnight, but... No, I hear you, Travis. Don't even worry about it. I got you. But in Bayard's case, we can see experience and we can see decent play downfield. What we got? And I hope nobody told me not to dance because Erlacher hair, of course, happy to be here. Uh, happy to take you guys through it. 81 is Mike Williams. Seven is Everett at this point. Um, but so I, I'm kind of with you, Chicago fanatic. Like, in my opinion, Brisker just doesn't need to be a deep coverage safety. And you can use him in that role where you shove him into the flat or you play him in buzz positions. He's actually almost gotten a couple of picks at this point because he starts at a single high safety position or in a uh, half field safety position. And then he shifts into some, you know, a buzz role over the middle and quarterbacks I don't think expected from him. So here's Bayard at this point. I believe he's working over the middle in what looks like a Tennessee cover zero. If you feel like I do, you're going to actually like a lot of what Kevin or Tennessee does on defense. This game in particular, I remember watching them. It's like, oh, okay. 
okay, we're dealing. You can see it a little bit from Mike Brable. Uh, and here, Bayard reads out the route pattern really well. You could see him playing three to two, at least I think. And so then he's going to charge over, take away the tight end, or take away this receiver seam, kind of plays out like a tight end seam. But he reads the quarterback's eyes in his drop, drives over. This is a lot of what Kevin Bayard is. You can see that as Herbert takes the snap with his eyes in the middle, Bayard is playing him straight up, but the moment that his drop gives him away and Herbert points towards where he wants to put the ball, Bayard's breaking. I hope you see this like I do, because I see Bayard as somebody who reads the offense very, very well. He sees receivers. He sees routes developing underneath him. And really the only thing that holds him back, somebody mentioned this earlier, is that he's 30. He's clearly lost a step in terms of just the, it's not quickness in terms of attempting his break. It's quickness in terms of just raw foot speed. I mean, staying with guys and moving really cleanly alongside man coverage setups. So I imagine the Bears are going to want to deal with, or I, I imagine the Bears are going to want to deal in just keeping Bayard in zone space and letting him avoid man coverage responsibilities, which I completely understand. He's a fine enough run defender. I think a lot is being made of Bayard's run defense, but we'll get there because people are like, oh, he's one of the best tackling safeties in football. Very Eddie Jackson tackling rules, right? Where... He's going to tackle him, but he's going to allow three to five yards in the process. This actually is Everett, who's dealing with the edge rusher on the other end of the uh, formation. Kudos to you, Gerald. Travis, it's a good question. Travis O'Shea asks, what is Chicago run majority-wise in terms of coverages? So I think Chicago runs a whole bunch of cover three. It's funny because they want to run a bunch of cover two. Their big problem, and I hate putting it this way, is that Brisker doesn't really do half field coverage. Not really. I mean, he's okay at it, but if you go back and you watch a lot of the big gains that bear or that people were able to break off against the Bears early in the season, you're gonna notice a whole lot of Brisker getting thrown at, at least Brisker's side. Didn't help that he was right there with Tyreek Stevenson, but that's just not an area that he does well in. So in cover three responsibilities, when the Bears are here, let me go to the wide angle and we'll talk through what the Bears defense is and isn't. When the Bears do go cover three, that allows them to take, in this case, it'll be Kevin Byard, drop him into the single high spot, and then they take Jaquan Brisker, they bump him up at the line of scrimmage, and then they push him into one of the flats, usually. I mean, they really do. Just push him in the flat and let him cover the running back or the tight end that comes out that way. And then you've got, at that point, you have Kevin Byard, you have Tyreek Stevenson, you have Jalen Johnson, you have Kyler Gordon, usually he pushes to one of the flats, and then you've got TJ Edwards, and then you've got Tremaine Edmonds covering all kinds of space. At least that's the aim of the Bears, let's call it standard cover three defense that they started eating people with near the end of the year. They'll mix in the occasional blitz. I loved a lot of the Eberflus blitzes that they were doing, and they'll throw some man coverage at the opponent and let Jaquan blitz. But more often than not, when the Bears are on top of you defensively, they're doing it by keeping Jaquan Brisker out of primary space and keeping him in a shorter area where he doesn't need to be rangy because he's not. And a lot of Jaquan's issues, if, if, if we wanted to go through film study, and I don't really love negative film study, we could talk through a game, and we could talk through mistakes in a game, but one of the more interesting pieces, how you doing, Jordan, of watching safety play is that when you're watching safeties in particular, how quickly they read the play and react to it is a huge part of what makes them rangy or not. In Jaquan's case, he's typically late to the play. I mean, whether you're throwing to the right-hand side, usually he'll be fine there, but a lot of it is wide stretching runs. He will, the running back or wide receiver potentially that's running in that direction will 
get to about there before Brisker recognizes that he needs to push that direction. And so he'll end up having to chase the play a little more than some safeties in plenty of cases. But because to me, Chicago, it's less that Brisker is slow. It might surprise you that Jaquan Brisker, especially from like, okay, so Jaquan Brisker mock draftable. When we are going to go to this might surprise you to see Jaquan is actually quite fast and frankly explosive in terms of his athletic profile. You just don't see it as much because his instincts, I don't think, live up to the athleticism that he displays, which isn't that strange. I mean, if you know me at all, you know I love heady defensive backs. Defensive backs that read the play, to me, are faster than they're more athletic counterparts. No, I hear you. I hear you, Chicago. It, it's just funny to talk through defensive back play in some cases because everybody wants the ultra athlete, but a lot of times I think you get more production. Uh, yeah, no Z. If you think you're not getting spider charts this time of year, you're crazy, right? It's draft season time. It's, it's not miles that I think Brisker's, uh, it's not that I think Brisker is not good. That's not simple, or that's too simple. I cater and love DBs that are good in coverage, whereas Brisker is a hammer in the run game. He is your old school thumper. Another example of how to say this would be, do you guys remember Landon Collins, former now commander, Washington safety for an awfully long time? Brisker reminds me a lot of Landon Collins in that he is an outstanding athlete. He nearly never gets pushed backwards when it comes to a tackle. He handles blockers really well, is quite strong at the point of attack, especially for a guy his size. That's just something I consider a niche skill for safeties and something that not every coach thinks is niche because I believe that we're in a boundary safety, field safety world and the old school free safety, strong safety designation is a little bit, obs or it's a little bit archaic, but well, the Bears are running an older form defense, a retro future defense, at least that's the hope, right? So free safety, strong safety fits a little bit better than it does on a team like the Eagles or somebody running Sean Desai or Fangio style defenses where they really need safeties that can play both roles. I believe the Bears wanted Brisker to be able to play both roles and he took a step up, step forward last year. So who's to say he can't take another step forward, but at least right now, I do think that he's a little more fan favorite than he is impact on the field but I'm not trying to hate on the guy any more than I think is necessary you want my eval that's ultimately what I see right here's another good example of just how Bayard reads plays out right so it looks to me as if Bayard is he basically has full control over this guy right here I couldn't tell you exactly what his zone responsibility is I imagine it's this flat right here but he's going to see the defender or see the offensive player what I love about this is the moment he sees that just skip release, he knows that he's got an out route likely coming. What do we got here? Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate you. Really do. Uh, once he sees that he's got an out route, I want you to watch how Bayard is going to trigger downfield and then where are his eyes. Are they on the receiver? No, they're not. Are they? They're on the quarterback because he's already looking for a pick. Bayard sees this game really, really well. It's always, it's always going to be a matter for Bayard of athletic of does he have the athleticism to make the play? Because his brain right now is on. He gets this game and his instincts are really, really good. And I think that that's a huge boon to what the Bears want to do defensively, given that they just lost Eddie Jackson. So now, I mean, you got to remember, Bayard got signed to a room that had one safety in it and that's a safety that was carrying a ton of the coverage load. This totally fits what I think the Bears want to do, even if it's not the young safety that maybe I wanted to add, because with him and Jonathan Owens, how you doing, Robbie? Um, with him, like, or with him being where he is, uh, I, I don't know. I. It's so sad that the Bears may not get one of these safeties, but I can't get into that just because I'd be pretty surprised if the Bears take somebody like Jalen Simpson, et cetera, in the third round, fourth round, just because they now already have two safeties. So they're three safeties deep. Maybe they're willing to go four safeties deep. I mean, you can never have too many good DBs, but it wouldn't surprise me if they focus on other positions, which rats. <laughs> 2A, I couldn't tell you. Like, uh, what makes you think? Oh, yeah, they did, Kaiser. 
I, if you don't mind 2A, I just don't want to talk about the Fields thing for as long as I can. Like, if we can push that to later in the stream, I'm happy to talk through it then. But we could talk about the free agents before we talk about field speculation because the truth is 2A, I just, I just don't know, right? But we'll get there. And I'm with you, Bob, that he is a great stopgap. I would frankly love it just to throw this at you, Bob, if they drafted a safety to sit him behind uh, somebody like Kevin Byard, learn how he's working or learn what he does well, learn what he doesn't do well, and then play next year. But we'll see. Oladapo would be awesome. I like him a lot. Um, so here, Tennessee is also willing to play Bayard in man coverage. We can see that this is a man look, right? I hope everybody, like, I hope that you watch more tape, but you start to get better and better at pre-snap reads because you see a tell like this and maybe they'll drop into zone, but at the very least, it is, at the very least, this is a tell for man coverage. We'll go ahead and see now if Tennessee follows through with it. They do, and I love this. Like, again, to me, break speed is huge, right? Like, we're going to see Bayard off the snap, reads this quick stab from his receiver, within a couple frames, has already gotten his balance and broken towards the screen. Now, it's not this isn't to say like, oh, well, he would have blown it up or something. It's more that you can tell his reaction or his reaction time is really strong. And a lot of that's because of the instincts and just how quick his trigger is. I mean, his fuse from idea to action is really short. And I love that because to me, that's what extends your career at a position like safety. Because if you're, if you're athletic, but you don't react quickly, then as you age, you won't age gracefully as you, or if you're instinctive and also athletic, then you will age much more gracefully than the other because your athleticism decays, but that's not what made you fast. Uh, and like you're saying, Rob, Bayard has seen a lot of tape, but even beyond that, he's not confused by a lot of tape. It wouldn't surprise me if he's an absolute tape rat and no, and likes to pick up on opposing tendencies. And I'm sure you can see right here, we've only walked through a couple snaps. I'll try to see what one skill I'm trying to incorporate is basically not over breaking down every single snap, especially if we're going to try to talk about four players on a day like today. But it, I'm hoping that we can get better at sometimes I'll talk just like I'm doing now and we'll skim through a whole bunch of snaps because you'd be amazed at safety at how many of these snaps just don't matter. Like, look at this. I thought this was hilarious. <laughs> Leonidas, I will tell you what, I don't know if the Bears are willing to spend $55 million on edge rushers, but hey, I'm just going to throw this at you. All right, everybody. All right. So uh, somebody mentioned earlier about spider charts. Well, are you ready for this one? Does this look like an Eberflus defensive end and or Poles defensive end or what? Like you got to remember, everybody is going to focus on the weight. The strong side defensive end needs to be heavy. The backside defensive end less so. Dallas Turner makes an awful lot of sense to me if the Bears did want to go in that direction. But 6'4", or 6'4", 251, 34 and 5 eighths inch arms. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but especially because the Bears are starting to get real shy on draft capital. But if this is how they spent that hole in their cap that we talked about, whoo, like that that actually works a lot in, or it works pretty well in my opinion. Now I don't know much uh, besides his production and his, uh, his relative athletic score, but I look at something like that. Yeah, that's Josh sweat demo. Um, so we'll see. Turner sure looks to me like he's going to be a monster. I mean, a lot of these defensive ends do. The The funny part is, is that if I can football pill you enough, you're going to start thinking that you might actually want a defensive end. But I don't want to football pill you that hard because at the end of the day, I also want a receiver too. Like Joe Calzano mentions, if they want to go Turner, they need Boyd or Ridley. Or Joe, they could get Curtis Samuel, Josh Reynolds makes a whole lot of sense. Um... I'm not going to try to make the argument that there's a billion receivers out there. Maybe the Bears go like Michael Thomas or something like that. But exactly, Travis, it is all based on personnel. Of course it is. Um, but all that to say, yeah, Hollywood's another option, though. Hollywood might be a little loafy for what they're looking for, especially since you know they want a wide receiver that can block. To me, that's what the Gabe Davis interest says. But like you're saying, Chris, I want them to draft offense. I think a receiver is going to be there for the taking. Look at the free agency market. You look at how many offensive players are not very good that are getting paid quite a bit of money, except you, Darnell Mooney. We like you. I like you. Uh, 
I look at that and I see this is a league, Chris, where if you're not drafting offense, you're not getting offense, right? And it would be maybe a little two bears, don't you think, Chris, to <laughs> to draft defense and then to tell us, well, yeah, you know, we just really liked the fact that we could get a guy there. We didn't think he'd get there, so we were really excited he got there. Yeah, you, I bet the bears would think so. But somehow you almost feel, I, I feel, Chris, every once in a while, like one of those, like I'm watching one of those television shows where it's like you can't fight your nature and the bears just keep drifting back towards defense no matter what. And they go towards offense. And even when they had an offensive head coach, they still somehow had an amazing defense with no, in no time at all. And it was a different iteration of the same old Bears thing, <laughs> Bears team ever. It would be, Chris. And the funny thing is, I'm just saying, whether it's Fields, whether it's Williams, whether it's Bo Nix, if the Bears do get the quarterback right alongside a sweet defense, they could be a really fun team to watch. I think we're just all sick of seeing them not support the quarterback offensively, but that has nothing to do with Kevin Byard. Here's a great example of what I'm talking about if we do see, and this is part of why I wanted to stop it. So Tennessee is in a man look right here. And Byard is going to pick up on who he ultimately needs to cover. That's not the question, right? But bang, you can see five here run away from Byard without too much issue. Once he hits the gas to try to run with the receiver, he's gone, right? And Eric, I'm using Bo Nix. Just to be clear, I, I'm not saying Bo Nix because I love Bo Nix. I'm picking Bo Nix because it doesn't matter to me. I'm really trying to be completely quarterback agnostic here for at least a couple weeks, like un until we have some clarity because I think everybody speaks in this tribalist teamster attitude towards their favorite guy. And I'm sure we all have a favorite guy, but it is funny to me how much of these conversations kind of work with both where whether it's Justin Fields or Caleb Williams, of course, I want to see the Chicago quarterback surrounded by offensive weapons. Don't you, right? And so we'll go through, let's talk through more free agency. I keep forgetting Everett's out there because I'm watching Bayard as much as I am. This is a sweet play. I think this is a sweet play, right? Um, Byard is going to take a look and he's going to out leverage the, DB, or the wide receiver coming in front of him and make sure he sticks with him. And look at how quickly he gets off the play action fake, right? He lo it looks to me like he sees 13 coming across and for one reason or another, 13 coming this way can't, or signals to him okay, this is a pass, right? And then breaks, gets on top of 81, sits in front of him. Herbert's got nowhere to go with the football. Has to basically throw it away. Good defense. I do not think Yannick can be an edge on the Bears, or it can be an edge for the Bears, at least not a good one. That's my two cents. Joe, for what it's worth, I think you can get a stud pretty much anywhere in the top 20. And yeah, or Jay Sanders, I'm with you that I think that Poles is definitely trading back. I just don't think it's for one. I think that I think nine trading back makes all the sense in the world. But I we're probably going to be having this conversation this time in May about how Poles traded back. It's just going to be from one of the two picks, right? Probably not both. I doubt both. But maybe you see a whole bunch of that, but we'll see. Man, Nix or Rattler would bum me out. To me, that is the, I'll be honest, like just to touch on that, Jay Sanders, if the Bears did end up with all, or after all of this, they traded down, they stacked the team, and they drafted an incredibly underperforming, uh, but toolsy quarterback in Rattler, or they drafted basically quarterback white toast uh, in Bo Nix and paired them with Justin, I would tell you that I think the Bears would have made the most Bears decision possible and that ultimately we would see the team compete, win some games, but they wouldn't have an answer to the, to the football's most important question and they would flame out eventually. But that's just my two cents. Very Bearsy, Bob. 
and then we would be here in two more years talking through well i i know that it didn't work i mean like you're saying sean it only bummed me out if it didn't work but what would it working be i want a quarterback i want the bears to end up with a quarterback that's going to still be an exciting quarterback option in 2026. I mean, I understand that that's a pretty high bar in the eyes of some, but this whole every single year we're asking questions about or talking ourselves into the quarterback thing. I just, I think it personally gets exhausting and I'm, I'm tired of it. I think the fact that we continue to have the conversation is implicitly exhausting. Here's Bayard showing a little bit of, uh, or here's Bayard showing just more, split field zone coverage ability, but eh, that's my two cents. Really going to try to stay off the quarterback talk, but I did want to at least say that because I thought it was, I thought it was interesting. Byer does a good job here. I like it anyways, of he's going to press on five until he sees, oh good. I think I just alt have forward on accident, but so he was going to press on that outside re er, receiver until he sees Herbert looking past him. And then at that point, he gets a little bit of depth. And while he's getting depth, you see Herbert ultimately lose the ability to throw to anybody. And then that takes care of that. That's a new one. I've never hardcore alt F forward. Um, but now we did. Just play two guys at once. How did the Bears not think about it? Maybe they could uh maybe they can appeal the NFL and play with 12 players on offense. Vizo Joe asks, uh pulls trades back and gets a re receiver like Velas and Scott. No thanks. Ah, I'm not about to tell you it's a good idea, Vizo, but it won't surprise me if that's exactly what they do. It just won't surprise me at all. <laughs> Travis, I got you. He does. He plays two guys at once. It shuts down the program I'm in. That's for sure, Eric. Fire doesn't do anything there. Does Everett? No. Here's Everett following a play on the backside. I'm really trying to pay a little bit more attention to Everett because I haven't highlighted him at all, which might be its own implicit problem. But Bard's willing to stick his nose in physically. I don't think he's the world's most physical receiver or the most physical defensive back. But at safety, you have to be a certain amount physical, especially when you go up against wide receivers. That passes my bar. I mean, I've seen worse. Let's put it that way. Because as a safety, you have to at least cut off a running lane while engaging a blocker and not giving up a, not giving up a gap. And here, Byard does this. That, there's a reason he's a former All-Pro. He's really solid. Donnie, it sure doesn't look like it. It seemed as if that was an option at one point, and then it lost steam altogether. Who's to say why? Here's a solid, here's a solid job attacking downhill. It's yes, he doesn't make the tackle, but he does ultimately turn the runner and force a spin move inside enough that he collides with the guy across from him. Yes, he kind of makes the tackle too. Hard to tell whether he would have been able to tackle Mike Williams without 70 standing right there. Ah, he gets a good piece of him. I bet he would have gone down. Good job, Kevin. Bob asks, how big is the drop off at receiver? You can get at nine versus 20. Depends to me, Bob, if one of the top three fall to nine. If the top three don't fall to nine, I think that there's zero drop off between nine and 20. Uh, if the one of the top three does fall, I think there's a pretty hefty drop off. But the receiver that you can get at 20 should still be a pretty doggone good player. I mean, I like a lot of these receivers. To me, any of the top six or seven receivers looks quite talented on the whole. It's just a matter of, those top three separating themselves a little bit, which they have. Here's Bayard making up space in coverage with recognition. He's off and running well before Herbert's thrown the ball, which he should be because the receiver ultimately is getting over the top. 
Oh, I mean, Jordan, if you're trying to bait me into talking about Keon Coleman, I'm going to talk about Keon Coleman every chance I get. But that's just where I'm at. I, I like how, I, I like Coleman a lot. I could deal with anybody from Coleman to Lad McConkey to A.D. Mitchell to... I, I wouldn't be surprised if you could get A.D. there. Um, but that's mostly because I think that Brian Thomas gets taken somewhere around 13 to 15. I think people wait on receiver a little bit, and you could probably get A.D. around 17 to 20. Uh, top three do- gone, trade down or edge. Bob, I would personally trade down and take what you could there, but it won't surprise me at this stage if the Bears do ultimately get an edge. Uh, here's something that I think Bayer does really well when they do allow that dog to hunt. Oh, he hunts. Watch his special management here. It's a simple enough play, right? Takes the snap. We're looking at double slants, but it's third down. And we know this charger offense likes to third down. We know this Charger offense likes to run double slants in that position. So what they're going to do is they're going to take this side uh, right near Kevin Byard. They're going to roll him into the box and they're going to have him. Yeah, exactly. One lurk. He's just going to basically sit in front of one of these slants. And it's what pushes Herbert off of the initial read. But I love Byard's tempo as he's going to sit right there for it. And then he's going to try to help break on this other one. CB next to him does a great job making the tackle and bringing his guy down. Tennessee's able to come up with a big time stop, mostly because that other DB did a sweet job. But kudos to Bayard for certainly playing his part right. And we start to see that he's not just a center fielder. He can also be like a zone hunter uh, over or on other coverages as well. Now, as a man defender, I think that he's just losing a little bit of luster. But I do like also seeing the different ways that Bayard is able to get out into uh, basically half field space. It's pretty basic stuff. I really don't want to oversell any of this as, wow, amazing. But it's starting level safety play, and it's driven by what he's experienced in doing and all of the different football or all the football that he's seen throughout his career in throughout his career as a safety. Uh, crazy to me how so many teams run double slants at the exact same depth. Seriously, Travis, it's just all over the place. That's the main takeaway that I know I have, that if you see the football the same way that I do, you're probably seeing it too. Kevin Byard is un- er, is unabashedly a starting safety. He's not the world's most expansive safety, but he could certainly play for you. Takes one more position off the board. I can, it's funny you say that. Look, I'm not about to try to tell you that I think the Bears are better. Uh, I don't know. I guess I kind of am. Like, to me, the problem with Saquon Barkley is that I think that this is like signing Saquon Barkley. It's, it's like signing Ezekiel Elliott before the fall off. I think Saquon is already approaching, if he hasn't already gotten to, that horrible 1,500 to 2,000 carry cliff that we see all kinds of running backs fall off of. And when they do, it's not a pretty thing. So Saquon ends up getting what, $13 million AAV? I don't know what the guarantees are, but had the Bears won Saquon, I just don't know how much of an impact he would have made. Now, I'm not about to look at you and tell you that I think uh, that I think DeAndre Swift is like is somehow God's gift to running backs, but I do think the fact that they got Swift for nearly half of what it cost you to get Saquon is a better move, but I'm also not the world's biggest let's spend on running back guy, so eh. It's it's a funky conversation because I'm basically saying that I think a lot of these running back contracts are tricky investments, but we're going to watch some Swift together and get there. Uh, Jordan, it's funny you mentioned, really excited to hear my opinion. Uh, Swift is one of the guys that I just didn't have time to watch before we started this stream, so we'll discover it together. The Chargers are not giving Everett much run, that's for sure. Here it looks like, I mean, I would call this cover four personally, just based on the way that the corners and safeties are playing their leverage and whatnot with some uh, with some solid zones underneath. And I love the way that Bayard is playing that role here because the moment he doesn't go vert, him staying square to it, setting the hard top and making sure that he doesn't give unnecessary ground is going to help squeeze the coverage box a little bit. And then when 19 here does roll back up, there's just nowhere to go, right? Um, I don't know if they're bracketing Travis. There, there's always a chance, right? But it looks to me like cover four is sort of a natural bracket in this case. But 
towards you mentioned oh yeah there's a hey, there's a chance the problem is is that i couldn't tell you the chargers personnel well enough but it looks to me like they're just playing cover four to the or to the passing strength but a different a, de- a better defensive coach might have a better take on that Leonidas, I mean, Swift is definitely an explosive back. It's just funny when we talk about running back because running backs are some of the superhumans of, like, football. Oh, hey, Everett gets the ball here. So we can watch Everett's movement kit. That is a route that just doesn't feel like it tells me much. (laughs) So, J-Mass, I've watched all the same Theo Ash videos you have, and... I'm interested to go through a Swift game and see if it feels that way or if or if Theo might be guessing a little bit. But I'm just I'm just throwing that out there. (laughs) I mean, they really are, Donald. It's funny because Donald mentions it's shocking what the Bears are doing. They're like a billionaire searching for bargains at the local dollar store. I mean, to some extent, Donald, I think that might be what's going on. I mean, certainly the Bears are not handing out much guaranteed money. That's for doggone sure. And it makes you wonder what the Bears are even thinking in terms of just future extensions, especially like the quarterback position or something like that. I mean, I don't know. But if the Bears aren't willing to spend on anybody, are they willing to put... I mean, you gotta, you guys got to remember. I don't know anything, right? But we've seen reports. Do you guys remember the reports like three years ago with Brad Biggs saying that the Bears were like a cash poor organization? Well, I have no idea what would or wouldn't have changed, but it kind of makes more sense that they, thank you, Travis. I appreciate you. Uh, It almost makes more sense that the Bears would be whatever they have been. So if they were cash poor once, they might still be cash poor now. And it's always worth remembering that at least when it comes to current NFL contracts, the moment you guarantee money. So Donald, let's say that the Bears uh, guarantee Justin Fields $135 million, which would be an awful lot right now. I don't think the Bears would probably do it, but more just walk with me for the example, right? The moment that they do that, or Jalen Johnson, his $43.6 million, is it? The the $43.6 million that is guaranteed to Jalen Johnson immediately gets placed in an escrow account. When people said that the that the Raiders didn't have the money, like Al Davis didn't have the money to pay Khalil Mack, it wasn't that he literally didn't have enough money for his roster. It wasn't that they didn't have the, enough money for the salary cap. It's having the extra money to put into what is effectively an investment account and just let it sit there while having enough extra money on hand. And I'm not about to tell you that the Bears definitely do or don't have this problem. I don't know, but they seem like they're being awfully stingy with some of their guarantees, and at least it makes me wonder, but I don't know. Like you're saying, yeah, that, that's a good point. It, it's definitely, I'm, Falco's right, I'm, what is it, I'm, so, uh, I'm, streamlining it too much i'm being way too simplified about it and i'm frankly talking about something that i only vaguely understand but it is it does at least feel curious to me falco because it sure felt like the bears had the opportunity to take a dip into the free agency pool and somebody mentioned earlier that most of these free agent deals don't work out i mean you're generally right especially when you talk about perimeter players like wide receivers and dbs and whatnot but the the defensive line at the very least seems like it's been outputting some really solid deals lately i guess it depends right it's not like we heard a ton from draymond jones last year but javon hargrave was a very solid player for the 49ers so i guess it cuts both ways and everybody wants to uh travis there's stuff in the in the description at least it'll guide you there i don't know i'm looking for reasons just like anybody else is so we'll like we'll figure it out together but it is awfully funky making this distinction here's another example of i think bayard getting the read right and just not having the footwork for it um where of course for bot i'm glad you enjoyed it but so five does a good job here like five is going to fake hard this way and head out to the corner fake bang Bayard reads, uh, Bayard has to honor the fake right here with that step. And that move makes Bayard late to the corner. Herbert lays it up and five has to reach just a little too far and get, can't get both feet in. I'm actually really surprised that he didn't. They end up ruling this incomplete and it sure feels to me like it is incomplete. Just when you go frame by frame, we stretch too far. But I'm, I don't know about you guys. I'm pretty surprised that he doesn't bring a foot in. Like DJ Moore catch moment. 
because the ball is laid out there, but we get the harder foot down and we just don't get our toe drag all the way down. But it's a nice job by Herbert of manipulating right, coming back to his left, maybe where that hitch just can't happen. I couldn't tell you. But I think if he'd kicked the pylon, it would have counted. But then fourth and four, we're going to line up in man coverage, Bayard, and we're just going to hang on to the guy and ultimately take him away. And then Herbert throws a sweet touchdown pass. I mean, look, this is not a Justin Herbert breakdown. It's not. But like, this is pretty sweet. <laughs> what is this? Interior pressure. Keep your balance. Flick the ball to your guy. Is that Keenan Allen? Yeah, the Slayer. Goes up, makes a play for us. Two flags come out, but they don't end up... Uh, they don't, it ends up a score. So I could not tell you what happens here. But so when you watch Bayard, what I think is funny is Bayard basically just has to hold on for dear life, but he's a veteran. He's done that before. It doesn't bother me if a, if a guy's got to be handsy in this situation, whatever. Right. Uh, especially because physicality, I do not see that as a problem when it comes to defensive backs, but I think you all know that. He survives and thrives, and especially in shorter areas. That's just what you're going to do in the red zone. Kudos to Keenan Allen. Rip. Man, what a play. Yeah, Herbert did get murdered there. Yeah, first and one. They called DPI and must have picked up another flag. Herbert just lofts it over. How fun is this, right? You get a clear cover zero blitz, right? They're all coming. And you run a tackle eligible play. Like, that's kind of fun. Talk about a blitz beater. Who's going to think the tackle's going out for the pass? Man, though, you could feel that the Chargers thought they needed this game if they're pulling out the tackle pop early in the season. 79 had to be stoked. Here's Bayard, not playing crazy physical on this one because what is this? Allen gets out there and just about throws him off, but he disengages, makes a tackle. Oh, it looks like he did declare uh, Donald. Not the Detroit moment, right? I appreciate Bayard's committedness is the only way that I can put this where Bayard doesn't really, like he makes his read and then he's going to commit to it. Catch you later, Chris. The run ends up running away from him and Allen's route takes him uh, away from the play. But Bayard's going to keep reading the play and the quarterback as he pursues his man because he knows that the moment he hesitates, he's definitely in the wrong place. And I appreciate that. I mean, if you don't play it right, you're already wrong. There's not a whole lot of ways to play both at the same time. So Bayard's not going to get caught in no man's land. He's just going to commit. And if he's wrong, he's wrong. If he's right, he's right with very little in between, which again, I think that that plays well into what he does. Here, Herbert just makes a sick throw. There were some of these I wanted to post on Twitter and technically they're picking on Bayard. Like here, I don't think Bayard could have really done anything. This is just a bust. Like it looks to me at least as if the ten, the Titans get caught off of, I honestly couldn't tell you what's going on because they have a five-man line and then they drop him and it looks to me like it would be cover two, except we're missing a zone with him who also covers this same spot. Maybe they're like, maybe at this point they're trying to rotate it. Maybe this is supposed to be Tampa two. If it is Tampa two and this linebacker is trying to run the pole, he can't. <laughs> And I don't blame Bayard for shading inside because we are hosed. Yeah, I think it's definitely supposed to be Tampa too. And this linebacker is just not getting there. In the world of why did the Bears pay $18 million for Tremaine Edmonds? It is this play. And they just didn't run it at all last year. Like Tampa 2 is where you're trying to take this thing. So Bayard, sh or Bayard shades inside this corner. I would imagine this corner has some kind of rule as far. No, I think it's just the right play call, honestly, because most of these Tampa 2 corners let their guy go down the sidelines. And the moment that he does, Herbert just flicks the ball, rockets it out to the sidelines. 
13 hauls it in. Falls down. Good play, Keenan. This feels very Drake May, I gotta tell you. Wobbly ball at all. Like, tough, tight pocket. Longer release. Just rips it down the field anyways. Teardrop. Get Drake some weapons. That guy will cook. Travis, I, I kind of think it's right there, you know? A slightly more, probably less decisive, I would imagine, Herbert's going to be. Man, look at this. How nice is this? Let's see what defense are they in. Honestly, there are so many defenses this could be, and it gets so muddy in the coverage end because so many of them bite the play-action fake. But it sure looks to me like this is either a man coverage or or this is a split field coverage, my money would be it being a like a two, a two safety coverage, but that Bayard just undercuts the route because he realizes it's the only one in play. Like we've got him and he's not doing anything. Everett isn't doing anything. This guy's cutting across. He's obviously who we're trying to work on and 24 is spun. So I couldn't tell you if it's hero ball or just a great adjustment, but Bayard does a good job getting underneath this and leaving absolutely nowhere to go with the ball. Heady zone defense. That's the big takeaway, right, guys? Is Kevin Byard can play heady zone defense. 24 just looks like he's lost. Like he's thinking play. He's basically thinking play action, finally turns his head, realizes he's about to get beat, and just spins for his life. Which is totally fine. I mean, I mean, that's part of why you have a safety like Kevin Byard who's there to try to help you clean things up. Not every signing. This is a great example, by the way, of how a player can be good without necessarily being, okay, so we've all played Madden, right? Like, not every player is going to have the star written underneath them, right? Let me see if I can draw it even better than that. Like, it looks like, like that. You know what I'm talking about? Like, uh, where the the impact player thing Plenty of players in football are just good football players and they do their job. And when they do their job, that that frees up your other guys like Big Jeff Simmons to go make a play. But on a stream like this, it can be easy to make an extreme takeaway like, oh, Kevin Byard slaps. And he might slap, but he's still a good safety at the absolute top because on plays like this, this is a great example where if I was Herbert, or if I was an offensive coordinator watching this tape, I would actually like this matchup. Because to me, if we can get this safety to shift over this way, I like us trying to take something off the top of Kevin Byard with this kind of uh, with this kind of room and space. Because I think Byard personally is going to struggle on things that involve vertical burst to go with physicality at the line of scrimmage. It's just not a way I would personally line him up right now if I was trying to play to his strengths. That's not what they do, right? Especially because, let's see, what does the safety do? See, we're able to hold the safety over here. Peyton Smith, how you doing? Um, thank you so much for joining as a starter. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that a lot. Like, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll be right here. Hey, I'm just saying, it's all my members that keep me streaming every week. Like, that's the stuff that makes me go, nah, okay, I gotta put something together. And so hopefully we can make even more. How you doing, uh, 4P? But so I personally think if you come to my stream and you come away thinking a player absolutely rules and has no weaknesses, then either I didn't do a really good, a good job of explaining who they are, or I uh, don't, I don't think they have any. <laughs> Or they just played a really good game. I mean, that happens too. But the main reason I wanted to start with this Tennessee footage is because the Eagles play Bayard in a whole lot more man and a whole lot more dime situations where he is effectively a, or where he ends up being a third safety or like a dime backer often. And so he can do a lot of that zone hunting, but he also ends up playing a bunch more guys up at the line of scrimmage. And I think doing what he's a little bit worse at. It's the Eagles trying to get turnovers and value out of him being a zone hunter but occasionally the uh, the defense needing to make a check into a man-based defense based on a look and that just hanging Byard out to dry a little bit 
It happens. All kinds of defensive schemes end up with situations just like this. To me, this is something I think you see from Bayard a lot, which is an imperfect but effective tackle, right? Kevin Bayard is just not the guy who's going to rip downhill, lower his shoulder, and annihilate the player. He's just not the eraser, right? He's going to be the guy who nearly overruns the angle because, I mean, doesn't he look like he's headed to the outside? Then, When the receiver makes a hard cut inside, he still gets his hands on him, drags him down. We seed about two yards to bring the guy down, right? And hey, Peyton, I appreciate that. I really do, especially since not uh, like I'm trying as best I can to be a bridge between guys like quarterback school and just the ground. I mean, I come from the ground, right? I learned all this bottom up. And so trying to help walk people through the complexities of football without forgetting that some people still don't know what outside zone means, et cetera, et cetera. Like there was a time when uh, JT was going through nearly every single uh, game and he'd say, all right, yeah, here's uh, what this is split flow inside zone. And I was like, what does that mean? I mean, even me two years ago was sitting there like, I, I thought I knew ball. What is split flow inside zone? Only to realize that it's inside zone. Like that. This is, your basic inside zone look. Um, split flow inside zone, uh, Donald, is when you take the tight end and you flow him back the other way. That's it. Like, <laughs> and sometimes you'll call it split flow insert. <laughs> and you'll you'll push the tight end in the middle. Like the split flow is what the tight end is doing in that case. It's just like how there's so many different types of cover three. For instance, okay, here's one more example. Slight tangent, but this will make sense. Okay, so what is the difference between cover three uh, sky? So here are your options. Sky, buzz, let's go with cover three, lurk, cover three, um, I mean, let's just honestly start with those. And then it's not even a blitz, right? Like the difference between these calls. Yeah, cloud. Cloud is cloud is the other one I was thinking of. But I don't see near as much cover through cloud as I would have expected. Anyways, what's the point of the adjective? What is what does sky mean? What does buzz mean? What does lurk mean? What does cloud mean? What is it for? What is it for? I'm gonna give you five. Three, two, one. It's just talking about where the second safety goes. It's assumed that all, or if you're talking about cover three, you're going to talk about one safety in the middle. You're going to talk about two deep zones held up, and you're going to tell me where that other safety is. In cover three cloud, it's this guy right there. In cover three buzz, he goes and takes the flat. Or no, not buzz. Buzz, he sits right here in this zone, and one of these linebackers kicks out to the flat. In cover three sky, he heads down into his own flat at that point. And then sometimes in cover three lurk, you'll have him take like the other zone. That could be a terminology thing where different coaches call it different things, and then they'll all tell you that you're wrong because they're much smarter than you are, but it's all the same at this point. And the main reason I'm talking through this is because a lot of play calls are really specific, and you've probably heard interviews about how, oh yeah, we gotta get all the terminology out. And it's because it's it, you're trying to describe to somebody exactly who was doing what in a couple words, right? Where it's, that's all this is. At the end of the day, when you guys sit here and you hear me say, it's cover three, and I don't use some fancy schmancy adjective, I am right. I am also technically not fully right because there are many different ways to play cover three, and there are many different responsibilities within cover three. Now, if you want to sound really smart, okay? I learned this one last year. This is your football party trick, okay? There is no such thing as a cover three blitz. There is no such thing as a cover one blitz. There is no such thing as a cover two blitz. You can say all of these things, and you're gonna, you're, there's going to be a coach that's going to think that you just don't know ball, if you would call it that, because for some reason... <laughs> I think it's too many words. Instead, you you say under deep and what kind of blitz sometimes. Uh, so you'll talk about a three under three deep blitz. So how many rushers is that? Five. You'll talk about a three or you'll talk about a two under three deep blitz. Six. 
you'll talk about a fire zone and then you'll add an adjective for what kind of fire zone and who's going and the, all these different things. Like there's, there are all kinds of different ways to describe this, but if you're talking about cover two or Tampa two, there are seven people in coverage every time from a terminology perspective. And it's, it's funky to talk about and it's overly specific for reasons that we don't care about, but the players do because otherwise they don't know their assignment. And that's obviously why the playbook is the way that it is. It's why football at a professional level can be so complicated. It's why collegiate football can be so complicated because those guys get three years to learn it and one year to play, sometimes two, right? Think about it. Like if I could teach you a defense for three years before you ever had to take a meaningful snap, don't you think we could beat Kansas in your fourth year? You put you in the whole big 12. Right, John, it's not to say that there is no blitzes off of cover two. It's to say that technically you would be running a two disguise before the blitz and you would call it something else. So it's less like Tampa two blitz or something like that. And more, yeah, I, I, you could call it a two deep four under fire zone or something like that. I mean, honestly, I think I just screwed up the fire zone terminology where they'd call it. I mean, especially when then all of a sudden, John, you, you get to the point where then you look at the defensive playbook and they don't call it that at all. They call it tornado, right? They, they call it, they call it earthquake or something like that. I mean, they, they call it, they call it hammer. Well, yeah, we call that one nail. Or something. I mean, everybody, you listen to some of these coaches and uh, listen, the more you listen, here's your fun little nugget. Listen to the former quarterbacks break down tape with other quarterbacks and then they'll call a play out and they'll go, yeah, we called this one looky. And it's just some simple word. It's like the Willy Wonka thing, but it's real and it applies to every offense in football. (laughs) <laughs> like where you what you get in the nuts and bolts of what that play call is and it is something complicated but then the way they describe it to the players is Santa's sleigh and everybody knows what it is and so <laughs> Matt Nakey will tell you that that's uh I don't know like a or it, he's going to tell you that it's like some, I, I couldn't even tell you what an NFL play call is. I I've read through some of the playbooks and I just, uh, I don't remember the play call names and I probably could like, I'm sure somebody else could come up with, or could write in the chat right now, but it's so funny talking about play calling and what these plays are at the end of the day, because a guy like me is going to get a lot of things wrong. I, of course I am. I'm looking at tape as much as tape is helpful. It gives you a clue. It doesn't give you the whole thing. Right. Um, except the bears, they use <laughs> right. Falco. <laughs> of course the bears would use the super long call out system. So Derek, you mentioned, would you just call the actual play you're running and add the disguise if you're disguising it? So Derek asks a good question. You, uh, I I've seen it done some ways like that, but a lot of times the way you teach the blitz is make this look like cover two and then do this. Right. So the disguise is baked into the call itself instead of you basically, you got to remember, Derek, you are teaching the those disguise blitzes to be a blitz the whole way. Like you have a different play call altogether for Tampa 2, right? Or whatever your Tampa 2 is. Instead, your blitz call will simply be taught to mirror Tampa 2. And even then, as I'm sure you guys have noticed, not all football players are amazing actors. And some of these DBs will give that ish away very fast. Like, the, when you find a DB that can disguise a blitz well, man, kudos to him. Or a, bl- a DB that can actually pick up blitz timing well, man, kudos to him. Not everybody can. There are a hilarious amount of these DBs and linebackers that are so blatant about when they're blitzing. I think it's pretty funny. And I got to hand it to TJ Edwards in particular. TJ Edwards and Jack Sanborn are nightmares at that blitz disguise thing. I don't know what Wisconsin teaches, but I got to give some credit. Are you in here? Uh, Because so Quentin and I are doing building the board right now. He's doing an amazing job basically leading the project because I am underwater when it comes to real work. But so one thing Quentin and I have been talking about lately is getting into 
like what connections can we make from college coaches? Penn State players act like they've never been coached before. Michigan players look like they're really well coached. Hat tip to Jim Harbaugh. Another organization that I see coach their guys really well right now is Notre Dame. That Notre Dame defense is on fire. Like Cam Hart is a DB that if the Bears actually got a shot at him in the fourth round, I don't really care that the Bears don't have a, a corner spot open. I'm interested because those Golden Domers can flat play. The linebacker for the Golden Domers also flies around all the time. And again, I'm not advocating for a linebacker, but if you tell me they play for Notre Dame right now, I am already interested and I don't need to know anything else. They are really, really good coaches. And Wisconsin's linebackers are awesome. I mean, like, look, as silly as I know it sounds, because they're both Bears and this sounds homery, like Jack Sanborn and TJ Edwards are both UDFAs and both have some absolutely unbelievable instincts. I mean, they are really, really good, really good at playing the game of football. Like, they're not just athletes. I mean, or they're not just, yeah, they're not just athletes playing the spot of linebacker. They really seem to understand all the makings of what good linebackers have to do do i mean even sanborn again a udfa running the pole looks so much more comfortable doing it than that tennessee linebacker we just saw get baked alive i mean whatever he thought he was doing as that number two was just releasing by him i couldn't tell you because he did he made no move to cut it off which is wild to me right um but yeah, I mean, Sanborn's got great instincts. TJ Edwards has great instincts. John, Blitz Disguise does seem like it is a practicing thing. I mean, it's totally just my opinion as, as I've watched tape, but the teams that blitz a lot, blitz better. Like Tampa Bay, blitz is better. Minnesota, blitz is better. You look at a lot of these teams that throw a ton at you, and the more they blitz, the better they are at blitzing, and the more they also, John, another piece to this is, okay, so let me use an example. I'm sure everybody's been in this situation. I don't care if it was a bachelor party, bachelorette party, or real, and there were $10,000 on the line. I'm sure we've all played poker with other people before, right? And if you've never played poker before, you don't know how to bluff, you don't know how to hold a poker face, you don't know how to hold your cards, you are guessing, right? And an experienced poker player is likely to pick up on that, because while your friend might not, he's never played poker either right? You, this other guy you don't know, he's been reading people for an awfully long time and making a lot of money off of it. That guy is the veteran quarterback. And if you've played a lot of poker, you have, you will be calm. Basically, like your cards won't make a, as much of a difference to you because you've been there and you've done that. In that same way, a lot of these blitz disguises run by teams that blitz all the time are like the, those guys have been there and he'll be comfortable pushing his weight forward and taking all the coaching points of what makes a really, really good blitz visual before heartlessly dropping back into coverage and taking the ball away from you because he's practiced it. Whereas a guy like Kyler Gordon, to use an honest example, like especially early on in the season, you could tell the Bears were throwing blitzes out because nothing else worked, right? They, they were just throwing it all out there. And you could feel it because when the Bears were blitzing, don't we remember it was obvious, right? Like it's, I think it's intriguing at least that when we watched that early Bears tape, and I do wish I had a visual example, but you're just going to have to go theater of the mind and remember with me that we could point out the Bears are blitzing before they ever blitzed because they only had four or five formations. And when they lined up in something else or they pushed somebody up at the line of scrimmage, you said to yourself, huh, they don't normally do this. I bet that's real. And it was. And then near the end of the season or the middle, they got into all those man blitz looks and they started just shamelessly blitzing. I loved this. They started blitzing TJ Edwards from five yards deep and he would just catch the seas parting. And it was, it was badass. I was not a fan of depth blitzing. Friend of mine had run a defense that was all based in man depth blitzes and they never worked for obvious reasons. I mean, when you're blitzing from this far off, you basically have to catch a free runner or you simply won't get any pressure right? But the way that, yes, John, we are, uh, the way that the Bears at this point have set their defense up leaves a whole lot for me wondering, honestly, what Eberflus wants to do with it next year, but we'll get there as we get there. Uh, I got to tell you though, John, I do really appreciate all those wonderful organizations that are willing to willing to rep all those blitzes and get better and better at them because a really nice blitz, is there anything more beautiful in defensive football than a really, really nice blitz? 
Unfortunately. <laughs> hey, Peyton, the hope is it gets better. I mean, J Jeremy, it's funny that you mentioned that, right? Uh, you mentioned the only way this defense works is if every de if is the only way de this defense works is if everybody on the defense is great. The honest opinion that I've come to develop, Jeremy, is that that's pretty much true of every defense in ball. Defense in particular is a very quirky side of football where I'm beginning to understand slowly but surely. Look, I am not about to tell you that I like overemphasizing defensive pickups, but I will tell you that I can see why so many teams, whether that's the Packers, whether that's the Eagles, whether that's now it's the Bears, whether it's the all you've you can think of all men, all kinds, all kinds of teams that you've seen just invest, 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 invest in defense. The Chiefs have recently just invested, 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 invested in defense. How dare they uh trot out a receiver room that's as bad as last year's was and win the Super Bowl with it. It's because on defense, you do have to be better than the guys across from you. There's no way to cure Keenan Allen taking a game over other than covering him, right? And Jeremy, you're, you're mentioning the guy in Minnesota can make a top five out of a box of scraps. Talking about Brian Flores, as if Brian Flores' defense didn't like fall apart a little bit um, there at the end of the year because they were out of talent. Like, I'm right there with you, Jeremy, that all kinds of, or that all kinds of defenses can speak a couple, of, or they can basically go for a couple of weeks. Like, and I'm right there with you that the offense fell apart and so did the rest of the team. Like, we're on the same page, Jeremy. It's more to say, that's one of those blitz defenses that we're talking about that I think is sweet. Um, it's, it's more, oh, no fair. I got you now. It's, it's just tougher to sustain that level of play without, Good talent and good scheme. Good scheme can get you a run. Good talent generally sticks, but it's harder to keep good talent as you go. And like you're saying, John, Flores' defense is such a punch-you-in-the-mouth defense. I loved it. I really did love it when the Bears were shifting towards more of a punch-you-in-the-mouth defense. Those games against Detroit are like legitimate fun watching from last year, especially defensively. It was like, we have Jared Goff in a blender? Speaking of great defensive play, can I get a sheesh? <laughs> Look at Jeff Simmons. Just heading on through. <laughs> See you later. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh boy. And one thing I love about this, so you want to talk about cool defensive schemes, the fact that we've got a safety walked up into the A-gap, and then we've got another linebacker here walked up in the other A-gap means that a lot of the chances are the uh, Titans had determined, just throwing this out there, you can, you can nearly see it, right? The Titans have determined that the whole line is playing inside-out ball, right? And so they're basically checking these threats before they head to further outside threats. But you're going to notice that there is a pretty hefty gap between both of those other guys because they're expecting one of these lanes to end up open. And as this 77 here, watch his weight balance. He just doesn't get out as far as 68 does, right? 68 is out of there. He's ready for Autry to try to get the, or to try to pen that gap. And he's right, right? 77 makes the mistake of honoring two just a little too much. And the moment he does, uh, Jeff won. <laughs> Sim Simmons is out of there. No chance. Like, it's funny because, Travis, you mentioned it, nice use of hands. It is a nice use of hands. But the fact that he's able to get this leveraged one-on-one -on -one makes the cross chop that much nastier on the inside. And then burst of speed, he's through. Easy sack. Awesome. Uh, so, Travis... I, I haven't, I haven't coached. I didn't play <laughs> like I just, I love football and I've just been watching tape online with people for the better part of at this point, four years, give me another four or five years and hopefully I'll know even more. And that'd be awfully fun, man. Look at this. Look at this. I love this kind of play. Watch the little adjustments that Bayard's going to make as he's watching the number three receiver. So he goes from quarterback or his eyes go from three to two back to three like he's keeping an eye and i love this right here he sees the three receiver stop his feet to break and we are primed and we are 
cutting this thing down. We throw that ball, it's picked. You can feel Bayard, in my opinion, is a predator in open space. And that's my favorite part about his game. I watch a ton of reactionary DBs. I watch so many DBs that are totally and completely reactionary to the football. And <coughs> Bayard seems like he's playing ahead of the play, which is sweet. Um, yeah, I'm no, exactly, Eric. I'm no three-year letterman. What is it? That guy, The doesn't he talk about his Ford truck all the time on Twitter? And hey, I really appreciate that, Travis. I really do. I mean, especially because I love football. Bayard, or like, I love football, but... Everything I always hear is that football is always the land of coaches telling other coaches that that coach is stupid and doesn't know anything, right? <laughs> no worries, Sonny. So you mentioned, uh, is there a good YouTube source out there, book, just to learn the fundamentals? So personally, I would tell you Bobby Peters, a high school coach in the Detroit area. Oh, my book's in front of me. Back to the desk. Oh, no, please avoid. These, if... If you are comfortable reading out of sort of a textbook, right? And also, uh, so you're talking about reading in something that's a little textbooky, and you're going to have to reverse engineer a lot, a lot of what any of this stuff means, but you're going to get a lot of sweet X's and O's resources from something like this, where at least you'll get comfortable with the gist of how play calls are designed. And I think that's big, right? Because once you get the gist of how a lot of these work, uh, let me see. Yes, I will. Bobby Peters, Amazon author. Jibby asks, what's the main difference between Bayard and Eddie? Uh, the main difference is that Bayard's not hurt. So, you don't, you definitely feel a little bit of a lot of similarity, honestly, between the two. But Bayard, at least right now, is not as susceptible. Like, he looks as if he's got a little bit of a quicker break uh, than Eddie does. And I think a lot of that comes down to injury. I'd say Eddie, I think, is better in cover four scenarios, but you do get plenty of plays just like this one where, look at that. I mean, Bayard can definitely tackle better. But I also think that Ben, that can get a little over-dramatized because I do think a lot of tackling is just a matter of, ah, no, I get that because I would tell you, Ben, that I think Bayard, Bayard is probably better instincts. Ugh, it's so complicated. Eddie will have these savant moments where he picks up the play before the opposing player knows what the play is, like the quarterback. But Bayard is just generally more consistent in how he makes his reads, and he shows up to space a lot more often, I think, than Eddie did last year, given that Eddie wasn't the athlete he used to be. And I do think his tackling angles are better. Like, that's definitely part of it. But you end up with plays just like this, where Bayard's going to get there a split second late. It's an NFL first down, which, you know, you don't like, but at the very least, you're going to see an awful lot more of Bayard delivering a pretty strong hit at the same time. Yeah, this is a pretty tackle-heavy game. Rob, one thing that I do, honestly, is pick a lot of these uh, examples on accident. Like, as much as I would love to tell you that I'm here just picking out statistically significant games of uh, of Bayard, of Swift, etc., I really try to find a balance and watch semi-randomly with nearly no idea how the player actually did because I want to try to get as honest a take as possible. And I try to usually watch two or three games at least before I give an opinion, but really we only have time to show one. Here's a good job by, by or from Kevin of reading the play out, realizing we are... We are hosed. This is cover three sky. We have nobody there. I got to get over. Boom. I think so, uh, Matthew, personally, that Eddie's a better full-scale center fielder, but he's a little more specialized to that role than somebody like Bayard is who can play a lot, who wears a lot more hats, even if he's not is good at that one role. And the good news is Flus, I don't think, wants to only run Bayard in that one role. But we'll see. Is this a ripper from Herbert? It is. What is this? Play action, hit the back of your drop, rock, go. Hey, look, it's Everett. Okay. 
so Everett's got some snap to him. I mean, it's not, it's more over exaggerated. Like it's, it's more exaggerated movement than it is actual route running snap. But Hey, I don't know. It's just, not, it's not something the bears have really seen from their tight ends that much. But also again, this isn't really a route that I'm sitting here crowning him over. Uh, Everett is a yak guy, which is nice. Like, look at this. Boom. Get off me. Get off me. That's fun. 4P, you mentioned, will they draft a Kalen Bullock given Bayard's age? I don't think that they can draft a Kalen Bullock at all because I think Kalen Bullock is going to go in the second. I don't think the Bears are going to pick up a second. And I think that they signed Jonathan Owens and Kevin Bayard in part because they don't want to, they don't want to do that, right? Everett was picked one before Shaheen. That's hilarious. That's the thing, Travis. As I understand it anyways, Everett's a solid little route runner. Nothing to over-dramatize, but a good player. I mean, especially for, what, six million a year? Seems like a fine enough, uh, it seems to me, like it's fine. Really nice little throw off of the world's most basic fake screen. Titans bite it immediately, and Herbert just laces the ball. Look at the gas Herbert puts on this. I think it's hilarious because a lot of people throw the lollipop the moment that they know they have the guy open, but Herbert just launches it anyways with absolutely no fear of the bad things God might do to him if he throws the ball too hard. That's a joke. Um, so I've seen an awful lot of drops in that, in that case. Let's see. Uh, 4P asks, honest opinion, how under or how underwhelmed have I been with polls as free agency? So 4P, it's absolutely not what I expected. Got to be so real there. And it puts a lot of pressure on the draft where, it, which is a place we've been at before. But I do want to remind you 4P. Okay. So like, hang on, we got to go to the real talk screen here for just a brief moment. So one of the things about football that has really pissed me off, can I be really blunt with you, 4P, about that? This has really pissed me off about football discourse, is that people in my position constantly act like we have we know everything, right? I could give you the data-driven like perspective. I could tell you the way that things normally work, right? I could tell you, hey, a lot of people have had success doing this thing right? But Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus are definitely building a team and they have a vision for what that team is. And frankly, I can tell you, I think I know what that vision is, right? But the fact that th this reminds me a lot of the same way we felt about last year's offensive tackle market, right? And 4P, are you upset that the Bears didn't sign Mike McGlinchey? Are you frustrated that they didn't end up signing Juwan Taylor? McGlinchey, who, by the way, was one of the worst right tackles in football. And then Juwan Taylor, who got benched by, I can't remember who they put in, like, ahead of him. But they signed Lyle Collins and, like, they signed Lyle Collins and ended up just playing him over Taylor, I think, for a significant, or for a decent portion of the season. Like, at least as much as they could. I think Taylor ended up getting back in games, but they paid him $20 million a year to not do them anything good. Look, I'm not trying to sit here and tell you that I'm happy the Bears didn't sign a defensive end because I wanted a starting defensive end, and I said as much a lot. I'm not going to walk that back, but when you see Leonard Williams getting 21 and a half AAV, and when you see D Justin Jones getting 10 and a half AAV, when you see... Well, gosh, Hunter, I'm fine with like 25 is fine by me, but that's the thing you speak of free agencies of, let me see. You speak of free agencies of your in, in the before time. No, I hear you, Donald, but I mean, Brad Spielberger pointed this out on Twitter and I want to give him credit for it. He said, the bears don't know what they have in their quarterback. And regardless of what the bears do, it kind of, kind of true. Right? Like, I, and that's not me trying to say that I, Caleb, Drake, Bo Nix, uh, Jaden Daniels, Justin Fields, that whoever the Bears that have, that they're not hoping that they'll be good, but they don't know that they'll be good. Of course it's, of course it's high, Eric. Eric mentions, uh, er, like, Hunter was 25 mil a year. How is that fine? 29 years old seems high. That's what I'm saying, Eric. There's like a hefty tax. 
hefty tax that got placed on all of these moves. They were all crazy, crazy high. All of them were, right? And I can't help but look at this situation and just say, because that's the thing. J-Mass says, I don't like the idea of drafting for need year after year. It's only day two, though, so we'll see. First of all, J-Mass, uh, I agree with you. Second of all, they're definitely not done, right? Like, they're, they're going to sign people. It's just a matter of whether they sign anybody that matters. Around this time last year, they didn't have Mercedes Lewis yet. We like that. They also didn't have Robert Tanyan yet. That didn't do anything for us, right? It goes both. Uh, 4P mentions, can we be honest, Polls has been trashed when it comes to IOL and receivers. Why trust him to get it right all of a sudden? So the good news about receiver is that I think that he's taken a lot of shots. I mean, you have to remember that whether, look, I hope I'm not about to dig into the hater raid, but it's not as if Chicago's receivers right now, Sans Claypool, have been particularly easy to eval. Probably Valus too, right? But Valus has just been a mess. Tyler Scott actually seems to me like he might be able to play. That's just my read on the situation. But not only was he a rookie, the Bears passing offense last year was deeply unhealthy. I mean, I think we can all agree with that. Now, the interior offensive line thing, you're not going to get an argument from me there. Like, I, uh, <laughs> the fact that the Bears had not one, not two, but three centers and none of whom could snap the ball is absolutely hilarious. Hilariously bad, that is. Now, Ryan Poles is the one that identified that Tevin Jenkins ought to be a guard. And I do want to give him the tiniest little applause for that because I think Tevin Jenkins has been twice the guard he was a tackle. Now, bar low, he didn't play a whole lot of tackle, but the guard that he's played has been awesome which is sick. Like, that's good. I do think that the Nate Davis eval had to be off of pass tape, and the Nate Davis eval off of pass tape was drastically better than what we saw in a Bears uniform. That one, I don't even know how to really explain that to you, right? Like, Lucas Patrick, I kept trying to hype myself up on, but I really just... I think it was obvious that I didn't see a ton with Lucas Patrick, and especially as things decayed over the years. But Davis was good sometimes and just deeply inconsistent and overall really bad we don't need to pretend that davis was actually pretty good but his tennessee tape was drastically better than that and i watched four to five games of it so you got a player that i liked he just played really badly last year and i don't have a great answer for that other than to say it's really center where he's been he's been dying out there and i couldn't tell you why the bears don't like their center right i also hope hope that the Bears aren't done at interior offensive line. I don't know if it's going to be Connor Williams, but even an Evan Brown, even a swing guard would probably make me feel better than I do at this stage, right? Just because right now, Ryan Bates is the starter, but that, I don't hate Bates as the starter as much as I think I'm supposed to. Like, I would tell you guys, I think Bates is a good player. The, Bates, the little bit of Bates that we watched last week isn't indicative, but the Bates that I remember watching two years ago and the Bates that I dusted up on just recently, like Bates could easily be an okay center and a Joe Tipman at home kind of thing. The problem is if Bates is the center, who's the sixth offensive lineman? This is the Bears. He's going to play, right? Like the sixth offensive lineman is going to play legitimate meaningful snaps. So is that a rookie? Because I don't like that. And I do want somebody that's not Jatiree Carter in the room. Jatiree can be the seventh offensive lineman, and that's fine. But, I, and again, I don't need much. Evan Brown is a former seventh rounder. He it was yet, he was last year's like number 140 in terms of like PFF grade. He did not have a great year in Seattle, but at least he knows the system and he can be the coach on the field, whatever you think of that, and be an extra center sitting in the reserve room. I just, I just want to see a little bit of attention paid to the offensive line. That's it. And hey, kudos to you, Larry Borum. All of this to say, all of this to say, Ryan Poles seems to be building a team with a slightly different identity than I think a lot of Bears fans want him to build it. That doesn't make it automatically bad. It could make it frustrating. It will definitely make it frustrating if it doesn't work, right? But we want the Bears to be the Chiefs. He may want to be the lovey bears, but with a better quarterback, whatever that looks like to him. Now, do, will will whoever the bears draft or roll with next year automatically become they will, will they automatically become that quarterback? I don't know. I, I can't pretend to know. I could give you my optimistic take that this is the best shot the bears have had at getting their quarterback position 
right in over a decade. I mean, this is even better than when they had number three, for obvious reasons. The roster is in a better shape than usual, drastically better than nearly any other team in history when you're picking at number one, right? Like, the Bears have an opportunity here to make a selection that will define the next decade. I hope it defines it well. <laughs> because <laughs> that's the other thing, right? Like, here's the other part of this, okay? So uh, Nick Way- Nick Whalen and I recorded a Bear With Us episode. It's going to come out tomorrow. Nick pointed out that there's a chance that Caleb Williams has some massive, like, vertebra, f- vertebra fusion in his back or something like that. And he doesn't want anybody to know about it, and it's why he did his medicals the way that he did them. If the Bears don't make certain things public, uh, like... As things stand right now, if the Bears traded down and they managed to get Roma Dunes, at, like let's say that they traded down with the Giants. They got three first, future first rounders. They got two second rounders. Uh, they got number six. And then they also have number nine. This I did not do intentionally, but nice. Okay. So they take Marvin Harrison and then they take an edge. And then for any reason at all, Justin Fields flames out. And he doesn't end up a D or like the bears end up having to look for other answers at quarterback. They basically become the Steelers or the super Steelers or somewhere in that range, even though they're winning an okay amount of games, they bring in veteran competition the year after that they end up becoming maybe the Browns like with Joe Flacco, but a little bit better. And all the while Caleb Williams becomes a star in New York. If that happened, we will never live that down. And I think everybody knows that that's just not how the NFL works. The NFL does not under-prioritize quarterbacks. They over-prioritize quarterbacks for better and for worse, especially in the public eye, because that's that's just how this game works. I don't I don't know how else to say that, right? Like, whether that's a narrative or a story thing, we have yet to see any team just middle finger the quarterback position and say, we'll figure it out with our other stuff, right? Like, if the Bears did trade down and they took uh, Bo Nix or... Rattler, et cetera, et cetera. And they also had Justin Fields and everybody sucks. Like then I, first of all, I do think the quarterback position matters, especially with the way that I think a lot of teams are playing defense right now. If they can box you in, in the run game, your quarterback is going to win you a game. And Marvin Harrison may get really open and DJ Moore may get really open. But if Tyson Bajan can't push the ball to the corner, or if Spencer Rattler can't go without two interceptions, then it just doesn't make a difference. I mean, we're getting too off the quarterback track. It's all to say that I personally believe that this is a really high leverage decision for Ryan Poles. But I don't know. I, I just want some clarity on the direction that he's going to go with it. Somebody asked earlier, am I still pretty convinced that they're taking Caleb? Look, I only go to about like, I only personally go up to about 93% sure of anything that the Bears are going to do because there's always a chance that whether it's information that's out there is currently bad, whether it's people changing their minds, whether it's people spinning this way, that way, or the other, stuff changes all the time. And so I'm never going to box my into X is definitely going to happen because I think that's how you end up getting clowned on. Barlissimo says, so what did the 49ers do then? Garoppolo, Lance, Mr. Irrelevant. Well, they traded up or they traded three firsts for a quarterback and then they got, then they picked a good quarterback with Brock Purdy for sure. Like they also have, I would argue, better coaching than the Bears do on offense. And that helps make a lot of it go. I mean, Kyle Shanahan's schemes are really something special and they're hard to imitate because there's only one Kyle Shanahan. Now, all kinds of other people can be offensive savants in their own way. But to for us to say that the 49ers are just loaded with offensive superstars isn't a totally fair representation of a fifth round tight end, a second round receiver, a first round receiver, a running back that got paid a lot of money and they traded a handful of late picks, quite a handful, but a handful nevertheless of round two, or I think it was round three and lower uh, picks at that point. A lot of these guys have now become superstars, or they kind of vaguely were before they were Niners. Like, McCaffrey was definitely a superstar, but he'd gotten injured a lot. And then he comes to San Fran, and now he's healthy, and now he's a beast again. I mean, if not, one of the best. Like, and that's what you, and 
Barelissimo you mentioned, but that's the point. We're betting on better coaching and improving more talent by a trade back versus a, betting on a generational quarterback. I think you can do a little bit of both, but at the end of the day, Barelissimo, I think you hard cap your ceiling and you set yourself up to lose to Mahomes at the end of the day. And we'd all take a couple trips to the Super Bowl and losses to Mahomes. And I totally get that. But I also think that you're forgetting that there's drastically more pressure involved in this decision than just do you win enough games? Because the style points kind of count. Like, it, I know you're going to hate hearing that, but if Caleb Williams throws for 4,000 yards and Justin Fields doesn't, there are going to be people that are going to frame this immediately as, imagine what the Bears have been if they did have Caleb Williams, especially if Justin Fields doesn't get Marvin Harrison over, or Marvin Harrison and DJ Moore don't combine for 2,200 yards. Drafting Marvin Harrison Jr. was a complete waste, in my opinion. Like, the other piece to this is that you have to get more production, probably 2,500 yards at that point. I mean, 2,200 yards, and you've got DJ Moore and Marvin Harrison. I don't know. That's that's a decent number. I could talk myself into that being a decent benchmark. At the very least, it's fair, right? And then you have a, a wide receiver three and Cole Kamen on top of that. Like, the, the hope here would be that whoever the Bears quarterback is, that if you're going to spend that much on receiver, especially defensive backs, or, or like, especially on defense, that you get results from it right? But so they should have been more aggressive at the end as far as going for it on fourth. Uh, If we're being honest, the Niners didn't lose because of the quarterback. Actually, Draco, I think the other hidden piece to this is that Purdy's just really good. I mean, in my opinion anyways, right? Where I think that Purdy's just been playing ball. You go back and you watch some of those games, like Purdy's ripping the ball over the middle. Purdy's making throws while getting hit that are firecracker throws, like 22, 25 yards downfield into the corner of the defense, and they're on target, which is impressive. Like, Brock Purdy is making throws that make me, when I watch him, go, oh, shoot, I've talked a lot of mess about you, but you are balling. Like, the 49ers committed three first-round picks to finding an answer at quarterback, and they found an answer in the seventh-round pick. I mean, good drafting on their part, good execution, solid job. I mean, if you want to be a quarterback development guy instead of a, they have it or they don't have it, then applaud the quarterback development too because I guess Jimmy Garoppolo developed while he was a Niner. It's too bad Trey, or it too, it's too bad Trey didn't. But like you're saying, Draco, a lot of it's great coaching. And I'm with you, barely smoke team game. The Chiefs defense was awesome. I don't think Patrick Mahomes took over as much as a lot of people want him to have taken over. But I do think Trey or I do think Mahomes took over in the first two drives of the Baltimore game and apparently scared Baltimore and Todd Monk and enough to push them into calling a pass heavy offensive attack that they just didn't need to be calling. Uh and that's the other thing, 4P. I mean, who's to say who Trey is and isn't, but they're not playing him, right? Um but so if you had two wide receiver ones and don't break 4,000 yards, I tend, or at the very least, John, there are going to be people that are going to argue that if he goes 3,700 yards and rushes for 1,000, then your quarterback's good enough. So there could be some ticky tack here and there. But at the end of the day, if you've got two wide receiver ones and you don't win enough games to account for the fact that they're not producing, then you probably mis- misinvested your resources. And look, guys, I hope you've watched this channel enough. I hope. You've watched this channel enough to know that I am very pro football talent. I generally want to trade down. I'm the one who's talking to people and saying that at the very least, it should be an option. Even if one of those wide receivers or those three wide receivers are there to trade down anyways and to go get more talent. We like talented football players. I really try not to be a, yeah, it's all on the quarterback channel, right? I just like, I would hope that I'm the one who would tell you that if there was a shred of doubt left of whether Justin Fields was a franchise quarterback, that that's what the Bears should do. And if you wanted to trade down, I'm definitely interested in the trading down. I'm interest, more interested in trading down from one than I let on. I just still don't want to do it with Fields. I mean, maybe I'm just tired of the way Fields plays football. That can be allowed, I guess. But I'm much more up Geno Smith's alley or honestly, just get creative with what you can do at quarterback than I am bedridden to Fields because I personally don't think Fields is going to improve his drop back timing. I don't think Fields is, I think Fields is also really reliant on athleticism and I see that athleticism very similarly to a non-renewable resources or a non-renewable resource. One of the other things that I personally don't love that Fields seems to have is a down. And I can't position this right. A downward slope where whenever he starts, usually September, I mean, let alone the first quarter to fourth quarter thing, but like when he starts in September, then he's at his freshest and he looks like a superhuman athlete. And then he slowly 
gets a little slower and a little slower as he keeps playing. And then he takes a break. Or last season, we saw him dislocate his thumb. Bad. Don't like that. And then he ends up fresh again. And shocker, after a month off, comes back and looks like a superhuman athlete again. And like you're saying, Draco, DJ Moore and Cole Komet had their best seasons last year. Draco, you're totally right. I mean, you can't really have these two like not coincide. I mean, the, Cole Komet, it, saying that Justin Fields is the best quarterback that Cole Komet has ever played with, it, it's not a super high bar to clear right now, especially since we didn't have guys like Andy Dalton, et cetera, for a full season if you wanted to go there, but I'm not really not trying to bark up the Andy Dalton tree. And DJ Moore's best quarterback up to that point was probably Sam Darnold, right? And so if Fields focuses on those two, gives them all kinds of volume, we do know Fields can throw the football accurately, especially when it comes to getting the ball down the field. And those two top targets, especially Komet, kudos to Komet, man, he also took a step forward. Like, even in the games that Bajent played, Cole Komet was productive. He has earned the trust of a lot of quarterbacks that throw him a lot of footballs to the point where JT O'Sullivan's whole meme about it is kind of egg on JT's face, at least just a little in that category, because Cole continues to earn these guys' trust, continues to. And like you meant, and barely Zuma, you mentioned Fields is better at drop back from under center. He's been chaos in the gun with the centers that we've had. I do personally think that when you talk about drop back under center, we have nearly no evidence of that. And if you're talking about play action from under center, I think a lot of quarterbacks are better from play action under center. I mean, when you do the back turn stuff and it works for you, then you generally have a whole bunch of open seams and open space because you pull guys out of their run fit. It is quarterbacking, maybe not on easy mode, but if the protection holds up, it's a cleaner look than a lot of other guys. And then you mentioned which quarterback and receiver or tight end had the highest quarterback uh, quarterback uh, rating last year. Mahomes, Kelsey, Tuan Hill, or Fields and DJ Moore. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that the, the question is phrased the way that it is because of or because it's Fields and Moore. And I would credit a ton of that to Moore. I don't think you need a better example of that, honestly, than the Washington game, which is just one game to circle. But DJ Moore would have had 300 yards if every ball hit him in the hands. And that's an unrealistic expectation. I'm not trying to go there. But Darnell Mooney had 110 yards and two touchdowns taken off of the board because those balls were off target compared to the DJ Moore ones where Moore fished a whole lot of them out of the sky. I mean, it's my opinion that I thought DJ Moore was revelatory last season. And I don't know if Tyson Bajent is going to do a lot of the damage that he did with Moore because Tyson Bajent doesn't have the ability to drive the ball down the field that Fields does and Drew Locke does and a couple of other guys that <clears throat> they've got bigger arms than somebody like Tyson. But let me see uh, who did that. Oh, so catching up on everything, five touchdowns, Ben, I don't I can't remember what that is. Uh, let's see. You have to continue to build the offense. I get it. You could be overly critical of fields, but the offensive line has been a mess. Our receivers need an upgrade. Swapping out quarterbacks keeps us in the same position every year. Uh, if you don't uh, surround the quarterback with talent and proper coaching, I mean, you definitely need to surround the quarterback with talent and proper coaching. To be, to be very blunt, Jay Sanders, I don't see why it needs to be fields. And moreover, if it was fields, I would have banged the table for competition. I mean, Gardner Minshew would have been somebody that I would have been really interested in, or I don't, don't really want like a Jacoby Brissett or somebody like that. But I personally, if the Bears were going to rock with Fields, would have wanted a legitimate second quarterback that could, was a backup plus, where if Fields didn't bond well with the offense, then you could switch him out. Because I thought Fields' play last year was really pretty poor. I mean, at least when I'm looking at him from just a top to bottom quarterbacking piece i mean not to go full kurt warner because i actually think kurt warner can be way too scalpel sometimes i mean kurt really likes to point out that this quarterback should be a 10-year nfl veteran and a lot of <laughs> any younger quarterback than that just doesn't play like that and that's okay I, or at least you got to have a curve where you understand where these guys do and don't need to be right but at least to me, Fields can't be your only option. To me, sticking with Fields and only Fields is an absolutely foolhardy proposition. Now, you don't have to do that with Caleb. I guess in theory, you could bring like a veteran in or with Drake or with Bo Nix. I'm really trying not to commit to one because while I have a favorite, that's not the point, right? You could bring in a veteran, but why? I mean, the rookie always plays at that point. The Bears tried to do this with Mitch and Glenn and it didn't work. The Bears tried to do this with Fields, Foles, and Dalton, and it didn't work. The rookie always ends up playing. So if the Bears are going to end up caving and playing the rookie, I'd rather he just plays, 
from Jump Street. But so let's see. The only reason I want Fields gone is because we have the number one pick. I get it. But Fields is not what's holding this team back. Jay Sanders, I completely disagree. I think Fields absolutely held the team back last year. Bears were five and eight in games with Fields. That's not a strong enough mark. It's not, especially with the defense near the end of the year that didn't deserve to lose a game, in my opinion. The Browns game, the Bears absolutely should have won. The Packers game, I thought the Bears defense was all right. That one I'll give like away. But the fact that the Bears end up scoring nine points, they don't sniff the end zone. And the moment that they do, Fields immediately throws a pick that gets dropped by uh, the defender covering Cole Komet. That sucks, in my opinion. I mean, it's there's just too many bad results. There's too many games, especially when the Bears aren't winning by the end of the first half. Or yeah, especially when they aren't winning by the end of the first half, that it just doesn't work out. Jay Sanders, you could argue that it's not Fields' fault. I mean, it doesn't have to be all Fields' fault. He's the quarterback. This is like saying that if the fast car had a better carburetor and it had a muffler that kept its or kept its heat better and the steering wheel wasn't jittery, that it would be faster. But we're just not going to talk about the engine. Right. Like the engine, the quarterback drives so much of the offense to say that Fields couldn't have made more plays in that Browns game. I personally think is cutting him too much slack, but that's not trying because the other thing is we get way too binary with this Jay Sanders, where I can't also criticize the offensive line and say they got murdered against the Browns. And I can't also criticize the receivers and say that was really the beginning of the end for Mooney, who seemed as if in many ways he was giving up. Now, I don't want to credit a quarterback with a Hail Mary. That is a stroke of blind luck, which I, I get. And that's exciting. And the Bears were Tanya and catching the football away from the score being different there at the end, especially because the Bears defense just murdered the Browns for three full quarters. It just sucks that the or that the Bears managed to lose that game. I mean, that one in particular was just such a shot where, where it hurts. Barely Simo, I didn't catch what you're saying. More is better than Kelsey and Tyreek Hill, who averaged uh, eight yards of separation. Okay. I mean, I thought more was spectacular. I, I did. Now, was more better than better than Travis Kelsey? Yes. That one? Absolutely. Uh, not only did I think Travis Kelsey was pretty lackluster in the regular season, but I do think he's showing his age. Uh, Tyreek Hill, man, that guy is different. But also, I do think to, to a targets... Uh, targets Tyreek enough that if we went back and looked at like quarterback rating or something, I'm sure there's some game losing interceptions in there that drag the rating down. But I mean, that's at the end of the day, I'm trying not to just make this a stats thing. Not, not because I'm trying to, I don't know. <laughs> you picked a stat that got me. I mean, that's a, that's a good one. That's a strong one. And Draco's argument of these guys just had their best seasons. What does that mean about like fields as a quarterback? How does that make it bad? Like I totally get it. I mean, at the end of the day, I know that there are Giants fans that are making the argument that Daniel Jones is that dude. Why would we want to draft a quarterback? And I know that there are Commanders fans. I see, I've seen them that are saying, Sam Howell is that dude. Why would we draft a quarterback? We could draft a quarterback and he's not going to be better than Sam Howell. I know that there are Minnesota fans. I mean, there were Packers fans that held on to love for the whole time. Bears fans kept saying, love sucks. Love doesn't suck. Like, I get it. This happens all the time. Happens. No, that's not true, Jay Sanders. If you think no Giants fans like that exist, you may not have met them yet, but they're on social media. Who knows? They could be bots, but there's absolutely a Daniel Jones clan. And if you go look at any of Bobby Skinner or Justin Pennick, but it's Bobby who normally like kicks the hornet's nest, you're gonna see him in there. Like, but so like you're saying, Ben, let's go ahead and uh let's go ahead and get back to just the topic because I am really curious to see what happens with Swift uh as we go through that. But like you're saying, J Mass, I mean, it at the very least, I have seen all kinds of evidence that you hand any fan base a quarterback and they won't give up on him insofar as they're able to. I mean, that doesn't automatically mean that anybody with believers is automatically bad. That's ridiculous, right? But it does, at least in my opinion, bring up the question of, okay, does the fact that people believe in him and that we've got some stats that work in our favor here automatically mean something? Because it might. But I'll leave that up to you, I guess. Um, let's see. You said these coaches look pedestrian without their star quarterback. Oh, okay. That's, I don't think that's talking to me. Um, let me see. Make fact. I do think that it's also, uh, frankly more than just quarterback mentoring, but I, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, that is my perspective on just how quarterbacks work, but feel free to disagree with me. Um, Let's see. Some of these teams who won don't have star quarterbacks. I mean, it depends on what you're calling a star quarterback, right? Especially because at the end of the day, we are all in pursuit of the Bears winning. 
So there's definitely more to the game than just quarterback. And if the Bears had to trade up for number one, I wouldn't want to do it, right? But I'm serious when I say if the Bears do tr- or if the Bears do trade back, my primary disappointment is going to be that they've hinged it all on Justin Fields. I mean, my primary argument that I would say at that stage is why him specifically. If you're really going to trade down and you're going to bet your entire franchise's reputation on this idea that Caleb and Drake May and AJ or and uh, gosh, and Anthony Richardson and CJ Stroud and Jaden Daniels and Bo Nix and Michael Penix, none of them are good enough. None of them are better than trading down and sticking with the guy that we have. Well, then you better extend him immediately. First of all, you can't do this fifth year option game, in my opinion, because the moment you try to be like, well, we want him, but we don't want him, but we want him, but we don't want him. You traded, you traded down from number one twice. Second of all, we're talking about a bottom 25, uh, or not bottom 25, we're talking about somebody outside of the top 20 in terms of EPA per play and outside of the top 32 in terms of passing success rate. You mentioned you don't have to hinge it all on fields when you have a haul of future ones to fall back on. Jay Sanders, at that point, you still have to pick a rookie quarterback. You still have to pick a rookie quarterback. And at that point, you would be throwing a rookie quarterback into the fire and they wouldn't ultimately be the number one overall pick. And if you did get somehow three number one overall picks in in a row, then not only is Pulse fired, he's gagonzo at that point, unless you've traded for it and that team went and got it for it. And I guess there you go. That's something, right? Um, but I can't help but think that at least with Fields, there's no reason not to have a decent veteran. If the Bears went to two, then three, and came away with the extra picks at Williams and May or Daniels, for example, not leveraging it all on fields, and you're still bettering the wi- or the wider team. So you definitely can, not right? Because then at that point, you're not going to get Williams. Williams is going to one. Like, period. If that doesn't happen, you can take $100 from me. Like, not literally everybody. But that one, that's happening. Daniels or May, good question. I don't think Daniels is good. So that would really disappoint me if the Bears ultimately did all of that. They moved off of Caleb, they moved off of Drake, and they still got Jaden Daniels. To me, at that point, you have Fields and also Fields. But maybe this one's better because he has a better release, even though he wasn't really a phenomenal player up until his fifth year in college, when finally he's a man among boys and he scrambles 33% of the time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I'm by no means trying to make it all one thing. It's more that at that point, you don't have it all hinged on Fields, but at that point, I also think that you have now made a much worse bet because now you're in bed with two quarterbacks that aren't that great. I, I don't really want to move it to McCarthy. I'd rather it be Justin Fe- or I'd rather it be Caleb Williams or Drake May. And I personally think that if you did anything else, you've wasted the number one overall pick. Or you can trade back and you can get a veteran quarterback. Like, I mean, I don't know if you're going to be able to get Geno Smith, but I guess they're willing to move him, which is at least something. But that at least gets the ball rolling so that then next year you can draft a different quarterback. If it's me, I'm moving on from fields, period. And to me, that's a different argument than sticking with uh, or than trading down from number one. I could actually, Jay Sanders, make a different argument for number one than Justin Fields because my eval of fields is frankly plain as day. That's how I feel about it. But that's just me. I mean, you do not have to agree with me. That's that's how I feel. Uh, and Jay Sanders, you mentioned I'm talking as if Caleb is a 100% success. The odds aren't on my side. No, I'm talking like Justin Fields is a 0% success at this point. Depending on what you want Fields to be success rate wise, it, I think it's a 0% chance that he is a franchise quarterback in the typical definition for the Chicago Bears. I think that maybe with two years of rehab, he could find something. But I personally think that he's too risky and I wouldn't, I would not pick him if it was me and my job was on the line under nearly any circumstance. At that point, I would look to other options. I don't think Caleb is a better cha- or I don't think Caleb is a 100% opportunity, but I don't believe in Fields at all at this point. I think Fields has been through two offensive coordinators. I think Fields has been through two head coaches. I think Fields has seen enough ball to where we should have seen better play. I think that Fields at this point really pushed the limits of an offensive line that I thought played better than met the eye in pass protection. Not that it mattered. I think Fields is still inconsistent about simple things like stepping up in the pocket and getting the ball away in the face of pressure. I think Fields wants to run far too often and frankly learned from a really unhealthy success loop. I need to make this so plain. I think that Fields was ultimately screwed by the Bears. I don't think he was given a development platform that was remotely healthy. I think the Bears hung him out to dry and he learned a bunch of bad habits, but now they're there. Now, now Fields 
still tries to rekindle 2022 instead of trying to rekindle 2021. I think I can't help but look at that and think that you need a minimum year or two of unlearning before you will learn. At that point, I think there are off-platform throws that guys like Geno Smith, Derek Carr, et cetera, make that Fields simply doesn't attempt in many cases. Fields doesn't throw at what he can't get both feet pointed towards, and I think that's a major limitation in the modern NFL that most other quarterbacks don't seem to struggle with. You don't have to be Patrick Mahomes, but you probably need to be at least about Kirk Cousins, at least in my opinion, when we're talking about somebody that you want to commit things towards, especially because, Berlissimo, you mentioned zero percent, or you mentioned, do you really think it's zero percent? I think it's close enough to where it's negligible because if it's under 10%, what are we doing committing to you? At that point, do we really want to ride the quarterback roller coaster? Like 0%, I got to admit, it's definitely a little on the hyperbolic side. It's not impossible. If it's possible for Geno, if it's possible for Baker, then it's definitely possible for Fields. But I also think that until Fields moves teams, then Fields and his agent Mulligetta are still going to press for their money. And if you win with Fields next year, he's going to get it. If Fields makes the playoffs next year, you can sign up right now up for a five-year contract at $45 million AAV. And that's that's what Fields is going to cost. Or you can pick up his fifth-year option and you can ride that out, sure. But that's going to be the extension price for Justin Fields makes the playoffs after you passed on number one twice. And I can't help but look at this. And, and say that I think that's very, very easily and very quickly not worth committing to because I do think that really good locker room leaders that get their team excited are a dime a dozen. If you asked me right now, if you asked me right now who I think Justin Fields reminds me of, I think it is much more Tim Tebow than people want to admit. I think that Justin is fun. I think that Justin is exciting. I think that Justin needs a very specific subset offense that he is able to run because he doesn't want to run a lot of the things that are incredibly popular and incredibly normal and baseline in the NFL. West Coast concepts that evolved out of the 90s and then just suddenly got sprinkled into every offense that Shanahan likes to run, RPOs over the middle that Justin doesn't like ripping on, and Justin experienced some level of success and a lot of popularity. He got a stadium chanting his name. Tebow did too. But then Tebow fell out of the league. And I'm not trying to tell you that Justin's going to fall out of the league. I think he'll adapt to it better than Tebow did, especially because he's twice the athlete Tebow was. I mean, it's not that one-to-one, and that's not the point. But when Justin becomes not the guy in your mind, what is he? Because is he a backup quarterback? Trubisky faded into the background and was willing to accept that backup quarterback role. I don't know how fans would handle Justin Fields being the backup quarterback because I think fans, left, right, and center, whether that's Philly fans, I mean, just imagine Justin comes in for Jalen Hurts and wins a game on, or like that Jalen Hurts was behind in. Philly fans are going to freak out and they're going to want him to play too because Philly fans are just crazy like that. And I think that there will be some locker rooms that will consider that a distraction by definition. And I can't help but think that that just paints Justin into an incredibly uncomfortable position that he doesn't deserve. I think Justin probably should be starting in the NFL this year. The idea that the Raiders are going to run, I like Minshew. Actually starting Minshew with a straight face over somebody like Justin Fields feels pretty intense to me. But for all I know, Poles has been asking for an extremely high pick. For all I know, Rappaport's right and the Bears haven't seriously shopped Fields. I don't know what's going on. But me personally, as an evaluator, my evaluation's done. And if the Bears brought him back next year, I'd be disappointed because I think he had his three years. I think the Bears have an opportunity to move on. Jay Sanders, you say, if they didn't have the number one overall pick, you would think, well, they do. And every time I've talked about this, they've had the number one overall pick. They've been, ha- they've been holding the number one overall pick for uh, nearly the entire season. I don't think Carolina ever actually let go of it. And at one point when they did, it was the Bears who were jockeying up for that top spot. So this was always part of the conversation. This was always the standard that he had to clear. And it sucks that he didn't. And I wish he did, because the horde that they could get trading down would be amazing if they were able to get it. But that's just not the situation we're in right now, at least in my opinion. But hang on, let me let me look at this. That's the thing, Draco. You mentioned like Tebow, LOL, really. But I'm more talking about a player that's more popular then I think his play on the field actually suggests he ought to be. like, And that's the thing, Barelissimo. You can go ahead and clip it if you'd like because it's some. I mean, I said it on a stream, right? It's not something that I don't think I stand behind. And if Fields ultimately ends up getting traded for anything below a third-round pick, I, I don't know what to tell you, man. 
in terms of what the league ultimately thinks about Fields. But that's just my opinion. Every evaluator is going to get all kinds of things wrong. Either Merrill Hodge is going to look like a god or he's going to look like a silly guy, right? And every evaluator is going to do that. That's just my two cents, though. I mean, I'm tied to the Bears. I get that it would be... I think, actually, as a matter of fact, Bearlissimo, I have a lot more pressure on me to tell you that I think Fields is a spectacular athlete and that Luke Getze just sucks even though he got a job and that Darnell Mooney just sucks even though he got paid and that all these guys, all these guys are the problem. And once Fields gets Marvin Harrison Jr. and then he's got DJ Moore and then we get a six center that we didn't bother signing and then we get a good Nate Davis and Tevin Jenkins plays a lot. Then finally Fields is going to break 3,000 yards for the first time in his life. And even then he's going to push for 4,000 because I'm just going to spit out a number and tell you that Fields is going to break MVP records. Like I, I totally get that's a, That would probably give me a lot more views. And that would probably be a lot more popular. And I'd get to tweet more because right now when I tweet, I just can't even look at my notifications because, but that's just not my opinion. It's not what I saw on the tape personally. Like I, I totally get that it would be frankly cooler in my opinion. 13 mil a year for Mooney after two years of sub 600 yards. That's pretty good, man. That's, that's pretty good money for a receiver that has been categorically unproductive, right? Like, and yeah, MJ50. I mean, you look at you look at Chase Daniel right now. You want to really pop? Like you say Justin Fields is not the problem. He made that like 3 times. Like and they all got over 80,000 views. All of them. All of them. Despite the fact that the the defense won the turnover battle in nearly every game that the Bears actually won and Justin Fields had not one but two critical giveaways in the Denver game that everybody hung on Matt Eberflus's defense, including a pick at the end of the game that nobody cares about. And the Lions game, which ended in a sack fumble that nobody cares about. And the Minnesota game that ended in a fumble, two fumbles, if memory serves, that let Minnesota back into the game before he missed an open receiver over the middle. He missed an open receiver over the middle and finally the red sea parted and dj moore was open on dagger he hits dj moore and the bears win a stunning 12 to 10 against the pastronaut i mean the things that we have hailed fields for are pretty normal and the things that we don't hold against fields are i think a lot to sweep under the rug and that we wouldn't have done it for trubisky and i know that because i blamed trubisky for a lot of way worse things uh i, I mean truly i think i nitpicked way harder on Trubisky. And I think a lot of people gave me a hard time for how hard I was nitpicking on Trubisky. And I think right now, a lot of people, when they talk about Justin Fields, and you're right, Travis, we're going to get back to it. I'm going to finish this point, and then I'm just going to move on. But I think when we talk about Fields, we do so much talking about ceiling. We do so much talking about athleticism. We do so much talking about good coaching will do. And we don't do any talking about what we saw. Because if you stick with Justin Fields and you get what you got, then you failed. And if you get a little bit better than what you got, you failed. You need a category. I think you need a categorically different player. I think you need drastically more than what you got out of Justin Fields last year. I think you need somebody that can step up in the pocket. I think you need somebody that has any awareness in the pocket besides hold RT, tuck the ball down and run with it. I think you need somebody that can keep his eyes downfield beyond when he does the loopy thing where he rolls out to his left and finds a guy cross body over the middle. That's cool and all, but it's the same throw over and over and over. And that's good. That's good. But there are throws in Fields' toolkit, like a simple quick or like a quick RPO over the middle that we can't seem to make without hitting a lineman in the head. So we just stop trying to do it or slants that are open that we just don't throw or anticipatory throws that we're late to. And they get batted away by the Arizona Cardinals or slot fades to Khalil Herbert that we leave too short. And we give up an interception to the Arizona Cardinals that lets the Arizona Cardinals, the worst team in football at the time back into the game so that they can potentially drive down the field and win, but they don't because Matt Eberflus's defense shuts the door. Like there are so many things that we just, don't really talk about because why would we talk about that? That would, that would suck. Why do we talk about the fact that fields is quarterback rating in the first quarterback is hundred and or why, why do we talk about the fact that fields is quarterback rating in the first quarter is 119. That's really great. Passer rating, I guess. Then in the second quarter, it's 90. Hey, that's pretty good. And then in the third quarter, it's 89. Uh, you know what? Not that bad. And then in the fourth quarter, it's 55. I think it is. It might be like 56.1, but you go really good to fine, to fine, to bad in the first, second, third, fourth quarter. Those are his 2023 splits. And we just, we're just going to look past that because that might mean something and, and that might be something consistent. And 
we might have a habit of not making the play at the end of the game, despite the fact that Ryan Poles and Kerry Joseph and Matt Eberflus have all cited fourth, fourth quarter playmaking as a key piece of what they're looking for in a future quarterback. I mean, I don't know, guys. I'm just trying to read the tea leaves here, and I'm just telling you what I see on tape. And I mean, I'm the guy who te- kept saying that Tyreek Stevenson was going to be good because I love the way he played the game, even though the results weren't there. I like to think I'm pretty forgiving when it comes to guys like Kyler Gordon, that if you go to Bears Twitter, people still hate him to this day. Or Gervon Dexter, who I think is a lot of fun, despite the fact that he is really struggling right now against the run. Or Darnell Mooney, who a lot of people went from, he's going to be a wide receiver one, to actually I hate him and I don't like him at all. Um, we, be, I still like him, personally. I think I've come around on Cole Komet in a big way. I used to call him a lightning rod. Now he's really good. But I feel like we're bringing a lot of the rest of the team down right now so that we can keep the fact that the quarterback that we like, he may have held back Braxton Jones, who took about three holding calls in particular because Fields didn't get rid of the ball beyond four seconds. Or Darnell Wright. Well, we like Darnell Wright. So it's more like Tevin Jenkins, who gave up this pressure and that pressure. Nate Davis just had a poor season, and the centers weren't good. But I thought that the line came up with enough passing plays to do pretty well. And if you go around the league and you start watching tape, you see a lot of collapsing pockets by not just the Bears' defensive line, but defensive lines all over the place. Quarterback is hard. These guys play a tough position. That's why they get paid $280 million. Let's watch some De- uh, DeAndre Swift. Ultimately, it's totally okay if you like Justin Fields. A- at this point, I personally am pretty frustrated. And I personally think that the Bears have... I, I would not be surprised if they've already made the decision. And I'm not saying that I know anything, because you don't. And I'll illustrate the point every time it comes up, because I think it's worth illustrating. And I think that there are so many that don't do a great job of illustrating it. And that's okay. I mean, if I thought that everybody did a great job of illustrating it, I I just really wouldn't stream. But that's just me. Rydori, thank you so much for subscribing. Let's get to DeAndre Swift. Man, look at AJ Brown. Stab off the line. 27 just gets it. Honestly, he looks like he thinks he's about to get mashed. He probably does think he's about to get mashed. And he does. <laughs> Derek, I think he's so easy to like. That's the other piece. I'm talking about feels the player, feels the person rules. Feels the person has endured so much. Feels the person feels like he's a protagonist. I mean, that play that he made against Detroit was legendary. The fourth down he had against San Francisco, unbelievable. Like, there are so many plays, especially with his feet, the fields have made that are just otherworldly. The play against the Eagles last year, like, the announcer sells the hell out of it, and it is so awesome. So many moments with fields I will never forget, including even the moment he was drafted. I'll never forget it. It was awesome. I never want to take any of that away because... I can't. I mean, it's a huge part of who Fields is. It's all the parts that we don't really remember because we blamed on something else that I guess I call attention to because when I went back to watch the game my third time, because you watch the game once, then you watch it again. I watch it again before I stream it. And then I watch it with you guys while I stream it. It just starts to feel really obvious, but that's just me. I mean, I don't blame anybody for either whether they watch the game once or whether they watch the game twice or even if you watch the game three times, you think something else. Like, that's totally fine. I may see football a little differently than you do. And that's totally fine. This is totally just my opinion. I'm not telling you it is. I'm not wagging a finger and saying, I don't know, you don't know ball or something. Have an opinion. I might be wrong. That's just what I see. Really haven't seen anything yet. I mean, so Swift looks natural in space, which is nice. I mean, as a receiver, we could see some short area stuff. Like, this is a nice little cut to build sort of a screen-like Texas route. Not to mention, I always like running backs where you can see wiggle in every step. And I mean, even just going slow motion and frame by frame here, you can see a nice foot frequency that sets him up to make little moves like that and dodge guys in space. Hey, that's solid, right? Yeah, I don't want to talk about a WFM. That's at least what I saw.
Why do I think the Eagles didn't retain Swift? Uh, I honestly, I think it's, I don't know. <laughs> one of the, one of the scouts I hung out with at the senior bowl, uh, was awesome. And one of the things that I picked up from him, he specifically, he was an older scout that had been in the game for a really long time. I think he's a cool dude, but moreover, when people would occasionally walk up to him and ask him about a player, if he didn't know anything about that player, he would just say, I don't know. I I haven't watched him, so I can't comment on him. I haven't watched him, so I can't comment on him. I haven't watched him, so I can't comment on him. I haven't watched him, so I can't comment on him. It was the only thing he'd say. It was very similar to Marshawn Lynch saying, I'm just here, so I won't get fined right? I'm just here so I won't get fined. I haven't watched him, so I can't comment on him. And I really want to pick that up. And it was in Swift's case, we are live watching him together. I haven't actually seen Swift, so I could give you some reason. I don't know. (laughs) We'll find out. Maybe I'll tell you in a week or two, once I've had time to like watch. It wouldn't surprise me if the Eagles just didn't, well, they did want to spend on a running back, but they feel like they want to go bigger. They want something out of Saquon. It could easily be that they felt like Swift was too much for a running back that couldn't pass protect, or it could be that they thought he was soft. Uh, I don't know. I've heard a lot of things, but not like about the player. I've just heard a lot of people give different takes on somebody like Swift, because this is what I know Swift to be, which is just pretty fast. The game is, uh, it's always kind of funny, at least to be, when a player's last name matches his best attribute. In this case, Swift is quick. (laughs) But it's foot frequency, at least to me, that looks like it might be an ad. I mean, I know one other thing that I can't help but look at is that I feel like the Bears running back room last year was a little bit of a letdown. Like, I think Roquan Smith, or I think Roshan Johnson has a lot more talent than he showed last year, but last year was not great tape, um, which is a bummer. But... I also can't help but think, I mean, Ben, like you're talking about, you mentioned that the Bears needed a receiving running back. Uh, Roshan Johnson got more targets than Darnell Mooney last year. So if you're going to throw to the running back, better to throw it a good one, right? Uh, or at least one that's good in space. And he seems like he's better, especially in receiving space, than the rest of the Bears running backs. Uh, it also feels as if the Bears got the market right on that. I mean, look, you don't have to love Swift, but Swift for $8 million is about Swift's value, which kudos for the guy that, uh, or kudos for Ryan Poles getting the market right before the market had fully developed, in my opinion. Let's see, uh, Jordan mentions that he seldom creates more than what's blocked for him. He's a product of two very good offensive lines that escorted him four to five yards down the field on most fights. That sounds an awful lot like, uh, oh my gosh, DeMarco Murray from an awful long time ago. See, so to me, Jordan, when we're talking about a back like that, what is kind of funny is that you could argue that that's exactly what happens on this play. I find a play like this really interesting to talk about, right? Where you've got a good block by 51, who's definitely going to get his. 65 is going to wash his man down. But um, let me see. It's, oh gosh, it's that's what you're here for, Donald, right? But so the at this point, Swift is basically all speed, just taking what's given to him. But as far as making a defender miss beyond that, that's just not what he's doing, nor is it, frankly, what we probably ought to expect from him. I mean, again, I've watched like one, at this point, we're watching maybe a couple, couple plays, but it'll be interesting to follow that because I don't think that there's anything especially wrong with a fast guy being fast and picking up explosives when the offensive line gets you something that you can work with. But I do think that to your point, Jordan, especially knowing you and the players that you like, it's a for it would be a force multiplier if he had that Kenneth Walker energy where sometimes he's able to, whether it's wiggle out of a tackle or beat somebody down the field, simply create more than what's there. But the fast take what you're given and get given a lot because you're fast thing it's a different mold. <laughs> hopefully it's one that works for the bear or hopefully it's one that the bears can get something out of because Waldron's definitely going to create as much space as possible that outside zone can create. And it's funny cause I've always heard vision concerns with Swift, but then I hear running back coaches say this and that about how it's not a vision issue. And I honestly could not tell you which way is up sometimes when it comes to that, because I haven't watched that tape, but I personally think that when you're talking about something like outside zone, if Swift can become somebody that makes decent decisions, then you can get a lot of space out of it because outside zone, for those who don't know, and you're not really going to try to run it from shotgun as much as you can, but you're basically going to push everybody in one direction 
Uh, so in this case, it would be everybody shifting that way. And when you do that, it gets the defense on the move. And when the defense is on the move, they have to communicate. And when you make the defense communicate, you get breakdowns. So then all of a sudden, there's like a gap right here where 50 kicked over too far and 90 got held up by this block right here. And so a really good running back can start that way and say, no, no, yes. And then just jolt up the field and pick up all kinds of space. God forbid he gets vertical. Um, and so here's Swift getting mugged in pass coverage. <laughs> hey, at least we got there. Needed to improve in the tackles because the Eagles love those tackles. Or, like, love those between the tackle runs. Are we splitting Swift out, Swift out or did we pull him off the field? Okay, split him out, made him the corner guy. Hurt's going to launch it. There you go. Offense. Good defense by Bulls and the boys. What time is it? Gosh, it's 1026. Let me see it. <laughs> time passes so fast in the stream zone. Let's see, Gainwell also took over a bunch for Swift on third down. That wouldn't surprise me at all. And that was so, those were some of the easiest prop bets of 2022's playoffs. It was obvious that they loved Gainwell, and they'd give you, like, over eight yards. And I was like, Gainwell getting five carries? Yes. Like, that's going to happen. And you just collect these tiny, tiny, tiny little overs. I thought it was just funny every time. Oh, sweet. Do we get to see? Yeah. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> I love, I love watching, Deon uh, gosh, I cannot believe I forgot Devontae Smith's name there for a second. And I always get into the stream zone and just forget stuff, but this, this cut is sick. Like, here we get a nice little head fake to sell the seam, just drop it back down. So much separation. Love that. When is Hurts throwing the ball? I'm just curious. I see he sees a break and throws it. So much is made, or a meal is made out of anticipation. Not every throw has to be anticipatory, which I always think is really funny. Um, let me see here. It is me, Andre Swift. Uh, let's see, Reaper. Oh man. So one thing I think is funny. Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a very a single play, one play, and I'm going to make a meal out of it but follow me because this is a football tangent that I think is relevant. JT, I love JT O'Sullivan. I have learned so much from JT O'Sullivan and the way that he teaches the game is something that I find really valuable because he does explain enough to where a, um, like a gremlin like me with no professional or collegiate football background can pick up on a lot of what he's saying. But in him drawing the letter A in all kinds of different colors and making everything about anticipation left and right, I do believe that we have become overly obsessed with anticipation. And this is actually a pro fields thing, right? Where there are all kinds of throws, whether it's a deep comebacker, just like this, where this one doesn't need you to be anticipatory once you see that the corner's in cover three and he's about to get baked, especially because if you do throw some of these things anticipatorily, some of them, like if Devontae drops his hips down and this corner is on it, you are throwing a pick. Like you, you, that is a pick if he has, if he has it read. So you making sure that he's separating, there's really no harm, no foul, because your receiver is coming out of that into open space, and it's going to go make a play exactly like this. You've seen it a billion times, right? Where all kinds of receivers will stop for the football, especially along the sidelines, because you need that, or because that kind of play can be, see it, throw it, and as long as you win with ball location, you'll win the rep anyways. What does an anticipatory throw really get you here? the opportunity to potentially turn up field and create some kind of yak moment, that's possible, right? But like you're saying, I mean, like you're saying, I can, it's like not every throw. And I'm really just harping on the idea of when you see an anticipatory curl, that's one thing. When you see an anticipatory dig, that's one thing. When you see an anticipatory slant, that's one thing, especially when you're fitting it into a window. But a deep comebacker along the sidelines, Devontae could have just kept coming. 
I mean, not obviously along the sidelines per se, but the moment that you get, or the moment that he's coming back for the football, it's just a matter of where Hertz wants to put it for how long he wants to sit on the read. But that's more me trying to point out that I, as I grow as an evaluator, I'm also trying to get used to this idea of it's not a demerit if every single throw isn't anticipatory, depending on what kind of throw it is right? Especially if you can prove to yourself that the quarterback knows why they're throwing it when they are, as opposed to that being potentially a natural timing issue. But I'm really not trying to make this more than it is. It's more saying that the moment that you've developed a single rubric for what makes a quarterback good, a lot of times you have unintentionally hard capped your ability to evaluate a quarterback and you've locked yourself into one archetype. Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers and uh, Lamar Jackson to use a silly example. Those are three completely different quarterbacks. Those are three completely different quarterbacks. But the, uh, that also means that you're going to see three completely different guys like Justin Herbert, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes. They're not the same either. People will tell you that Josh Allen's the same as Patrick Mahomes. They're not at all. And so as you get a feel for what is a good quarterback and what isn't a good quarterback, it does kind of feel like it's an art, not a science in many cases, because it's just so specific. (laughs) But that's my two cents. Third and five. What are we going to do? We're going to play off. Oh, here's that blitz. Good on you, Swift. This is a decent block. Boom. John, I feel like he makes, or I feel like Allen makes up for anticipate, or anticipation with conviction, right? Like he will throw it into extremely tight windows. Uh, and he's absolutely comfortable doing it, which kudos to him, right? It's so funny, Ben, because getting your head in there is absolutely like a sign of, hey, I'm working hard. It is kind of funny, though, right, that the moment you lean forward, you also expose yourself to over leveraging if that uh, pass rusher hits you with any some kind of a hesitation move. So it's two sets, right? Um, Two way street, I guess you could say. But hey, when it makes a good or when it generates a good block, we love it. Why wouldn't we? Ultimately, Bear Lissimo, I completely agree. I mean, generally, where if you get certain information based off your pre-snap read old, and it guides your decision into doing something, you execute that decision, especially if the decision, I mean, sometimes they're difficult, sometimes they're not. And if you read the defense correctly, it could be so easy with a clicker to go over this kind of thing and say, oh, well, he should have known that. Oh, he should have known that. Oh, he should have known that. And some of that changes offense to offense. It is wild to use a silly example, right? I've just seen this throughout the league. I can't explain it to you, but... Almost any tackle, almost any tackle will tell you that a tackle on a blitz has to take the inside guy. And for some reason, more than one team just doesn't teach their tackles to do that. And I could not tell you why, because I have not been in the offensive line room. Maybe you have. If you have, you go ahead and let me know why they do that, right? But I have seen too many tackles. Braxton was one of them, but I also saw, I think a Green Bay tackle did it at one point. The Detroit tackles definitely got caught doing it where they kicked to the outside of the or the, of the play and then allowed a free rusher on the inside for reasons I do not know. But my point in giving this example is to say that it's easy for us to say, well, it always got taught this way 20 years ago because that's the way that We get taught from guys who played in the league 20 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago or however long ago the information was. And then for some reason on the tape, we see it done completely differently and we end up uh, or we end up guessing at what they're being taught. We don't know. And we just have to make our best guess and go with the vibe you get. And it just means that tape evaluation, yes, even tape evaluation can be really person to person where somebody will tell you, I mean, let me use my favorite example, right? Sam Mustafer, anybody watching Bears tape over the last couple of years saw at least a player that lacked power and was a major problem on a lot of the Bears rushing plays, especially against stronger defensive tackles that could just annihilate him. And 
Olin Krutz stuck to his guns saying Sam Mustafer slaps and there's nothing or and Sam's not the problem. And everybody looked at Olin and said, what on earth are you talking about? It, I'm watching the game, Olin. How are you telling me that this guy's not a problem? He goes to Baltimore and plays really good football. And I haven't sat down and watched his Baltimore tape. I don't know if he like put on 15 pounds in between then and now, or if the gap scheme that they run was simply just what he was better at and that it was zone that's been eating his lunch the whole time. I would believe nearly anything. But Olin stuck to his eval that Sam could play, and Sam in Baltimore seemed to suggest that he was that Olin had a point. And we we ought to acknowledge that, right? Just because it's it's so funky the way that tape eval is always connected to the scheme that you're playing in, the players around you, the execution of the uh, frankly like the assignments that you're given that you need to execute, the difficulty of those assignments, and whether you're tailor made to execute those at a professional level i mean it's all a big old soup and we're here trying to guess what ingredients are in it and what kind of spices they're using and it's really hard and it's really uh it's really hard it's really finicky especially when we're not coaches right but we're just never gonna get <laughs> some of these answers we're left with what's on tape and some people's best guess especially because a lot of the people that do know won't go through stuff and a lot of the people that ought to know better in my opinion like, and that's more me talking about guys that I think drive engagement more than I think that they want to. I don't know. It depends on your take. Like somebody's going to say, oh, that guy's just going for engagement. And maybe he's not. I mean, there are plenty of things that I've been accused of where it's like, oh, Robert, you're just doing this for clicks. And I totally get it. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I just can't do that. So maybe Dan Orlovsky believes it. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you sometimes. I really couldn't because I do feel like sometimes things switch up, but that's not me trying to come after Dan Orlovsky. I mean, I think the guy kind of rules as a person, at least the vibe that I get from him. Not to mention, I thought him doing the uh, Pro Bowl skill showdown was awesome. Like uh, watching him throw that thing in a suit and tie and somehow net more than the other Pro Bowl quarterbacks was hilarious. I wish we saw more of that stuff. Like guys in the media that used to play ball, like playing a little more ball. I think it's fun. If there was some kind of media pickup game, you better believe I would watch it. But uh, all that to say that it's funky as we go through this stuff. And if you end up with a different opinion, that's totally cool. And I really don't want this to be a channel. And I don't want to be a person that ever gives you the impression that you can't agree with me or that you can't disagree with me. Feel free to disagree with me. I'll never pretend that I'm all right 100% of the time. I just believe in what I'm saying as much as I can anyways. Scheme differences. Uh, centers come in two sizes around 300 and 320. The latter are better for gap purposes. 100%, John. Was he that big? Kudos. I, I for some reason, thought he was like 295. Like the, him being Mustafer. There you go, 4P. It's just straight game tape. There's not a swift play on every play. Look, it's swift running a route. The Bears, I mean, they really didn't have anybody to do any of this. Like, they had some guys that turned to the flat, but, like, we're going to stem into the DB and break out? Okay. At least there's some modicum of technique. To me, that kind of thing generally is to displays field, feel as a receiver when you're a running back because a lot of these guys, they run a flat route and they run the world's most round flat route you've ever seen. Not to mention, Donald, I have absolutely no idea where or what we're arguing about in the chat right now. Oh, Hurts, what do you want to do? We're going to launch the ball. Oh, big play. Shoot, man. That's nice. What is this? Like, um, <clears throat> we're running a big dig and a post over the top of it with a dig on the backside. And we just decide, you know what? I can fit that thing into this spot. Ask AJ to get out there and get it. I don't even think that's AJ. No, it's not. It's the other one whose name I literally don't remember. Um, 
Whoosh. What are we do? Uh, let's see. We're arguing if we should count rushing for quarterbacks. I mean, I think you should. It all fits into EPA per play. Which EPA per play is not by any means some amazing, perfect, wow, incredible metric, especially because EPA per play isn't consistent. If you go look at the EPA per play for like three different sources, they'll all give you a different number because everybody's counting expected points above average differently, which is its own problem. I mean, like that should actually be a real red flag when a, <clears throat> when a um, statistic isn't replicable. And both John and Gooch, who my understanding is both of you have worked in statistics in some capacity, uh, like that that's that that's sort of a problem if you can't replicate a statistic and instead it's left into the eye of a, an algorithm that you can't see into. What's the use there? Which in plenty of cases, that'll lead you back to something like adjusted net yards per attempt, but they don't have an adjusted net yards per attempt that factors rushing properly or something. Um, and so it just gets messy, right? And Don, I I like yards per attempt, but I think it gets funky with this class of quarterback that we're seeing that doesn't attempt meant much. And maybe if we went with yards per play or something, like every time they touch the ball and that they do something meaningful with it, that then we charge that against them and we count it all, then I think you've got <clears throat> something interesting. Right. But let's see if we count rushing for fields, it kills a 0%. We are ranked top something in rushing mostly because of Justin. So that's the thing, Jay Sanders. I don't personally think much of the rushing element. Like when you're talking about my opinion, my problem is that I can't help but look at Kirk Cousins, who just tore his Achilles. We're going to keep playing this. Kirk Cousins just tore his Achilles and he ends up getting four years at, was it 40 or was it 45 million a year uh, over the next four years? Tore his Achilles. He's not going to have the pep in his step that he had, but he tore his Achilles and he's still considered very valuable because of the way that he throws the football. But on, in Justin's case, I tend to think that if you took Justin's rushing away, and by that I mean if Justin lost his rushing for any reason, you're not left with much. And now, like Donald's saying, it could just be that Kirk does voodoo magic, etc. But with, with Justin, whether it's late in a season where he's played all 17 games and he's just gotten beat up and he's got two bruises on his hip and he's got another bruise on his other knee and he's got bruises on his ribs, just like everybody else, just like every other quarterback, but he's running at the speed that he, yikes, hurts. And, and he's running at the speed that he ran at during the 2022 week 17 Detroit Lions game where he couldn't finish a big play downfield because he was hurt, twinged his hip and things fell apart from there. I think you get in trouble, personally. That's just me, though. I mean, I think that rushing is kind of a limited quantity, is basically what I'm getting at. Like, I see it as a non-renewable resource in, an, in its own way. And it can be really good, like, especially in single-game instances, it can be outstanding. The way that Fields has stretched defenses is, without a doubt, amazing. And it is amazing, right? I just see it as something that's hard to replicate. It's hard to really build something off of. Because... At any game or in any game for any particular play that goes wrong, you end up with a quarterback that takes the wrong hit and your game plan goes out the window. But that's just me, right? Again, we're talking about all kinds of different people's opinion and JT O'Sullivan to use another example. I mean, I've referenced JT a bunch as if he agrees with me all the time or as it's the other way around. It'd be as if I agree with him all the time. I disagree with him on quarterback rushing. I think that for every eight quarterback runs that go really well for somebody like Justin. You have two where a guy blows a block. Justin gets held up like he did against Minnesota and he takes a massive shot that should be a flag, but it's not a flag because for some reason, Justin doesn't get any flags. And now he's got to just wear that hit for the rest of the game. And I'm not a big fan, but that's my bent. And it doesn't have to be yours. Was it Vizo? It looked to me like a choice route, Dr. Truth. I'm not quite sure that, uh, I, I don't know why he and Hertz weren't on the same page, but that's where we'd apply the 40-40 rule, where we would say, why did they miscommunicate in week three of the season? It's early in the year. 
for sure. But you'd hope that your wide receiver choice, or you'd hope that your wide receiver choice routes, like, <laughs> or your running back choice routes and your quarterback are synced up. Especially when it looks like he ran the choice route. And then did they immediately after that pick? I think they did. They put Gainwell in for the next one. So that says that they definitely think that there's a, a person fault. <laughs> Hey now, Ravi. No need for that. Woo! We are chucking the ball. Man, we got, it's like 3 to 13. It's wild that we ended up seeing this as a playoff game, too. I think that's wild. Action. <clears throat> Man, where to get that ball out? Can't drive it far enough, partially because he doesn't have his lower half. Way to get the ball out at all. If only because we still haven't even started our throwing motion. Like we started here? Sheesh. I can't believe he got it out at all. <laughs> Man, Gucci, speaking of, that uh, 13 and 3 year, what, was it that one? No, it was the year after that where they did win the playoff game. That was when he, uh, that was when Kirk actually had a top five offense, right? That was insane. Like, that, it's wild to me that they don't win more. I mean, I would nearly believe that Kirk actually has, what do they call it? Uh, astigmatism, like the lights thing, uh, in some capacity. I would nearly believe it, but I'm also a crackpot that'll believe nearly anything. Um, only win is against the Saints when the Saints got cheated. Right. That was the uh the Kevin Rudolph or Kyle Rudolph play, right? I'll tell you, Gucci, I'm not about to stand for the NFL officials, but that's a call that I nearly see nobody call. I mean, it's definitely OPI. Right? Definitely OPI. <clears throat> but tight ends, for some reason, don't ever get called for that. If anything, I'm excited that Cole Komet has started to be become a blatant interferer because I think it's something that tight ends just need to do to be successful. Even when that does mean extending your hands. Okay, we go fast out. Again, like for me, Gucci, when I think screwed by the officials, I think officials screwing up a report, which I'm not about to say that the Lions don't have to own the fact that the NFL didn't or that the official didn't hear it. But that seems to me more screwy. Or when the Saints ultimately got screwed the next year after that by the Rams game, that was ridiculous. Like that kind of that kind of play is like, guys, what are we doing? But an offensive player pushing off harder than people want him to when tight ends in particular body or er, body DBs left, right and center and get away with it all three quarters. And we only care in the fourth. I get them not calling it and saying, we don't call that. That's not a penalty on our eyes, but that's just me telling you the game that I have personally seen. Yeah, it would have been Gucci. Ain't that the truth? There's a reason that you talk to DB coaches and they'll tell you, hold, hold, and then when you get flagged, hold some more, uh, or hold again. Swift is just a no-hesitation gunner, huh? With some feel as a receiver, but hey, we, li we love hurdling. That's sweet. But as far as the David Montgomery, I'm going to break tackles in the open field thing, seems like he's just going to try to blow by everybody and beat tackles or yeah, break tackles by 
basically erasing the tackle altogether. That's not a bad jump cut. Okay, DeAndre. Lateral burst ain't bad there. Do we have the third angle here? Yeah, here, at least when it comes to Swift, at least what I'm seeing, the real, you know, juice in his game is this moment right here. It's not, it's not this, right? It's not the breakdown. It's not hopping to the next one. It's burst to then get through Vita Vea and get out of the hole well before it closes and then scrape out some yards, flatten the edge a little bit, force, force multiple people to win for you. I mean, he is just speed. That's it. And it's funny, Gucci, because when, Gu when Herbert's on his uh, game, I think he's a pinball, but or in a good way. Like, I think Herbert has that, how on earth did you stay upright kind of piece to his game? But it sure seems like Swift is just a fast dude that can lower his shoulder. And like, this, this runs solid. Like, this runs nothing crazy, but there's a whole lot of Swift that seems like, Look, I, I really don't want to get into the vision thing. I'm not an expert and just haven't watched enough of Swift to really, really know. But Swift seems like when he decides he's going up the A-gap, he can lower his shoulder, put or put his head down, and go get those yards for you, or at least try, right? And when he sees an open lane, he's got the gas to burst through it, just like how when you give him a route to run, he, ha or he can be a route runner because routes obviously are run one way. But when you ask him to make decisions on the fly, I wouldn't be surprised if he makes them a little slower um, than some. There's no way that got in. That one did. I mean, Gucci, that's another thing, though. Like, I don't think football is as fun when we play the whole, well, we haven't seen him. How could they be bad kind of game just because it didn't have the fun of talking about it, whether you like the move or not. Like, half of most of football is played in the offseason. By played, I mean, like, experienced. That's a better word for it. Like, football has a shorter season than it does offseason. Hockey can't say that. The NBA can't say that. F1 can't say that. Uh, and baseball... I don't think baseball can say that, but like it's all that to say that as much as I know uh, what, what slow down, you don't want to watch this. In, what did you, did you miss something here? Here, let me show it to you again. What's what, what's going on? Are you, are you not, are you not seeing this? Are you not Ben? Are, are you having, are you even trouble or something? Like, are you not picking up everything that you need to see? You're fine. I'm kidding. <laughs> I did have it on fast forward. I watched it from the wide angle and went, okay. Man, he almost lose it there. I think, I think Swift is tougher than your brain wants to think he is, at least with the ball in his hands, and at least watching this game, right? Like, Swift has decent balance and can put his shoulder down. He's no Montgomery. Few people are, right? But he's got a little more juice in him than Plenty does. Ain't that the truth, Grant? Like, on a rep like that, at the very least, I see decent contact balance. Now, moments like this where he doesn't get a hole at all, he's not going to hum up because he's going to stop his momentum, and then what? Honestly, Dr. Truth, that's the other thing. Bayard, Eagles fans, uh, he played a lot of man, Nick, and you did miss the Bayard breakdown. It's a little earlier. Worse vision than Herbert. You know, it's it's funny, Eric, because you mentioned, wait, so worse vision than Herbert, but faster. And I would look at you and I'd be like, I can't get a read on how fast Herbert is. Herbert feels fast to me when we watch him play. I would say that I think Herbert doesn't have the jump 
that Swift does. I think Swift has more first step acceleration, but I do think both hit pretty decent top speeds. I mean, I can't, it's not like I have some kind of cool data or play to back that up. Swift seems like Donald, the best way I could put it is he tries as a blocker, but the Philly system might be better overall. Man, Ravi, did you see Bucky Irving's testing though? That was, that was tough. No, I like him, Nick. I really do. I think that if you watch a Bayard's Tennessee tape, you see a really, really good zone defender. Like, really good zone defender. Your Eagles fans don't, or fan, fan friends don't like him because they asked him to play a bunch of diamond man. But when you watch, uh, or when you watch, gosh, what was it? Uh, when you watch him in Tennessee, I think he's really solid. So this is by no means some massive epic Dubsky win, but I would like to point out, like, this is the NFL. Can we agree? I hope this point makes sense, right? Um, the Tampa is going to throw a five man or a five man blitz down the pipe on Philly right now. But sixty one or fifty one, your right guard Cam Jurgens here is going to get rocked one on one by number ninety two, and then Hall of Famer uh, Jason Kelsey is going to not properly pick up a stunt. And he's going to give up pressure up the middle too, right? And the main reason I'm talking about this is because I do think we can spend so much time saying our offensive line blows. Like, somebody get this guy a real offensive line. But, and that's one play. And I have not been paying that much attention on the offensive line. So, if you feel like that's the only play where things went wrong for them, maybe you feel like that's the only play where things went wrong for him. Here we go, DeAndre. What you gonna do with it? But it sure feels to me like when I watch other teams, I see plenty of offensive line breakdowns. Defense wins reps. It's a great way to put that. Also, this is this is what you're paying Swift for, but not how it meets the eye. Like the goal here, yeah, you get a, you get this hole, but Swift is up on it, and a little bit of juice is gonna get us through what could have been a tackle because we just get to that third level quickly. It's not that he did anything, per se. He just follows the block well, hits the hole really hard, and hits it with enough gas to where he breaks the tackle without needing to break a tackle. Now, on plays like this, this is the part of being a running back I have never understood, and I will never understand. Why, why wouldn't we just run that way, man? Like, are we trying to break him? so that we can try to run for a touchdown, I would understand that. And that's probably what's going on. But it's always funny when we see that. Because McGovern used to do the same thing. <laughs> and 4P, that's the, I mean, that's the other piece. Like, I'm by no means trying to tell you, oh, wow, the Eagles offensive line had one bad breakdown. That means the Bears offensive line is amazing. Or something like that. It's more that, I think the Bears got more or got and created more clean pockets than met the eye last year. I don't think they were 26th. I could have sworn they were like 21st in many cases. Or it, I know that the tackles in particular ended up scoring like 13th among what was it? Sports Info Solutions and PFF and ESPN's metrics all rolled up into one number. And so that's just your tackles. And the interior, I'm not surprised. They were really horrible. The Bears also had the worst center score in football, which simply, I mean, we can understand that, right? So the Bears offensive line could definitely use some upgrades. And I hopefully Ryan Bates and Nate Davis point or like Nate Davis round two can be that guy. Hopefully, right? It must be, Eric. I mean, that actually makes sense that getting caught from behind and or tripped is just drastically less comfortable than being the contact initiator. I was really happy with the interior or with the with the tackles, John. I don't know if he'll have the opportunity to Gucci. I mean, especially because Chase Claypool was actively selling.
Chase Claypool was so bad. Like, that's the other thing. It doesn't take a it doesn't take an especially amazing analyst to say Chase Claypool was playing badly. I mean, it just got out of hand, especially when it came to him in the blocking piece. It was like, okay, so we just aren't even trying, are we? And if we are trying, how, how is this you're trying? But it was wild watching just how badly that all fell out of hand. I still cannot believe that he didn't last four weeks in, in that uh, 2023 season. Crazy. I think Henry would have been better. I mean, the contracts are close, and that would take the load off of... Joe, they seem like they're trying to... Let's see, who is that at the end? Let me see. Oh, the tackler? 45, is that white? I think that's white. And again... It's not that, okay, so look. I don't want to oversell anything. I'm trying to be the most metered review possible in something like this. Trying to be. Um, At least what I'm seeing with DeAndre Swift is that DeAndre Swift here has a nice combination of plus receiving ability, plus burst, Plus speed. Plus, Ben actually took this one out of my mouth. Where? Like, where and tear. He's 25. He's been a part-time back his whole life. He is some or outside of last year where he was a lead back. He just doesn't have the carries. And because he doesn't have the carries, he doesn't have the hits that a lot of these other guys have. As far as minuses go. Uh, number one is that's it. I mean, maybe you could say effort is a blocker, but I don't think it's a plus or a minus, right? It's not that he can't block, and not to mention, there's plenty of cases where he definitely gets beat as a blocker. It's just not in this game. Either that or you could think the PFF sucks. I th- I use PFF as a nice second opinion for whatever I haven't seen, and they've got him listed as a poor blocker. It does feel as if his contact balance and or tackle break is like very okay, right? So meh, contact balance. I also, oh, but by the way, I will appreciate, like, puts his nose down. Don't know how to say that, but, like, he will lower his shoulder, and I'm okay with that, right? Uh, but so you get contact balance, you get mental mistakes. And... I don't know. That's it. Like, is it foreman level or serviceable? I think he's going to be okay. Like I I do demo. The funny part about this conversation is that I think it becomes the cool thing to hate on the running back. Sometimes Swift to me looks better. I I mean, at least when I'm seeing this, I like Justin Herbert Swift to me looks like he's going to play at Herbert's level. Maybe a little better. Um, Let's see. Doesn't Swift just take off. uh, Let me hang on the, does he or doesn't Swift take care of the ball? I remember he so few fumbles. Take a look, uh, Chicago. Check for me, right? Because I don't know, right? It's more to say that I look at Swift and I see somebody who is uh, more of a lead back than the Bears have had in a little while. The Bears tried to go bargain bin, and I do think they paid for it last year. Um, like you're saying, Joe, they definitely want to build through the draft. When I look at Swift, I see a runner that's going to do this, where somebody's going to argue he's not going to get more than his offensive line is going to create. What he's doing here is he's just creating space and bursting. And whatever that first burst gets him, that's all he's taking, right? Like, we are not getting caught by this guy right here. That is the positive, right? We have the gas to get a little further downfield and turn what is a three-yard run for a lot of backs into, what was it, a a first down, so I'm not going to know but I think it was like a six or seven yard run, but that's, that's it. I mean, there are going to be plays where I imagine Swift is going to do 
I don't know, that. And you're not really going to feel any difference between Swift and a lot of other backs. But when you get a hole, Swift is going to hit it harder than plenty of the other, like plenty of other backs. So they're def trading the, that's the thing for P. I'm not going to sit here and speculate too hard because I don't know. Like, I think I just hate the conversation while the quarterback thing isn't resolved. Like, cause that's the thing, Donald, I'm right there with you. Like if they are sticking with fields, then okay. I'll have to figure that out. If they aren't sticking with fields, then okay. Nice to know. But to be honest with you, uh, Donald, there are plenty of times where regardless of how convicted I may feel one way or another, people's confidence in like the keeping fields direction is honest to goodness, like earth shaking. I mean, the, the stoic, the, or the, the stoicism, I guess you could say, but like the assurance that a lot of people have that the bears are definitely sticking with fields and that they're definitely trading the first overall pick is it can feel like you're going up against a force of will in something like that. Um, but that's at least what I think. I'm really interested to see. Yeah. If, uh, John, I'm interested to see what happens with Barkley. Joe, I think that's interesting. And if they do get to that point, I'm curious as to how that happened, but I'm sure they'll, uh, hopefully they'll all be professionals about it. And 4 PM right there with you. I think I'm more talking about trading anything. Like I got distracted talking about the first round or the first overall pick again because Donald mentioned it and it matters. Like it is really core to the entire identity of the team and everything about what the Bears' future is just gonna look like. I mean, it's not life or death. It's just a massive, 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 massive decision because these things don't come around all the time. And last year, to be honest with you, if if you switched CJ Stroud and Bryce Young and CJ got drafted number one and had a sweet season in Carolina, I am curious as to whether people don't regret the current decision for the Bears to trade down. Right now, it's just really, really easy because Bryce Young is currently in a category with Jamarcus Russell and Tim Couch, and those are the three names in terms of first overall picks that have been this bad. And so it is really easy to see trading number one after last year as the obvious correct decision. And I don't blame a soul for that, right? I could tell you right now, McFact, that they're gonna. There are a lot of things that the Bears might do, and taking Marvin Harrison Jr. with the first overall pick is simply not going to happen. I mean, the Bears are much, much, much more likely to trade out of the top ten with number one, which I don't think will happen either, than they are to tra- take Marvin Harrison at number one. They'll trade down at least once or twice uh, before they take Marvin, if taking Marvin is the plan. Let's see. Gucci, the complicated part with this is that we just have no idea what people are and aren't offering and when they've offered it or haven't offered it for fields. There's so much of this that we don't know. This this digs into a category that we just can't see into at all, right? Love the Eagles lining up and running empty on in a game where they're winning by three scores. Two scores, I guess. Kudos to the Eagles and at least the way that they started the season. The wheels started to fall off, it seems like, as they basically kept running the same stuff and never really iterated. Who knows why? And Donald, it wouldn't be weird if that was the case. I don't think. So Gucci, I get that it was similar, but uh, that I think that it's easy to see similarities between the field situation and the Lamar situation. But it is worth remembering that the biggest difference. Uh, let's see. 
Oh, I got you, Joe. Uh, I thought you were addressing me in particular. Um, but so th- it's worth remembering, Gucci, that Lamar, if you did attempt to trade for Lamar or make an offer on Lamar, not only did you have to give up two first round picks if you won the deal, but the general consensus at the time, hey, if you agree with what's been reported, which I'm taking at face value because I think it makes sense is that the Ravens had basically told everybody in the league, yeah, go ahead and make an offer. Make an offer if you want. I'm going to match it, so you're going to waste your time making that offer. But make an offer if you'd like. Go for it. Go for it. And if not, we'll take your first two, or we'll take your two, two first overall picks. In Fields' case, it does not cost you two first-round picks to take Justin Fields. It costs whatever somebody pays the most for. Now, that doesn't mean it's that polls isn't over asking. Maybe polls is holding firm at a first. Maybe polls are holding firm at a second. Maybe polls is waiting for a third and hasn't gotten a third. I don't know. And I think the people who stand up and say, I know they don't, (laughs) but it cuts in both ways where the people who are saying, I know. And the people who are saying, I know neither knows. We don't know. So I think we're just going to have to wait and figure out what happens later. I get you that Fields is a 3-4-5, and I just wouldn't be surprised, at least right now, if Ryan Poles is trying to see if he can get more. I do think Ryan Poles has a set number and that nobody's come up to the number that he would have just sent him at. Or maybe he's holding on to him, who's to say. But I think, I guess I don't know. It depends on what the league's evaluation of Fields is. And in particular, Fields has always been a tough player to get a sense for what the league's executives think of him. We gave that right up. Gucci, why do you say that? At that point, I'm out of cur- or at that, at that point, I'm curious, right? Like, if he takes a fifth for Fields because he says that that was the best offer, and then he takes Caleb Williams, why does that make him an idiot? Because he think he got better offers. Hey, that's totally possible. If he got better offers and he turned him down and then he ends up with a fifth and you want to say he could have gotten more for Fields, I'm not going to blame you. Uh, I'll take whatever it was at at this point because I do think that the longer that this goes on, the more that I know I'm worried because destinations are just getting crossed off the board, right? Joe, that's the complicated part, right? Like, it's a matter of, are you of the belief that he would have been moved for X, Y offer yet? Or are you of the belief that they already got X, Y offer and then they didn't move him and now they're just bag holders on a bad stock? You might believe either, right? You totally might believe either. I'm not about to look at you guys and say, wow, Ryan Poles is, like, I think Ryan Poles is good sometimes. (laughs) I think about half the moves that Ryan Poles makes are really exciting. About half of the moves that Ryan Poles makes, I have to go, okay, I think I see what's going on here. (laughs) And that's at least where we've sat, right? Where it's like, yes, we got Tyreek Stevenson. Devon Dexter, there? Okay. Okay, you know what? I get it. I did like it. I did like Dexter. I did like Dexter. I liked Dexter. (laughs) Like, (laughs) at least that's what I usually have to do. (laughs) And hey, I'm not expecting a GM to bat 100% on all of his moves. I'm not. Sweat is a beast. And I can, to me, I will happily take a Claypool move for a uh, sweat move. Like, uh, to me, the sweat moves are harder to come by and they're worth the risk. I'm down for a risk. Would I take a two if the Vikings offered? Haplo, yeah, I would. Like, very quickly. I wouldn't have to think that hard about it. But you're also talking to somebody who went on a massive rant earlier about how Justin Fields just wouldn't scare me as a defensive coordinator, even with Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison. So, yeah, I'm okay. I'm comfortable with that, but that's just me. Now, the he feels sure might be able, I don't know, maybe he'd split a game next year, but especially from the long-term perspective, I think we'd get more value out of the second than we'd lose the fields being in the division. But that's, that's just me. If I didn't say yes to that, I wouldn't be consistent with my own opinion. And, and I'd be like lying to save face or something, right? That's just my two cents. But the, again, have your own opinion. Uh, let me see. Somebody mentioned. Let me see. 
also think about this best case scenario for fields is to get a second round pick. So if you traded a second rounder to move up in the draft, to get the next Patrick Mahomes, no complaints. I think, I think I'm following. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's the truth. Davis and Dexter, uh, Davis and Dexter or Pickens, uh, being starters. I think that would definitely help him. Uh, but let's see. Let's put the KC game on. How do I th- feel about Cleo Mack coming back? Miles, I, th- I mean, I think Mack's pretty doggone old. Now, that's by no means going to be like, uh, that. that's by no means meaning that he's bad. Every time I've turned on Mack's tape, I'm like, man, how does that guy still got it? How does that guy still got it? But I don't know. Did somebody mention earlier, uh, so, somebody, hang on, I have to, I have to sc- scroll up to see this, because it was John, uh, oh, Ben, Ben asked, Rob, don't you just want us to hold him for a year while Caleb sits and gets ready for a year? So, Ben mentioned something that I think is worth talking about one more time at the very least, and that's that one of the hardest parts to me about d- developing a quarterback is dealing with the fans. And I'm not, I hope I'm not talking about me, but I was one of the crazy, crazy people when Fields was originally playing that kept having Brandon Robinson on his podcast. And Brandon would say things like, you should sit Fields for a year. He's not going to be ready. And I didn't believe him. And when guys like Dan Orlovsky and when guys at all kinds of different quarterback outlets, et cetera, said things like, Justin's ready. He should be playing, especially as Andy Dalton was taking snaps and going through training camp and they were posting QB1, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I was one of the people who I think was thumping for Fields to play ASAP. And every time Fields made a sweet play in camp, I would post something like, oh, yeah, hell yeah. Like, they should play Justin Fields. And I was so, so amped up and I felt so strong and I felt so cool. And I felt so like, uh, I felt so uh, brave being willing to say they should play the rookie, like, et cetera, et cetera. And then the rookie came in and he had one net passing yard against the Cleveland Browns. And in the game that he subbed in for, uh, or for Dalton, when he went down, he played three quarters and had a net hundred yards. And I'm by no means trying to say that Justin Fields didn't get hosed by some bad game plans. Uh, it's, it's always, if you want to believe that Nagy did that on purpose, Gucci, I think that's far. I mean, Nagy wanted to keep his job. He ended up losing his job because they played so poorly. I believe he wanted to win games, but it sure felt to me like they intended to keep fields on the bench. And then the fan fervor got him off the bench. And it's funny because we look back and the same thing happened with Trubisky where the bears intended to start Glennon. And then they just didn't keep starting Glennon. I mean, he, he lasted four games at that point. And then Mitch took over and Mitch had a pretty ho-hum 2017 season throw seven touchdowns and seven interceptions. I think he had a 300 yard game, but if he did, it was just one. And it was the game against, uh, it was the game against Cincinnati, but all this to say that fan fervor, I personally believe makes it really hard to develop a quarterback when the quarterback that's playing isn't unimpeachable. I mean, that's, that's just my opinion, right? Jordan love can develop because Aaron Rodgers is a hall of famer and Desmond Ritter can't develop because Taylor Heineke isn't good enough, right? I mean that it's, it's just really tough to keep the rookie on the bench when the rookie is exciting enough to feel more worth watching than the veteran who's struggling. And I think my favorite example of that right now, to use a silly example, right, is Ryan Tannehill and Will Levis. Ryan Tannehill and Malik Willis are both right there. But the moment that the Tennessee season went bottoms up at all, in part because Tannehill wasn't playing well, but the whole Tennessee season was kind of uh, screwed from the start, right? The moment it got out of hand, they put in Levis, and they never looked back because he had one decent game early on. And then a whole bunch of stuff went this, that, and this way, that way, and the other. But it's more, at least to me, 
another example of you just can't keep these rookies from playing these days unless your quarterback is legit good. And if Fields was sitting in front, or if Fields was playing in front of Caleb, that would work so long as Fields kept winning. If the moment that the Bears, I don't know, lost the turnover battle off of two fumbles and then they got to a fourth quarter where they needed a touchdown and they didn't get their touchdown, you'd get all kinds of smug people online looking at Bartholomew Willa Jacks. I'm looking at, you guys know the names, right? And they would all go, Caleb would have done it. And they're wrong. I mean, he's a rookie in the NFL. I, I think Caleb could be fine next year, but people would just, what? People would just, say that uh people would just say that the rookie would do it because that's just how people are for uh, fans want to see the rookie they want to believe the kid that hasn't proven them wrong yet and i don't think it would be healthy for anybody hey maybe it would be best for caleb who's to say right justin herbert played almost immediately and that's the thing ben that's my point Ben said they'd say that with any other quarterback, not just Justin Fields. We were talking about if Justin was still on the roster. Ben, if Minshew was in front of Caleb, I plenty of people would say that too. If Tyson was playing in front of Caleb, plenty of people would say that too. If the Bears traded for anybody, probably but Geno, but even Geno, because it's Caleb Williams, people would say Caleb Williams should be playing this Geno trade was a waste, blah, 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 blah. All the stuff that you can imagine people saying. Because that's kind of my point, right? But it's, and that's the, the the other thing, Iken. You mentioned you've not heard of any prob- or quarterback where sitting was the problem as opposed to starting too soon. You're absolutely right. A lot of that is because the quarterbacks that start immediately and they end up fine, like Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, uh, even Tua. I, I think Tua started some, but uh, no, because he, he sat technically for a couple games is what a lot of people would say. Um, but so like the, the quarterbacks that started immediately, and then they're fine. Nobody says, well, it's a good thing we started them immediately. The quarterbacks that started immediately ended up bad, like Daniel Jones. Let's stick on Trubisky for a hot minute. Plenty of people are going to say this because we didn't develop him well. They're going to say it's because we played him too early. They're going to say this, that, the other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, it's always possible they just weren't very good, right? But we're never going to look at that the other way. So you mentioned uh, most teams just don't have the ability to spend a high first on a quarterback and not have him play for a year. That's a very luxurious thing to do, right? And, and even the Chiefs. I mean, they had Alex Smith. Alex Smith saw Patrick Mahomes get drafted and had the best season of his life. So you definitely weren't benching Alex Smith at that point. But if Alex Smith had played poorly, then... I have nearly no doubt Mahomes would have gotten into the game sooner. That just didn't happen, right? So you need a quarterback that can play inspired ball. Trading for Geno would be the way that you'd do this, in my opinion. And I'm not trying to get you guys all too Geno-pilled. It's more me pointing out that Geno has experience in the Waldron offense and can play at a top 15 level. And I personally believe that if you really wanted to go that direction, you could try to spend a Carolina or Chicago second from next year on Geno. Plus, if you trade it down, maybe an extra pick from this year, pull Gino in, sit him behind Caleb, and then people like John Delitalia, who is in this chat right now, and John, I say this with love, will call Pace an absolute stupid idiot for spending the number one on Caleb Williams and delaying Caleb Williams' rookie mistakes for an entire season. And then if Caleb comes in and shows any sign of being bad in 2025, everybody's going to point out that it could have been Marvin Harrison, it could have been this, it could have been three firsts, it could have been, it would it would just be awful. I mean, like, the media pressure cooker will be so, so hot. So, so hot. And by no means am I trying to say that there's a right answer here. I can tell you, in my opinion, y'all, the all 130 of you, did I say pace? Uh, like, the <laughs> polls. It, like, I can tell you that all 130 of you that are sitting with me at 1144 in the middle of free agency, like everybody's frustrated. Everybody wants the Bears to win. Everybody wants the Bears to have a good quarterback. I think everybody, whether you like Fields or not, wants the Bears to have a good quarterback. I personally believe that a lot, some, at the very least, of the field support comes from wanting the Bears to have a good quarterback. And simply not believing that Fields isn't a good quarterback 
in part because if Fields wasn't a good quarterback, then you have to start over. It's much easier if Fields just is a good quarterback. And I only know that feeling because I did it a lot. I did it with Cutler, who I do still like, but that's partially because I haven't tried to go back and look at the film. I did it with Trubisky uh, up until about week six of the 2019 season where I couldn't do it anymore. Like, it's, I, I personally think that the part where you let go of what you hoped that a young quarterback that your team drafted would be is outstandingly difficult. Like, by no means do I want to ever pretend that this is an easy thing or that I'm a big person for doing it. I, I'm somebody who's talking about sports. So don't ever let the gravity that I try to speak with because I like telling stories, I end up making you feel one way or another. You get it, I hope. Uh, the point is, is that this is just, it's just really messy. <laughs> the whole thing is messy. It would be so much easier if you could just trade down. It would be so much easier if the Bears just had a good quarterback. I think, personally, that the other decision is going to... D does anybody remember? Does anybody remember when Justin Fields originally got drafted? Does anybody remember how many Mitch believers there were that could not stand the fact that we had thrown Mitch out and turned the thing over to Justin Fields during that rookie season? A lot of people do not remember this anymore. Because most people didn't do that, right? But enough did. I had to deal with them, that's for sure. And I tend to think that th that group's going to triple for this next year. Like, I tend, I tend to think that if the Bears do go with a rookie quarterback, it could be Drake, it could be Caleb, it could be Bo Nix. I'm going to keep using those three for fun. Not because I like Bo. I'm trying to pick a big old wide swath of people, right? And I personally think that at this stage, if the Bears do go with Caleb, there's going to be a lot of the city that just will not want him. And it'll take three 300-yard games and three multi-touchdown games to turn some people, which we would all hope would happen. But he's a rookie quarterback. It's going to be a hard thing to do. Unless the Bears really stock the cupboard on offense, they're going to try to win with defense. That means low scores, and that means that means – incompletions on third down and that means people saying Justin Fields would have run with that and it's it's gonna be a time <laughs> but I also think plenty of I, I don't know we'll figure it out we'll figure it out together but let's watch a little more Absolutely, Jay Sanders. I don't think sitting is the magic cure. I think the Bears just draft bad quarterbacks. To be really, really front up with it. I mean, I think that if you actually turn the keys over to a young quarterback and you give him all offseason to be the starting quarterback, you don't make him compete in a fake competition then or, and make him earn a spot that he was always going to get, that you have a, I mean, as good a shot as any of potentially having a solid quarterback play as a rookie. I mean... Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud both had the ball turned over to them nearly immediately. One of them set rookie records. The other was really horrible. So it's both, right? I'm not going to tell you that I think that this is foolhardy. I did say that the Bears screwed Justin. I did. It wasn't because they played him too early, in my opinion. I mean, maybe Fields wasn't ready. You can feel like Fields wasn't ready, but it's not explicitly because they played him too early. It's because they tore down around Justin in his second year. They made the decision to go through a full-fledged rebuild. They got rid of nearly any weapon that the Bears' offensive organization had. They got rid of nearly any talent on the offensive line that they had. And then they asked Fields to play through it, and he, er, and he learned all kinds of rushing-related bad habits during that. You ask, why would I do that to Caleb? I wouldn't do that to Caleb. Caleb would end up with the team that Fields was supposed to ascend with, and he'd be a rookie during that. And then in his second year, you'd get even more talent around him. Like, it's, uh, let's see, if JF1 turns into a top 12 quarterback and Caleb top 10, will turning down all those picks be justified? No, but I don't think Caleb, or I don't think Justin Fields is going to turn into a top 20 quarterback within the next two years, personally. And I don't think he is right now either. But that's just me. I mean, it depends on also your definition of what is a top blank quarterback, right? Like, if you think a top blank quarterback is an excitement level thing, then just feels sick. 
and Justin Fields is easily already bordering on top 10. But if you go if you go near any efficiency metric, rushing included, it falls. And I know you said if, but I'm more just talking out loud. I mean, if that wasn't part of the evaluation, it wouldn't be. If Justin Fields was a top 12 quarterback or I thought he could be a top 12 quarterback, I would be campaigning to trade the pick. It's the best way I'd put that. And Derek actually mentioned something, another piece that I think matters, right? And I'm sorry, AC Adam. Uh, Derek mentioned that they decided they were going to sit fields and change their mind. And I think that that was another part of the problem. And that's just me, right? Like, Derek, I'm with you. I think if they turn the keys over to a rookie, better to turn them over as soon as possible. As soon as possible. But if they, if they aren't going to, if they aren't going to play him, you can't play him. Jay Sanders, why do you think he's a lame duck coach? Like, my my question is, if you think that he's a lame duck coach, then the Bears are, honestly, you should pick a new team. Because if if the Bears have a lame duck coach, then Justin Fields isn't keeping him either. But if you think he's bad enough to be a lame duck coach, and you keep Justin Fields, and you trade down, and you win some games, and then the Bears end up being a jobber for better teams, like the Packers, who beat them twice a year for the next three years, and we go, oh, no, no. Oh, we'll get him next time. And then we don't, uh, of course. Oh gosh, I haven't been on the NFL stream. You guys have just been watching me. Um, like you guys have just been watching me watch the tape. Um, because I forgot. Uh, let me see. If he doesn't make the playoffs, he's fired, and that's above polls his head. I don't think he has to make the playoffs if he gets a rookie. I think he's just gotta win seven games. Like, I think if he wins seven games, the rookie quarterback shows any promise, nearly all will be forgiven, let alone if they win eight. Uh, they might make the playoffs with eight, probably won't. But if they do win eight games, it's part of why I think the Bears are going to draft defense because I think they're going to draft a rookie and then I think they're going to try to win with defensive special teams. But that's just what I think uh, is going to happen because I think Eberflus will not feel like he can pass up on, not Eberflus, I think Poles will feel like he can't pass up on the opportunity that Caleb Williams presents. I think that a lot of people in this chat massively underrate just how talented Caleb Williams is and what that's going to mean in the eyes of a lot of evaluators. I don't think he's Johnny Menzel. I don't think Johnny Menzel's talent could hold a candle to Caleb Williams. And that's part of why Johnny Menzel wasn't drafted until 20. Was it like, when was Johnny Menzel drafted? Uh, let me see. He was the 22nd overall pick. So to compare Caleb Williams to the 22nd overall pick is a massive disservice, in my opinion, to just how highly rated I think Caleb Williams is. And at the very least, it seems like plenty of evaluators are relatively in line with that. That's just me. Um, let's see. It's the same thing Pace and Nagy tried. I mean, it is. The difference being that they tried it in their fourth year. He's trying it in his third. Not to mention the team's got upward trajectory at this point. Like, it's easy, I think, to make the argument that going from three to seven to seven with a rookie to potentially 10 is exactly how you'd get an extension. Not to mention they had all those deliberations of who their coach was going to be next year. They went with Eberflus, and in that process, I believe he got a soft extension. But that's just me. In fact, I think that it's easy to say Justin never got an OC with a brain, but that OC just got hired by the Raiders. Now they're giving him Garner Minshew, so who cares? Maybe they don't care, or maybe that doesn't matter. But he did get a job. He didn't just immediately fall out of the league or fall back to a position coaching position. So we're going to just see what the NFL thinks about all this. I think Getsy left a lot of meat on the bone. It's not some massive Getsy stand moment. And it is the Raiders, BG. You're absolutely right. Jay Sanders, I got to tell you, the moment that you start playing, uh, the moment you start playing the hits again and you go, I can see why nobody wants uh, to play in Chicago because Chicago ruins all their quarterbacks. It, there's a lot of transitive property argument stuff I could make about, okay, so you think Justin Fields is ruined then? And you'd say, well, no, I don't think Justin Fields is ruined then. Or maybe you would. Maybe you think Justin Fields is ruined. And then at that point, you need a veteran quarterback. And then you should trade down and you should have potentially considered Kirk Cousins or Gardner Minshew or trading for another quarterback or any plethora of other options that don't involve a rookie because now a rookie quarterback is just never going to work in Chicago according to that definition because they've never worked in Chicago. And I mean, I 
can't help but think the moment that you get to that point that the Bears are simply never going to win and you should pick a different team uh, if you like winning. If it's a, if following the Bears is something that you do for fun and it doesn't matter if they win, like, I don't know. I, I think that personally Justin's done developing. I don't think any quarterback develops after the third year without a serious reset. And I don't think that the Bears are going to give Justin a serious reset um, if they keep him because I think you need to wear a New Jersey to do it. I mean, we have we have yet to see a quarterback ever rehab the or rehab the or rehab their image while still on the same team. Can you think of one? I mean, I I personally can't. Right? It gener- they generally have to see Alex Smith go to San Francisco or Baker Mayfield change jerseys. Geno Smith change jerseys, man. Geno Smith isn't the he's not on the Jets anymore. That's the point. <laughs> like they they change places. And Jared Goff changed places. I mean, plenty of people put their head or like get their heads set when they change places, but doing it with the same jersey that you struggled in, I have yet to see it. Tua, that's a good question. Honestly, 4P. Did Tua have long enough to be declared really bad or did we just jump on him after a bad two years and then he popped in his third like a lot of different quarterbacks that we've seen? Just not hit the Josh Allen thing. Terry Bradshaw is a long time ago. Good point. A lot of people, Derek, wanted to jump on Tua and declare him as bad. So that did happen. Okay. Line him up in two two RB formations. Yeah, sheesh. Those that Raiders defensive line got good. People jump on people all the time, BG. Good point. I don't think so, Jay Sanders, because by the by Tua's third year, he had thrown for 4,000 yards. I mean, by Tua's third year, he was lighting the league up before he got concussed. Justin's played nearly 40 games. I, I don't know. I don't know what to say other than we are wanting something to happen. We are wanting it to happen so badly that we are hoping that Justin is a historical outlier. That has not happened yet. Maybe it will happen. But I think it's really unlikely. And somehow this conversation always comes back here. And it has to. Because we keep having people tell me that Fields is a quarterback that he isn't. Or that he's going to develop and he's going to become a quarterback that he isn't. And I I love and respect the passion. Because I am passionate enough to do this every week. Like, I can't do this without people... Exactly like you. I just don't get where the I think Fields is great comes from, Gucci. What has Fields done to say that he's great? At least when I watch Justin Fields, I see an extraordinarily mediocre quarterback propped up by explosive plays. All the plays that aren't explosive are major dice rolls. But did he did he really? 3,500 yards? Did he play all 13 games? Or did he play all 16, 17 games? But I don't know. JC, I love you, man. I think you're great. And Fields is a badass. As far as a person goes, Fields is awesome. And see, I don't know if I will. I really don't. I really don't. But that's just me. And is it really half blown? Now you got me curious. Tua hasn't thrown for 4,000 yards. I mean, I would have assumed that with Tyreek Hill pushing. Okay, okay. So he did this year. <laughs> but only this year. I get what you mean. He went. Okay, so he threw for 3,500 yards in 13 games, which. By no means does that mean you have to go, oh, or something like that. But that's a 272 yards per game average, which yards, whatever. Like, I sometimes I feel like such a stats dork. It's more like a threshold thing where it's like, okay, well, if we scale that for 17 games, you're going to score a lot, right? Of course they do, McFact. Of course the Bears locker room disagrees with me. 
the the locker room of a football team likes their quarterback. Wow, unbelievable, right? The locker room of the of the Bears team with Trubisky like Trubisky. I mean, it, it's totally normal. Don't you think that's totally normal? Ryan Poles explicitly stated, yeah, the locker room likes it, or the locker room thinks pretty short term. I have to think long term is, is his direct quote. And we think that, that that exact phrase is him saying the locker room matters more than my, I do. The NFL players disagree with me. The, they rated Justin top 100, 100% Jay Sanders. They also rated Andy Dalton. Uh, the 47th best player in 2015, and they rated Jalen Hurts better than Patrick Mahomes last year. Do you think Jalen Hurts was better than Patrick Mahomes this year? The NFL Top 100 list is notoriously poor. <laughs> At the very least, it's notoriously unreliable as far as picking out the best players. It's a popularity contest, especially when Justin Fields had the psychotic highlights that he did. I'm just not shocked. I, I wish he built off of it. I don't think he built off of it. Man, I wish I saw more from Swift in this. I really do. Like, am I allowed to say that? Part of the reason we end up getting distracted is because the Eagles are playing Swift in like a reserve role. We're like, Gainwell's playing half these games. I even tried to find games with relatively high Swift snap counts. And he's definitely playing snaps. And I think the ability is there. But I think I expected more involvement from the like primary running back. And we're seeing what we're seeing, but I'm at the very least not catching much from Swift that we haven't already seen in many ways. Which is fine. Just makes me wonder if we've seen what Swift has to offer. And now it's going to be a matter of trying to find stuff from him in outside zone, etc. They didn't, they didn't use Swift at all, like the coaching staff didn't like using him. I wonder if that's a thing. He did run 1,000 yards, somehow. <laughs> ben. And we're down. <laughs> pop, 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 pop down. Derek, it does kind of feel that way. Let's see. And Chicago or, and Chicago Fanatic, I'm there with you, where it's like, is he really absent? He's not supposed to be, at least as I understand it. But this is that matter of like, one, one of the hardest parts, I think, by the way, uh, and Chicago Fanatic, this is just how I operate. You tell me if you'd like me to do something else, right? Um, but part of the reason I try to go through full games top to bottom, instead of just making a cut-up, besides the fact that I don't have the time uh, to make some of these cut-ups, is because I would rather you watch me scan through a whole bunch of plays where Swift doesn't do anything, than basically check out a curated reel that gives you an opinion of somebody that Swift is not. Right? Like, hey, this is a solid little play. Look at this. We we see a little swing. Uh, uh, we On this swing pass, we get a little bit of a spin move. We get a nice plant and cut up field. Okay. Okay. Like you see the little action. You see him popping in and doing something in a reserve role and getting up field and making a play. But you've also seen all kinds of, um, you've also seen a whole bunch of plays where he didn't do anything. Not, not all his fault or something, but it's just feeling out the feel of his impact on a game even if we're just scanning through it quickly, which I like to think it matters. It's why I do it. But you tell me what you want.
Nice run towards the TD in the first drive. Exactly. For P, you don't have to feel like you'll be a Swifty, but I appreciate that you're going to base it on his film. Like, no, seriously, I'm with you, Chicago, where it's like, it doesn't help anything that the Eagles run a very pass centric offense and they're just, er, and they're, you know, not running the ball that much. Let's see. All right, I have to pull some Green Bay tape, so give me a second. I can't believe I'm going to do this, but you know what? Why not? We can watch some Jonathan Owens. I'm interested to see the third safety at the very least. Just because, I mean, hey, we're adding an extra safety. What's not to like? Let's go with this tape. We'll pull it down. I'll get it downloaded. It'll take me a second, though, so we'll get some time. <sighs> I am, I don't know. I'm a pretty independent streamer, I guess, if that's what you want to call it. Like an extra, let's see, what backup do I think we can get for Caleb in this scheme since most have already been signed? I don't know. I mean, I could tell you, Chicago, that I'm higher on Bajent than some. Some people have worked so hard to push Bajent down that I think that they've underrated him, especially since he's going to be in his second season. So what he did as a rookie, at the very least, I think is something to be mentioned. And so who is he going to become? The league's going to get some tape on him. Uh, and I understand that that's going to mean that the defenses are going to play him a little bit differently. But if he ends up being pretty, or if he ends up being somebody that the Bears want to stick with, okay, that, that works. I'll tell you, Jay Sanders, I wanted to like Jimmy G. After this, or during this last year, I watched Raiders games because I was like, hell yeah, I want to see Jimmy G. Like, I, I get really hooked on watching backup quarterbacks, which is its own sickness. But the Jimmy G I saw was bad. <laughs> and I'm with you, Ben, that it would be really nice to have a vet in the quarterback room. And apparently, the Bears' plan recently has seemed to be to, to play Peterman. <laughs> Or not play, but to keep Peterman in the practice squad. And I have no idea how good a coach on the field good old Nate Peterman is. But you know what? If that's the direction that the Bears want to go and they feel comfortable with that, I'm going to roll my eyes and laugh. But at the end of the day, Tyson Bage really doesn't bother me as a backup. It really doesn't. It's just a matter of how would he mesh with nearly any rookie situation. And I will tell you another thing while we're talking. About, I mean, I'm just not going to obsess over this, at least I'm not going to try because like somebody mentioned, this thing does get really repetitive, but I will put really simply that I think some people are making being anti-Caleb an identity in a way that is incredibly weird. I didn't, you obviously didn't see, you saw pushback against Lawrence being QB1, but it didn't look like this. And you saw no real pushback against Burrow being QB1. And all kinds of people are going to rise up and they're going to say things like, oh, well, that's because they were better. But they're not. Like, if you ask the overwhelming majority of scouts, they'll tell you that Caleb Williams is either at or above their level. And if he's below, he's just below. And hey, that's my two cents. And I don't really care what a lot of people on Twitter and what select people in the chat have to say about that because that's what I think you see on the film. And I don't personally think that anything that Caleb said in an interview situation bothers me. I don't have a look at his medicals. Maybe for all I know, he's got some kind of spinal fusion issue that's going to be a massive problem and the Bears can't draft him. That's totally possible. But all kinds of people are claiming that he's a bust. But CJ Stroud's film looked measurably worse than what we've seen from Caleb uh, and all kinds of situations. Iowa screwed Stroud up through for a ton of yards because his receivers were amazing. They have been amazing. Dude is throwing to Marvin Harrison. Plays one game against Georgia where he looks absolutely out of his mind. Shocker, that's the Stroud we get in the NFL. Quarterbacks, quarterback stuff is hard, especially reading out quarterbacks. 
but I do think if the Bears draft Caleb, there are gonna be a lot of people deleting a lot of tweets. Either that or there just could be a lot of people straight up hating because it sure feels like there are a lot of people that have rallied really hard to hate this kid before he's ever done anything in defense of a quarterback that has done nothing nearly but survive through Bears situations without really thriving and instead becoming a magnet for all kinds of excuses. And I don't really think it's, I mean, I do think that a lot of people are hating Caleb on behalf of Fields, even though obviously Fields isn't asking anybody to do that. But I don't know. I just think the whole behavior is pretty strange. If you ask me, if you're watching Caleb's tape and you really can't stand him that much, I mean, looking like a rookie, I get that. Looking like somebody who could easily bust in the NFL, if you don't think he, he might, then you're not watching NFL to college to or like college to NFL tape. They're different football games. I, I heard that said the other day. I loved that statement that what you do in the NFL to play the game is completely different than what gets you drafted in college. In college, you have to go be a playmaker. You shouldn't take that hitch route because why do you care about that hitch route? That hitch route not only isn't going to win you games, but it's not the big sexy throw that gets you a Heisman and the Heisman does help you get drafted. Look at Jaden Daniels' draft stock, right? He did not get to where he got because he took the hitch. Same with J.J. McCarthy. Why is Jordan Silvera so excited about J.J. McCarthy? Because he layers ripper throws over the middle. And yeah, it sure helps that he wins a national championship off the back of Blake Corum and a Michigan offense that won't stop running the ball. But a lot of the throws he makes over the middle, the rippers, some of them with touch, but not as many. It's mostly just a fastball over the middle, are so sweet that they get people excited. and They go, he could do that in the NFL. But there's a translation. We knew that. I mean... The things that Caleb can do are out of out of this world. A lot of guys just flat cannot do them. But there are a whole bunch of Bears fans that just don't want him. And that's fine. That's fine. Maybe he won't end up in Chicago. But I, I personally think it'd be a massive mistake to pass on him. And I wouldn't be surprised if Poles knows that. And if Poles doesn't pass on him, I'm curious to see what happens and what the cope looks like afterwards. Because I actually think it will be pretty funny. And I think a lot of people will have kind of walked themselves into it. But... We'll see that when we get there. Let's watch just a little bit of Jonathan Owens and we'll call it an evening. Let's go here. I have to remember Jonathan Owens' number. What is he, 34? Yeah, he's going to be 34. Does he even play? I hope he plays. Let's see here. Jonathan Owens' stats. Let's see, this is, oh cool, I picked a game where he's not playing, let me pull another one down. Let's go week 12. Here, tape while we wait. is I'm really curious to see what kind of player he is I do think Simone gets really exciting or gets I think Simone is kind of fun I mean look I can't speak for anybody that uh or I can't speak for anybody that isn't in a situation like mine but I thought the Taylor Swift thing was a lot of fun I, I really did like the my wife I remember in week three in particular uh, at one point I walk out of like watching the Bears game on a Monday and she says, ah, can you turn on the Monday night football game for me, honey? And I was like, what? And she goes, yeah, Taylor's in New York uh, against the Jets. So I got to watch her. <laughs> I don't know Chicago. I have no idea, but it's more to say that I was blown away at how 
how much Taylor Swift engaged random people like my wife who doesn't watch the Bears with me. And can you even blame her for that? Like the Bears have been so rough for so long that my my own wife totally just leaves me to deal with it by myself. Like, and so I could tell you just how much Taylor Swift engaged all kinds of people that simply did not watch football. And now they do. And I personally think that Simone Biles won't be exactly the same, but Simone is somebody who was in that same category where she could tell you who Jonathan Owens was and that he was a Packer. And now Simone is connected with one of the biggest fan bases that we think is on the up. Like, I I think it's awesome. Like, it should be fun. And as much as I know it's a goofy story of all kinds, I, I personally think that it's a fun one. Why not have fun with it, right? Simone in Chicago might be different. I can tell you, 4P, that when you're around it, you get it. Like, you may if you're not in circles that get it, you won't get it. But if you're in circles that get it, I can tell you that nearly every woman I know, nearly, is really checked in with Taylor Swift for some reason. Like, couldn't tell you. Other than it's it's just what I see. <laughs> okay. Let's for attacking downhill. <laughs> Is that your thing, Chicago fanatic? Ain't that the truth, Ben? He seems like he's flying. Okay, okay. A little bit of reading and reacting to the inside receiver. A little bit of little bit of over route over the middle. Owens stepping in front. Taking a look. Yeah, he's 34. He's safety 4P. He's 34 right here. (coughs) Man, everybody loves talking about that Miller-Moss game. That Miller-Moss game is not well played. The receivers are dogs in that game. And I don't know why the freshman receivers weren't getting more minutes, but Miller left all kinds of balls underthrown, left, right, and center. I don't think he threw with much anticipation either. Louisville just gave up the ghost, but that's just my read on it. I was amazed when I finally watched that game and how this is what people are clowning about. You didn't watch it. You didn't watch the football game. If you watched the football game, you wouldn't be crowing about this. It's a nice performance of just chucking the rock and like, your receivers coming down with all kinds of plays, but kudos to them for doing it. I mean, hey, those receivers are are playing ball too. And it sure felt as if the youth movement totally worked and that they got a lot more out of that. But I mean, you didn't see Malik Washington pop off. You saw him play a little, but the other guys, that's just me too, in my two cents. What wide receiver are we going to sign? I don't know. Probably, I think they're going to do like Curtis Samuel or something like that. Uh, Right now we're watching Jonathan Owens the point (coughs) where are we on okay looks like he's up on the line we are already not elijah hicks at least what I'm seeing right now so far from Owens. We, we aren't Elijah Hicks. Good start. And 4P, I wish we could get a Kalen Bullock, but it doesn't seem like it. Yeah, no kidding, right, Iken? Would have been amazing.
I'm embarrassed. To be honest with you guys, like I'm watching this guy. Here he is sticking his nose in the run fit. 34 up on the line. Like, okay, so we've got our head in a swivel. Now we're going to take on a little bit of traffic. We're going to roll through. We're going to stick it to David Montgomery. I, I'm embarrassed that I'm really, I'm really appreciating this so far. Maybe we're a little bit late to this, but like, we also just get beat and the DB doesn't make a play, but heck, what do I know? Yeah, ain't that the truth, Iken? Like, the funnest part about the 2023 season really was, like, the... Let me see. The the, the funnest part about the 2023 season was watching Andrew Billings. It was so great. <laughs> he might have been. That's totally possible. So, I couldn't tell you whether Xavier McKinney is overpaid or not because everybody that I've talked to that likes the Giants thinks that Xavier McKinney is sick. Um, so... Did he get overpaid at $17.5 million? Oh, it depends on what we see from him. He could be really dangerous. But I struggle to be the guy who really likes safety play and then immediately telling people, wow, what an overpay. But yeah, if he's not playing well or if the D line doesn't come alive, then that investment definitely may not work out. The Packers seem intent on... They seem absolutely certain that their offense is going to be young, good, and cheap. Right? And I can't tell you whether it is or isn't going to be because, but it sure was young, good and cheap last year, which kind of frees him up some money to spend on defense, but we'll see. What just happened? Are they going to count it? <coughs> Did they call this a fumble? Do we just play through the whistle? I can, you'll tell me, or you tell me, because I sure don't know. It looks like it was called a fumble, Zach. Oh my gosh, this is Thanksgiving. I remember this now. This game was <laughs> this game was bonkers. I remember watching the Packers just absolutely dominate the the Lions here. Yeah, the blowout, blowout. This did hurt to watch, Ben. Third and five. Where are we, Jonathan? There we go. Oh my gosh. The blowout became the ultra blowout. Sheesh.
I mean, this got all of us thinking the Lions were frauds. Between this and the uh, the pair of Bears games. Like, the Lions looked really, really bad against opponents like this for weeks. I hate that guy too, Jay Sanders. He's so good. I can, that's just not, so personally, that's not what I've seen, right? But I'm interested, are you looking to, it seems like Owens is playing either because of injuries or because another safety was bad. I would have to look at this. From just looking at his snap count, Zach, it seems like Jonathan Owens got the starting job for some reason around week three, week four, and never gave it back. So I couldn't tell you. Was he replacing somebody that sucked? Possible. Was he replacing somebody that was injured? I don't know. But it sure seems that way. I can, I'm curious as to what you're looking to switch tackle sides for. I really am. Just because I don't know. Right? <laughs> like, are you looking to switch Braxton's side? Or are you looking to switch Darnell's side? Because I personally don't think it's a big difference now. Like, at least one of the things that I can't help but look for, and it's funny because it defies common logic, right? Rashawn Gary, is this Gary? 95? Because I can never remember his number. Let's see. Rashawn Gary is 52. What was I thinking? For reasons that I don't totally understand, oh, for Fawaga and potentially having him switch. So I personally think that if you were drafting a Fawaga type and you were going to have him switch sides, like you could do it, but why? <laughs> like why bother? Why not just draft an Olu or somebody on the left side if you've got similar grades? Now, I personally think that it's sort of a waste of resources. I mean, I understand all kinds of people want to upgrade on the offensive line. I would, I don't think I mean this literally, but I would seriously consider drafting JPJ at nine if you forced me and I was trying to quickly upgrade the Bears offensive line over a tackle. Because while Braxton can definitely get better, um, Oh, that's not uh, that's not the way I see you're meaning that, Robbie. You mean he can get better from where he is now. I personally think that the I think that the biggest detractor in Braxton Jones's game is draft position. I think the thing most commonly held against Braxton Jones is simply the fact that he was not a top 10 picked tackle and he plays like that and that's okay. Even if he did though. I mean, there are top 10 picked tackles that have worse rookie and sophomore seasons than Braxton Jones did. They just weren't fifth rounders. And so people can't say that they are going to be elite, despite the fact that they're playing pretty well. Like Braxton's a fifth rounder. Therefore, every time he gives up a sack, he looks like somebody that's just bad. Right. But that's what happens when you get beat. Yeah. A solid right to Ben. Like we get off the sun. God make a nice little hit. I now I would rather trade down pretty heftily. If I got to choose, I'd rather trade down pretty far and take JPJ if I was locked in on him, right? But that's my two cents. Like, and that's the other thing, Chicago uh, fanatic. I personally think that it would be really easy to, uh, or it. The way I would put this is, I think Braxton Jones has earned twenty twenty four. I think it is hard for you to make the argument to me that Braxton Jones played badly enough in 2023 that you have to replace him in a rookie with a rookie in 2024. Now, is he going to be the guy in 2025? Let's find out in 2024. But I do think that with him going into his third season, you can at least let this play out and see what you've got in your third year. And I can, I'll tell you the funny part is, is that if I've learned anything, so look, I'm boys with Brad Spielberger, uh, PFF Brad. One of the things that he mentioned at one point that I started paying attention to, and it is absolutely wild watching how true this is, is that the NFL cares a lot more about draft position than meets the eye. Like I can, you mentioned you would just trade Braxton. I bet you could get a third round pick. Maybe. Actually, I don't know about that. You might uh, only get a fourth or a fifth round pick for Braxton. Why? Because he was a fifth rounder. Like, until Lane Johnson 
became a multi-million dollar tackle. All he is is a sixth rounder that's very good because same thing with Darnell Mooney. He ends up, or the, he mostly got drafted for what? Like, um, and I mean, it's funny because draft Dr. Phil does, I mean, he does, he works hard. There's no doubt that he works hard. He watches the tape and we can all appreciate that. I, he's always hated on left tackles that are imperfect. <laughs> he did this with Charles Leno. He's going to do it with uh, Braxton Jones. I personally see Braxton as somebody who's limited, but he works well within that limited frame. And he's way too much value, right? But I know that there are going to be people that are going to want more of a Darnell Wright on that left side. And I just don't know what the value is going to be. I mean, I really don't. Right. Uh, because if Joe Alt comes to left tackle, like you mentioned, a rookie tackle in the long run would be cheaper. Depends on how long the run you're talking about. But you mentioned he's not a solid left tackle. He can't pancake rushers. Big fact, that is not the standard. The standard in the NFL is can you keep the rusher off your quarterback for two and a half seconds? Maybe three seconds. Cody, I thought Lane was a sixth round pick, but maybe I'm wrong. Let me see here. He was picked fourth. So there goes something that I've been saying for a long time. Whoops. <laughs> Man, if Mc uh, thank you, Cohen or Cody Owen. <coughs> that reminds me of how for years I told people that uh, LeBron James had a Defensive Player of the Year award, uh, and I was flat wrong, and that never happened. Uh, but. <laughs> It didn't stop me from thinking I'd won a lot of arguments for a long time by telling people, what are you talking about? He has a defensive player of the year. What do you mean he doesn't have, he doesn't play defense? Uh, and so it's, it's so fun. I think it's funny where when every once in a while in sports, you have a memory that you really pushed in there. Uh, in fact, do you want, you want to do that? Pick a game. Let's, let's go with any, anything other than the Browns. You know what? Let's go with, uh, here, hang with me. I'll give you a spider chart or something to look at. Let's go with uh, Josh Sweat, mock draftable. And I got to go to bed after this, but we can do this for a little bit. Let's go with... Bears film 2023. Let's go with, I guess I can't remember who they played. We could go with, uh, I could pick the Lions, but a lot of people would say that picking the Lions is cheating because they don't have a rusher off the left-hand side. So let's go with, that's 14. It's the Lions. Um, let's go with Cleveland. I don't want to do Cleveland. Miles Garrett's not fair. Made mincemeat of the guy after that. Arizona feels like cheating. They're just not very good. Atlanta? Does Atlanta count? Do we want to do Vikings? Vikings might. Vikings works. Let's see. Because we can't possibly do Tampa. See Detroit. It's twelve. That's it. It's looking for this. It's a minute long, so that's obviously not what I'm looking for. There it is. Vikings have Hunter and a whole bunch of blitzers. So it's kind of its own thing. Quick screen. We're just watching Braxton, so we're going to flick through this pretty good. This is really the camera angle we care about. I mean, there's no doubt that Braxton plays high. To all kinds of people who are going to look at offensive line technique, Braxton is kind of all over the place. He's not all over the place with the technique. He just He's a tall man that plays even taller. Like, he's huge, but it's hard to stand up that straight that consistently. And be successful in the NFL, especially as a power player. But he's got quick feet, and he's able to stay with all kinds of edge rushers. 
see third and one. Did they just run this thing? Wouldn't surprise me. We're going to drop back. And look at that. It's a first down. Braxton actually gets mossed pretty bad here. We go spin move. And we're giving ground. We're giving ground. We're giving ground. But third and one. We're living. He's not even the worst pressure on a play like that. Who's that, Hunter? Yeah, I think it is Hunter. Hunter puts a spin move on Braxton, and it takes too long. That's the job of the left tackle. Just make him take a while. Quick out. <coughs> Set the edge in the run game. Doesn't matter. I couldn't tell you I can, but... Anything that gives the Bears two extra wins next year? Sure. Go for it, Minnie. Play action. So, McFack, do you think that it's the job of the tackle to never get pushed back ever? Because if that's your if that's the idea then I guess I get where you're coming from. I think I just disagree that if you think that that's what tackle play looks like, you're going to spend an awful lot of resources on tackle play, and you're still not going to get tackles that meet your standard. And by the time you finally do, you're going to have, I think you're going to have spent too much, and you're just not going to have the receiving resources to really do much with that, especially since you're still going to need an interior to make it work. An offensive line to me is a five-man unit. And when you get somebody like Braxton who can do this, this is not hard. Like, 54 is just going to get jut inside. Braxton's going to walk him into Tevin Jenkins. And then, boom. We have something we can throw from. Pressure comes from, looks like Patrick on his side. And Roshan, or Roshan not getting enough off the blocker. But Minnesota does this all the time, sends extra rushers to create that kind of havoc. I don't know. You can look at somebody like Braxton and see somebody who's giving up ground, and I get it. I would see the entire offensive line, like Tevin Jenkins here, gives up drastically more ground than, than Braxton Jones. So it, it's funny because the Chicago Fanatic just says Tevin Jenkins is such an anchor on that offensive line. But here's Tevin Jenkins getting blasted with ne just never getting his hands on 95. No, I hear you. I hear you, McFact, and I'm not trying to say you said always. It's more that my my honest question, because this is just my, I guess this is where my opinion lies, is are we going to get, <coughs> are we going to try to find linemen that never, ever get beat? Or do we want to try to find receivers that get open fast enough that linemen that get beat slowly still give their quarterback enough time to make the play? I personally prefer the latter. I look at teams like Cincinnati and I see quarterbacks and offensive weapons that have enough juice in them to overcome spotty offensive line play. And then you look at the Chiefs and they've invested a lot in offense or in their offensive line. But interestingly enough, despite investments at tackle, they still didn't get really good tackle play for the most part. And so I personally find it, it's just, it's a weird question. What happens if you draft Joe Alt and he's not better than Braxton Jones? What happens if you, like, at that point, are you hosed? Did you just completely waste the pick? Do you play Alt anyways? If you're starting a rookie at that same time, now do you have a rookie left tackle in the same time? Uh, let's see. Has there ever been a left tackle so good in both passing and run blocking? He's a one-man offensive line. Are we talking about Braxton? <laughs> Probably not, right? Like, don't let me tell you that I think he's incredible, incredible. Like, I'm telling you that I think Braxton is a good, stable floor and <laughs> that that works. Like, I'm not even trying to tell you I think Braxton is unbelievably amazeballs or something like that. I just think these reps will do. Like, take the rusher, absorb the contact, Slow him down. Pressure up the middle gets us killed. Oh, Trent Williams. Trent's just unbelievable. Trent's this that dude. 
Carrie, I'm there. But at least Verse might be sick. No, totally. And competition, I can hear. I don't know. I don't know if you can get there. Yeah. Oh, Lucas is right, Zach. I really don't know if you're going to be able to find a tackle better. It's the it's the Leno problem, in fact. Personally, like it's the exact same problem as Leno. Everybody wants competition for Leno. There are not that many. Si- there are just not that many six foot five, five, three hundred and five pound ballerinas. And that's what a left tackle is, right? Like when there's, there's just not many of them. So when people say, I want competition, well, you need a top nine pick if you're going to provide competition for somebody like Braxton Jones. But the moment that you get competition for a guy like Braxton Jones, not only does he need to be better, but you're passing up an instant upgrade at edge or receiver. Like, hey, I'm not about to tell you guys that there is a one right answer to any question, but if you told me that the Bears drafted Dallas Turner and Dallas Turner ended up being sweet, like, I, then I, I'm not shocked, personally. Like, Dallas Turner looks to me like a, an amazing physical player. Amazing physical player. And he very well could develop into something legitimately special. And so if the Bears get a tackle, and now they're out, out an edge, and they're out a, or they're out a receiver, then what? Like, okay, so now you need maybe a rookie to, I, I don't know. And Eric, I don't think they're exactly the same. They're not. Especially since I think Leno was a better blocker, or run blocker. Whoop. I think Braxton's a better run blocker than Leno is. Reps like this are the problem and the solution, so to speak, right? Like, you're going to see 98 here, crash the edge, win inside, Braxton slows him down, and if if we are, now it's a screen, so this kind of screws it up, right? But if we take a couple steps back, we can watch the pressure around us. Now, would that screw up all the timing on the play? It sure might right? But the pressure Braxton's giving up here, I mean, it's not good. I'm not trying to tell you it's good, but you're even seeing that there are bigger problems on the offensive line in the most literal sense. Was that our guy Wanham? It is. There's 98. Look, it's the rumor. So, Kerry, I personally think that a lot of people are making making a, a big thing out of Turner not fitting Eberflus' scheme, but Flus has always had two distinct defensive ends. He's had the one on the strong side and the one on the weak side. Let's not forget, Yannick Ngakawe was a Flus defensive end, like, more than once, uh, according to the fact that he played in Indy after Flus left. It's still Flus's defense, more or less, and then <clears throat> obviously signing with the Bears last year. So, it's not a perfect comparison, but... If you've got one speed rusher and you've got one, if you're looking at one speed rusher and then on top of that, you're looking at one anchor rusher, Sweat is the big one. And then other Sweat is the other one. And so is Turner in his own sense. There's a good jump set rep by Braxton. Yeah, the Bears don't have a center. That's for dark, I'm sure. I hope not, Chicago. I think Yannick was awful. <laughs> I don't know if I saw him do much of anything pretty much all season. Is this run action, play action? No, it's like pass action, play action. Yeah, I know, right, Ravi? I really wanted it to not be. I thought white hair had more juice in him. White hair did not. Has he been signed? <laughs> I don't think so either. 
I mean, he may not get signed. At least I'm wondering. He looked he looked so unjuice at the end of the season. Eddie may not get signed either. He had a good career. But then it was over. At least it seems that way for Whitehair. It sure should be, Eric. <coughs> and weren't those the days, Ravi? This I can actually understand having an issue with. I'll say that much. Like, Fields not stepping up in the pocket frankly helps him out here. Because if he did step up in the pocket, that's where Hunter's working. Kudos to Hunter. He's played a lot of football. Like, he's working around this edge, and the moment he realizes that he's deeper than this dashed line, which would take him right at the quarterback, He's going to get there, and then he's going to work back to this intersection point because he's expecting the quarterback to feel pressure around the edge and step up. Now, obviously, ninety-eight is beating. Or is beating. Hey, look, that's the other free agent that the Bears are looking at. That's Wanham over here. So, who knows what the Bears want to do with him? But Braxton not only doesn't get, he doesn't wash Hunter around the edge because. Like, you could say it's an anchor issue, but Hunter just wins the play strength uh, battle at this point. So I never want to make it sound, because I, I really don't. Like, Braxton is perfect. If anything, I, I could be doing the same thing that plenty of people who like perimeter play do constantly, where I just accept a lower output because I don't want to spend the resources or money, and fixing offensive tackle at any point is just... It takes so much resources or getting lucky and finding a guy like Braxton and just double teaming him or double teaming with him a lot, which I do think is perfectly viable. The other funny piece to me about Braxton is that they haven't chipped with him at all in this game. And that's what I would have expected the Bears to do. My whole ethos with Braxton is you're getting a tackle that you're comfortable chipping for. And the one that you're not comfortable chipping for is right because you're expecting him to stand on his head especially at the end of the day. Nice play getting this one out. Zach, a friend of mine speculated, and I think it's hilarious, that they may have left that one mil not guaranteed so that they could tell all the owners that they're, uh, that it's, it's not a fully guaranteed contract, which I think is hilarious. Like, did you really do it that way just so that you could not guarantee or you could tell people that it's not guaranteed? Jay Sanders, if we were trading back, if you were trading off of pick number one, I would consider Joe Alt. But if you're not trading off of pick number one, no, I think you need a receiver. I also want to load up on offense. I'm worried the Bears want to load up on defense. But I think that if you took Alt, then, I mean, that may be a good investment. Long term, it could be if you think that the, or if at that point you get stacked out tackle play, but you need all to be really good to justify the fact that your receiver room just is not as strong or to, it's just not as strong as it could be. And I tend to be more perimeter focused. So me, I think that if you can get a guy open, then you can mitigate a lot of line questions, especially with a mobile quarterback. But that's the other thing. I don't think Alti is getting nine. I think that Fichanu is more the question, but that's, again, that's me. <coughs> Braxton would be a sweet swing tackle. Favorite right wide receiver target in round three. I don't know who's going to be there, but I really like Ricky Pearsall. I think the Florida receiver is a whole lot of fun. Yeah, I do think JPJ is a first rounder. Like, especially because I think JPJ, how you doing, Adrian, is going to be, I, I think he's going to end up playing guard in the NFL. Maybe he'll play center. It's totally possible he plays center. But 
it won't shock me at all if JPJ gets drafted to be a guard at the next level because he can. And as we're seeing right now, guards are valuable. Like guards are getting paid. Centers aren't getting paid. So J or so Jackson Powers Johnson, frankly, may want to play guard. Tez Walker is big and tall and fast. And that's kind of it. Are we talking McFact about like this game we're watching with the left side collapsing? Because we're totally watching this one. Or are we talking just in general? I mean, you got to remember whether you're talking about the best or whether you're talking about like a middling tackle. Let's see. I think they're really considering it, uh, Mario. That's my understanding. I mean, they're certainly looking through their quarterback evals. But, and that's the other piece. Like, Again, McVact, it's not as simple as, oh, well, we all said this, definitely. I, you get it. Like, I'm not trying to pigeonhole you, I promise. Um, it's interesting to me when I look at this that with a guy like Braxton Jones, the, of, well, sorry, I lost my train of thought and I just found it. And so I have to just completely derail where I was going because I was stalling for time. Uh, what I was going to say is if you watch <coughs> nearly any offensive line, the left side is going to give up pressure. So is the right side. So is the middle. They're, they probably won't, or at least you'd hope they won't, give up pressure at the rate that the line did sometimes in Chicago. No doubt about it. But every lineman is going to get beat at some point. It's just a matter of how often they get beat. And on the left side in Chicago, the line's definitely going to give up some pressure. They're going to get pushed back into the pocket. But if you get the ball out on time, I think a lot of that gets mitigated. I think it gets exacerbated with Fields. It might get exacerbated with Caleb, who's to say, but Caleb did get the ball out on time in many cases. I mean, it's just that when he scrambled or held onto it, he held onto it forever and a day and really jacked his time to throw up. But everybody's going to have a different take on something like that. I think tons of NFL snaps pretty much look like this. Pretty much. Yards or not. Like, snap, block, out and then there's no pressure whatsoever because the ball came out so quickly i hear you big fact braxton definitely gets pushed back i mean especially when the bears do hold, or when fields holds onto the ball for four to five seconds it's gonna be hard for a player like braxton who is limited to block for that long and somebody like darnell with more tools might have a better shot at hanging on but malik washington i am watched a ton of him so i couldn't tell you i mean there's just gonna be better people that know more Let's see. Let's see, let's see. Would I trade up to five to secure neighbors to Dunes if it costs an extra second? Man, I don't know, uh, Kerry. That's honestly a really good question, and I'm, it's one that I'm glad that at this stage of my life, I'm just not paid to have to answer. Now, do we think this is a good rep or a bad rep? Because I think there are going to be different O line coaches that are going to agree differently especially because you're talking about facing down Neil Hunter because Braxton gets him to commit to a shoulder and gives him a lane to step up. And then at this point, we can reset our feet and go wherever we want to go with the ball, right? I would consider it a good rep. I think there are some O-line coaches that would tell you that it's either a fine rep or a bad rep because we do end up letting up a pass rusher at that 10-yard depth. Now, if we're at an eight-yard depth, we might just get him around the, the pocket, right? But on a big old drop like this on third and 14, we're probably looking for a better pocket than what we ultimately gave Fields if we're getting pushed around the side. But it's we do give Fields a place to move through. Just a rep, I can, I can hear that. But it's what becomes, I think, the interesting piece of, or the most interesting part about the Braxton debate. Because I think that there are a lot of people that want to see Fields not have to move at all. It's that simple, right? Any Chicago quarterback, they don't want to see him have to move at all. I would tell you that the Vikings blew contain here. Like, it, Justin Fields or not, I don't, I don't think you're going to live allowing this, right? Like, I, I don't think any quarterback in the NFL, let alone Justin Fields, isn't going to kill you when you allow this kind of room to move, right? 
So Braxton, at this point, is taking on their best player and makes do with it, which is really all I want him to do. But I totally get people having... I really believe, personally, that if you switched these two sides, a lot of people would care less. But that's just me, right? Like, McFact, in my opinion, the fact that he's the left tackle is creating a lot of emotional... It's it's creating a lot of different questions that people don't have about the right tackle. And that's not because I think Darnell writes this, that, or the other. It's, it's not about that, right? It's more about this idea of the blindside protector and how important that is. I think that... You, I just wonder if we would have the same concerns about our right tackle if Braxton was playing right or if this is because he plays left. But the league is funny because the league lines up a bunch of high threat pass rushers on that right hand side consistently. Like, why does Rashad Gary mostly right, rush the right hand side? Why does Khalil Mack almost entirely rush the right hand side? Nick Bosa entirely rushes the right hand side. I don't really get it, other than the fact that pass rusher or pass protectors for a long time were way less good on the right-hand side. Man. Two 1,000 to three 1,000? Like, oh, I get you. I love that. That's awesome, man. I never, ever want to pretend that somehow this is some big I know ball test. Because that's the other piece to this, big fact, is Brax is definitely not a dominant player. I mean, he's definitely not. And if the Bears could get some competition, I'm all for it. I don't know if they can afford a level of competition that would actually give Braxton a run for his money. But I'll tell you what, if the Bears did, Tyron Smith hasn't signed yet, has he? Has he? I'm, I'm asking you guys. If the Bears did bring in Tyron Smith with all their money, screw it, we ride. Like, if the Bears wanted to bring somebody in that would really push Braxton Jones, injury history or not, like I can get behind it. Braxton's the kind of player where I really just don't want to spend number nine on trying to improve Braxton Jones because that feels like an awful, awfully big spend to try to improve a player that I think is simply not the worst part of the roster and an awful lot of value right now. But it does feel that way sometimes, 4P. <laughs> who got cracked? <clears throat> oh, yes. When people talk about the rushing quarterback thing, I'll show this one more time, and then that's it. When people talk about the running quarterback, this is ultimately why I hate it. Like, all it takes is Cole Komet and Braxton Jones miscommunicating on who's got who. Or you could even say it's Cody Whitehair blowing a block up the front. And then Justin Fields not only gets held up, but 44 runs over and puts his shoulder in his face. And that's what freaks me out about rushing quarterbacks long-term when you're doing designed quarterback rushes. Because scramblers don't seem like they take those hits. They get out in the open field, and they either get down or they do get tripped up. Sometimes they get shoulder to shouldered by a DB, but it's different than a linebacker type absolutely rocking your quarterback's world. Just freaks me out. Yeah, Jeremy, Darnell is a, a big old boy. Big old man. Did somebody say they wanted my opinion on Mooney signing? I like Mooney. <laughs> <coughs> like... No, 100% Mario. Like, I I find it hard to believe that Fields didn't play a good chunk of this game with a concussion after that last hit. Let's see, BTJ. Brian Thomas? Really, really, really cool athlete. Like, I mean, he's a great athlete. I need to watch him more, to be honest. I wish I had some better opinion. I like Mooney a lot. I think he's a really fun weapon for Atlanta. I think he should find a decent role there. Oh, if Mooney deters Atlanta from drafting a receiver, absolutely. Like, absolutely. I think it would be incredibly weird if Atlanta had Drake London and Kyle Pitts and Darnell Mooney and they also drafted, like, 
Roma Dunes have elite gamers. It's not to say they can't. It would just be a lot to get wide receiver and or like when they they need to get what they have working at this point before they go that direction. Now, is this because this is what I want? Maybe, but they actually make a lot of sense to take the first edge at this stage. I wouldn't be surprised if they're going the exact opposite direction that or they're going the direction potentially that the Bears are trying to go where it's like, well, we'll take a wide receiver here. So then we don't have to take a wide receiver there. But I wonder if they would. Pass rusher just makes a ton of sense. It's also why I th- wouldn't be surprised if a neighbors or a dune say, and I would guess it would be neighbors. Carrie, if you can believe it, I actually think there's a better chance that neighbors falls to nine than you'd think. And that's not because neighbors isn't amazing. Neighbors is a hell of a player. But Roma Dunze is huge. Roma Dunze has zero character question marks. Roma Dunze is fast. And Roma Dunze had such an impressive combine. that I just don't know. Let's see. A fourth and next year's second to move up into this year's second round. Eric, the part of me that is impatient and wants the Bears to be good, says hell yeah. The part of me that says or that is patient and wants the Bears to max out their value says, ah, just trade down from nine. And so I don't know where I'm caught, but I, w- I really don't know where I land. But the older I get, I should probably mention this. One of the weird parts on this channel is that because I'm not a professional football writer per se, like because I'm not paid for this. The longer I do this, the more I don't really place roots in one idea or another because I have no control if I am banging the table for the Bears to trade down and they don't. Am I mad about it? Like, do you guys get that feeling where it's like sometimes you look at some of these amazing Bears writers and content creators and they get so entrenched on an idea that when it doesn't happen, and how much control do they have over it? They're mad, not because what happened was a bear, a bad move, but just because what they what happened wasn't what they chose. And I really don't want to get stuck in that. I think it's really easy to get stuck in that. I think it's really easy to say, we signed a running back for money? Are you kidding me? But I try as best I can to look at this and say, to, to use an example, Me personally, I think that if the Bears draft Caleb Williams and they go in that direction, what they do with the number nine or with the number nine pick at the end of the day, if as long as it's not a left tackle, I'll be fine with it. If they want to draft Jackson Powers Johnson, fine. Trade down, fine. Draft a receiver, fine. Draft an edge rusher, fine. Draft a corner, weird, but okay, fine. I guess I'm into the tackle. Like if we're gonna, if I'm gonna be fine with the corner, I'm gonna be fine with the tackle too. Like that's really the only one that I want to see go a specific way. Right. But that, that's about it. Just because I've got a really high grade on Caleb Williams. I wouldn't be being true to my own evaluations if that wasn't what I wanted to see and wasn't something that I think could help the Bears. Uh, you want to go Troy Ta- Tory Taylor at nine? Screw it. Sure. But I think that the Bears will trade down from nine if they can get a suitor. I just and I'll be fine with that, too. Like you, you grab me Malik Neighbors at nine. Great. You grab me A.D. Mitchell at 20. Great. <laughs> Is one better than the other? I don't know. I do not know who they pick with the pick after that, (laughs) but we'll see. Like, um, let's see. The average modern NFL fan now thinks all their insiders listening to insiders all day. I think I'm missing what you're saying, but I also think I know what you're saying. Um, We'll see what happens, man. Let's see. Trade up to three and get Marvin. The 49ers gave a haul for CMC, and they got to another Super Bowl. They also got to another Super Bowl because they found a Hall of Fame tight end in the fifth round. That sure helps a lot. It's it's funky, Iken, right? Like, if you told me, okay, want him with a little bit of power. Let's see. Yeah, that's not a great rep. Flea market, I, I don't actually think I know what you mean. <laughs> it just read a little confusing. Maybe it's 1230 and, and that's me. But so, let's see. 
It's intriguing, Mario. I don't think I understand how Justin's value potentially being low. That's the thing, Jay Sanders. I agree. At the end of the day, you get to the you get to the Super Bowl by building a good team. I mean, like, yes, I think the quarterback is a part of the. I think a quarterback is a part of a good team, especially if the quarterback plays well. But at the end of the day, you're trying to add the most talent possible to your team. Yeah, that that play was abysmal, Jeremy. I wasn't good. <laughs> That's getting bullied by a power rusher, which definitely happens with Braxton. <coughs> I think the magic question that we just have to ask at the end of the day is... Okay, we're going to close up on this because it's one in the morning. I have to. I actually have to process a podcast before I go to bed. I hate everything. Not really. I make, it good, I make good stuff for you guys because we love you. All right, so I'm going to end on this. And it's an open-ended question, right? If you got to choose between increasing the likelihood in the extreme that the Bears make the playoffs at some point in the next three years, but you probably take away their chance at winning a Super Bowl and building a dynasty. Probably. By no means am I saying definitely, but probably take away their chance at winning a Super Bowl. Or you take that chance at winning a Super Bowl at potentially building a dynasty but if it flames out, it's going to go up in freaking smoke and it's going to be really bad and it's going to be really embarrassing and everybody's going to end up pointing and laughing because regardless of how sane it seemed at the time, it's just going to become a big funny joke that everybody laughs at and goes hardy har. And maybe you will make the playoffs anyways, right? But just like the modern Jaguars who even have won a playoff game, everybody just points and laughs at Trent Baalke for, for paying every free agent under the sun, and then they all end up bad, and then they all end up cut, and now Trevor Lawrence is overrated because Trent Baalke can't build a team, and the offensive line sucks, and they've got a wildly overrated, like, set of top two receivers because they can't draft for garbage, like, and it's, it's a mess. It's a mess in Jacksonville. It's a mess in Jacksonville. It, it, you didn't even have, Trevor Lawrence doesn't even not work. Like, Trevor Lawrence has been a totally fine quarterback, if not a flat-out good quarterback. And it still doesn't fix the utter mess that is Jacksonville, who got back-to-back -back first overall picks, at one with Trevor Lawrence, or one to get Trevor Lawrence, and then one with Trevor Lawrence, and they spent it on an edge rusher that's got less pressures than um, most edge rushers in football, which is rough from Kayvon Walker perspective. Like, I think if you trade down, I mean, everything Jay Sanders is saying is totally right. If you trade down, you have the opportunity to add minimum four up to five blue chip players on this roster. Will you add a sweet quarterback? Who's to say? I don't know. I mean, that's a whole separate thing. Is the timeline going to be borked? I don't know. Could be, uh, especially if you trade down and then you like end up needing a rookie next year because the quarterback wasn't good and then you end up once you need a quarterback now you did get your coach fired now you bring in a new defensive coordinator the new defensive coordinator doesn't like Jalen Johnson or they don't like Montez Sweat or they don't think much of Andrew Billings so now they bring in their own guy the Bears is now reinvesting to continue to build a defense but DJ Moore is upset now he wants to get traded I don't know whatever happens it could get messy it could get messy with both solutions right but it would be pretty surprising to me if the Bears added all those blue chip players and they didn't eventually make the playoffs. They will simply be too talented. We're talking the Steelers. The Steelers made the playoffs. They got a daytime game against the Buffalo Bills. And they got smoked. And it was almost a game. For like a drive. And then they got smoked. Right? Or maybe you could be the Browns. You could have a really good defense. Really, really good defense. Really good defense. And... uh and then a sweet rookie comes along and beats you. And then he goes up against Baltimore and he gets smoked. But he beat you. 
<laughs> hung 24 points on the best defense in football. At home. No, not at home. So at least he had that going for him. But beat your team <laughs> with Amari Cooper. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's not as simple as you get a good quarterback. I'm not about to tell you it is. But Jay Sanders, I think you're right. I mean, I think that whether it's like, uh, let me see, they're not a good, they're not good away. Come on. But that's so bizarre to me, 4P. They were the best defense in football. Like, they have Miles Garrett. They have Joke. They have all kinds of sick players on that roster. And they lost the first round. Partially because they had a starting quarterback get hurt, but it's not like their start, starting quarterback was playing great anyways. it's I'm not trying to misframe things. It's more just this idea of if you do go for Caleb or draft any rookie, really, you are definitely, you're kind of going for the two in the bush. Both situations are the two in the bush. That's, I think, the biggest problem here. Man, I have never picked that up. I've misphrased this so many times. I've tried to frame it because I've always kept trying to figure out how on earth is this so hard. And it's because from both perspectives, the choice that everybody's sticking with is the bird in the hand. On the other side, both perspectives are the bird in the bush, or are the two in the bush. And so, to plenty of people, starting over with a rookie, it doesn't matter how highly rated he is. He's a weird dude. They like the guy in the locker room. He won five of his last seven starts. What are we doing here? Get talent around him, especially if you can add another one of those DJ Moore guys. He had 1,300 yards. You're telling me you could add a Max Crosby? You're telling me you could add a superstar player and you could put him around this quarterback? How good would he even have to be? Tyson Bajan went 2-2. Two and two. Maybe he'd be fine. If Fields went down, maybe we'd be all right. Why wouldn't you do this? And then worst case scenario, you could try to draft Quinn Ewers next year. Didn't people like him once? Or some other quarterback we've never heard of. I've never heard of half these guys until they show up. And then suddenly Michael Penix comes out of nowhere. And suddenly Jaden Daniels wins a Heisman. I actually totally get that line of logic. I don't, I don't personally agree with it. Because I do know something about the quarterbacks in the next class. I'm incredibly unenthusiastic about them. Does that mean that they're going to be all bad? That's not fair. I think Shadur in particular might be pretty good. And if Quinn gets his head on straight, Quinn Ewers might be solid too. It just feels really risky right now. In the same way that apparently teams didn't want to engage at the running back draft this year, and they end up, uh, they end up paying free agents this year because they don't want to deal with the running backs in this running back class. But if you did load this roster with talent, I think they could easily make the playoffs. Easily, not just in 2024. They could easily build a team that's talented enough to make the playoffs in 2025. God forbid the Lions fall off, which I think they totally might eventually then at that point, you end up with a player that, let's see, like at that point, you end up with a team that should hopefully be able to win 9 to 10 games a season. I don't know if they'll ever win 11. I don't know if they'll ever win 12 like that. But they might win 9 to 10 to 11 games, or like 9 to 10 games a season. There'd be a lot of people, but that would be great. That would be great. And frankly, if you put the, like, if you said that I had to choose, I totally get it. I, I might choose that. Like, if you really gave me the opportunity to have 10 straight seasons of, like, 10 and 7, get in the playoffs, see what happens in the dance, win a game, maybe win two games. I don't know, that's hard to turn down. But I really do, I really do like the young quarterback. I really think he looks sweet. <laughs> and I mean I'm I'm certainly willing to just trust polls with it. I just think I know where polls is leaning. But we'll see. We'll see. It's one of the morning. I always appreciate streaming with you guys. We're gonna I hope that the Bears give us some interesting stuff to talk about so that we can find some interesting stuff to talk about and grind a whole bunch of uh grind a whole bunch of film. But and they might be eleven and seven when they get when they go to eighteen games. That'd be a fun way to see it. Um but we'll do this. The good news is, is that regardless of what the Bears do at number one, they still have every single one of their first round picks. Like, 
they can still continue to add to this team just as anybody would expect them to because they did not trade away a bunch of picks to get number one. They just, they just have number one. And they even have number nine. And then they have a first-round pick next year. It'll be sweet. I sure hope at this point that uh, – Mick Fact, it's funny because, like you're saying, it comes down to coaching. But the moment that Bill Belichick got his hands on Mac Jones, it didn't work out the same way that it did with Brady because it, it matters to the player too. It comes down to the coaching and it comes down to the players. But we'll see. You guys have an awesome night. I'll catch you soon. Bear down.